Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Clearwater County's regular council meeting for the 23rd of May, 2023. Uh, very thankful that we're all able to join together here after a lovely rain. I think that will ease some of the burden on our uh, frontline workers in the wildfires and also uh, relieve some of the concerns of our farming community that uh, things will green up very soon after a nice nice rain. Uh, again, your thanks for your patience while we uh, solve some technical difficulties and thank you so much to our staff for working diligently under extreme pressure to get that up and going again. So I appreciate that. As a reminder, all public meetings are live streamed and recorded. Any verbal or written information provided may be included in public documents as per the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, FOIP 40-1. And with that, we have had a, an agenda that has been circulated. Would there be any uh, additions or deletions to that agenda? Uh, Councillor Ratcliffe? Thank you, Reeve. Yes, I'd like to add an item to the closed session regarding a third party business interest. Okay, I shall put that as 14.3 uh, then. Thank you. Um, any further additions? Uh, Tracy Lynn, please. A motion to um, add to the agenda and then a motion for the item that uh, Councillor Ratcliffe okay. spoke to. Okay. Be added to okay, I look for a motion to add to the agenda then. Uh, Councillor Ratcliffe? I'll make that motion. Okay, all those, all those in favor? And that is carried. And then uh, I guess your motion to uh, add that item as well, please. Okay, I move that 14.3 uh, uh, be, be added to the agenda as uh, an item of third party business interest. Okay, any further clarification needed on that? All those in favor then? And that is carried, thank you very much. Um, and then that uh, takes us to the minutes of the regular council meeting of the 9th of May, 2023. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm so sorry. Uh, motion, uh, uh, all those in favor then of, of the motion by Councillor Ratcliffe to include that item is 14. No, motion to adopt the agenda. Oh, sorry, yes, absolutely. Uh, a motion to adopt then, uh, looking for that. Uh, Councillor Cermak, all those in favour? And that is carried. Thank you very much. Always something different to add to the order every time. So thanks for your patience as I fumble my way through. Um, brings us to the regular council minute or adoption of the minutes of the regular council meeting, 9th May, 2023. Were there any uh, errors or omissions in that? Council or Deputy Reed Melhoff, please. Uh, thank you, Reeve. It's not overly consequential, but I th I thought that the motion to delete 6.2.8, I thought that I had made that motion, um, and it's listed as as Councillor Northcott. Um, I may be mistaken in either way. It still was a motion that got made and carried, um, but I just wanted to confirm that. That's all. Um, the page four of the minutes, so page six of the main agenda at the very top there. So that would be the delete item? Yeah, of 6.2.8. I thought that there I had were, If I recall and having reviewed that just last night, I think there was a number of amendments made to, without a motion on the floor, amendments to the draft. Was that how that was handled? Administration review. Okay. So if, if council wishes to take all those items and help administration uh, reviews the minutes, if, if. Sure. Okay. It, I mean, it got passed anyway. I just didn't, I just wanted to make sure that it was. Sure. Well, I'd look, I'd look to the comfort of council in tabling this item then, um, if somebody would be willing to motion. Even to later in the meeting? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Motion to table the the adoption of the minutes and uh, Councillor Northcott. All those in favor? Okay, that is tabled. Uh, that takes us down to uh, the next uh, items on the agenda. And the first is a public hearing. And that is uh, relating to bylaw 1141 23 to amend the land use bylaw. 
Um, I shall, it, this is a public hearing, so I shall call um, this public hearing to order at, uh, and I have to check the time, I can go off that clock, uh, which is 9.27, please. And I'll just outline the process to be used. Uh, everyone present shall register. All persons wishing to speak shall be recognized by the chair. Every presenter, when it is told their turn, shall identify themselves and their organization, if any, and whether they are in favor of or opposed to the bylaw. If a presenter becomes repetitive, they may be limited by the chair. If a presenter or member of the audience becomes disrespectful, they may be asked to leave by the chair. No outside recording devices will be permitted. We ask that cell phones be turned off or put on silent mode, and breaks within the hearing will be called at the chairman's discretion. Firstly, the development officer will explain the background of the application. Then the applicant will be invited to outline the reasons for the application. At any time, the council members may have the opportunity to ask questions. Any submissions received from other agencies will then be read out. Then anyone who is present and whom is in favor of the application will be asked to submit his or her presentation. Following this, comments will be requested from anyone who is, who is opposed to the application. The applicant will have the last word and thus respond to any issues raised previously. Before I turn it over to staff for the background report, I think we'll take a moment to do some introductions. So I'm going to go to Councillor Graham first. Good morning, Sydney Graham, Councillor for Division 2. Good morning, Jordan Northcott, Division 4, Councillor. Uh, welcome, Jenny Melhoff, Division 1, and Deputy Reef. Uh, good morning, uh, Daryl Lougheed, representing Division 3, and Reef. Good morning, welcome, Neil Ratcliffe, Division 5. Good morning, Brian Cermak, Councillor for Division 6. Hello, Division 7, Councillor Michelle Swanson. Good morning, Murray Hagan, Director of Corporate Services. Good morning, Kim Gillum, Acting Director of Planning and Development. Good morning, Christine Hager, Director of Emergency Services and Acting CAO. Oh, morning, Adrian Clark, Planning Intern. And if you folks would like to uh, introduce yourselves as well, that would be terrific. Good morning, my name is Sharon Radulov. Silent partner with these guys. Okay, thank you. Good Welcome. morning, Rudy Radulov, representing Proactive Ad Adventures. And I'm Cody Stewart, also Proactive. Well, thanks for so much for joining us. Uh, to start off, I guess I'll have our, uh, our Mr. Clark, our uh, planning intern, will outline the background to the uh, application. Uh, morning, everyone. Thank you, Rudy Lahid. Uh, Rudy, Randolph and Cody Stewart of Proactive Adventures hold title to Plan 892-2155, Lot 1, which is part of Southeast 1935-8, west of the 5th, containing 94.22 acres. The property is located about 90 miles southwest of the village of Caroline in the Boundary area. Proactive Adventures Limited has made application to redesignate six acres from recreation facility district back to agricultural district within the proposed parcel. On April 16th, 1985, six acres of the property was redesignated to recreation facility with the intent of developing a campground. Both Alberta Environment and Red Deer Regional Planning Commission had recommended council to refuse the application the landowner at the time received approval for the development of a campground on the redesignated property on May 8, 1985. In 1986, the landowners requested council to consider improve road improvements on the lease road that is used to access this property. Council indicated that they would review this request. A letter was sent a letter was sent to the landowners at the time on September 12, 1990, after a request for information from an oil and gas company was received. The letter indicated to the landowner that the application for a campground, which was approved in 1985, was considered null and void 
due to the campground not being developed within 12 months of the approval. As such, a new development permit would be required for the operation of a campground. Even if the campground had operated at one time, as per section 3.7.6 of the Clearwater County Land Use Bylaw, a development permit issued for a discretionary use shall be declared void if the use is discontinued for a period of 12 consecutive months or more. On August 22, 2017, an application came before Council to redesignate 34 acres in addition to the existing six acres, which was previously redesignated <coughs> to create a 40-acre <coughs> recreation facility district. On the subject parcel for the, for the purpose of developing a recreational vehicle park and commercial cabin facility with long-term leases. The application was defeated. The current landowner has no intention of using the property for any recreational buildings and uses. The property is a standalone parcel on the south side of the Clearwater River, surrounded by Crown land. Current access into the property is provided by 17 kilometers of oil lease road from Township Road 36-0. The property is the property does not have legal and physical access to a county maintained road at this time. Therefore, the application to redesignate six acres contained within plan 8922155 Lot 1 to Agricultural District as shown in Schedule A of the bylaw. Planning Direction. Clearwater County's Municipal Development Plan 2010, Guiding Principle 3.2.2, Conservation of Agricultural Land and the Support of Agricultural Uses, MDP Policy 12.2.4, Clearwater County will consider where applicable the following when evaluating an application to redesignate, the site suitability, uh, county's responsibility, responsibility that may result from development and any other matters that the county may consider relevant. Uh, Clearwater's County Land Use Bylaw, Section 3.7.6, a development permit issued for discretionary use shall be declared void if this use is discontinued for a period of 12 consecutive months or more. 12.2.13, if a subdivision or development which the land was redesignated does not occur within one year of the date of the passage of this bylaw, that the redesignation, that the redesignated land council may initiate a bylaw to redesignate the land back to its former designation. Section 13.4.1 deals with the purpose of the of agricultural lands. Uh, policy consideration, the subject property is redesign was redesignated for the operation of a can ground which no longer exists and the current landowner has no intention of pursuing such a venture at this time. The landowners, in the landowner intend to continue the residential use of the property and pursue agricultural uses. First reading at first reading was done was held on Collins, was held on April 11, 2023. Collins review and gave uh, gave reading to bylaw 1141-23 as required by legisla legislation. Notice of today's public hearing was advertised in local paper and comments were invited from adjacent landowners and referral agencies. Upon consideration of the representations made at the public hearing, council will consider whether or not to grant second and third reading to bylaw 1141 slash 23. Uh, that's enough of my report. Uh, back to you, Leif uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Clark. Would uh, there be any questions from council of the development officer? Uh, Deputy Reeve Milhoff, please. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, typically, at the development permit stage, there's an opportunity to put conditions on permits, etc. cetera. Um, I'm assuming since this is putting it back to ag development, um, there won't be a development permit stage because it's yeah. going yeah. 
back. Yes. Um, does this council then have the opportunity to put in conditions like reclamation to ensure stuff like that happens? I, is there an opportunity within um, the legislation to allow us to do that at this stage, considering it will not be a development permit stage? Being that there will be no development permit, there will be no chance to put in conditions in regards to um, reclamation. But uh, the reclamation side of the campground or the former campground that was there, um, that's a pro that's a part of another process in getting the land back to its original state. And the current landowners are in the process of getting everything reclaimed to its former state. So whatever was existing will be is in the process of being removed. Okay, so that's already covered in a different yes. legal process. Yes. Right. Thank you. Um, there, there will be an opportunity for you to speak on later. Right now, we're just looking for questions from, from council. Um, any additional questions from, from council? So now I'd, I'd ask the, if there are no further questions from council, I'd ask the development officer, were there any comments received from agencies? Uh, yes, there were comments received from, from agencies. Uh, telecommunications had no objections to the um, above notification. Fortis Alberta had no concerns. Uh, Transatla Trans Utilities Corporation had no concerns. Public infrastructure. Public Works Infrastructure had no objections on the request. Public Works Operations had no objections or concerns. Uh, Municipal Planning Commission uh, received, reviewed the application on April 20, 2023. Uh, the Municipal Planning Commission recommended that council, council favorably consider granting second and third reading to the, to the subject land use bylaw amendment. Thank you for that. And I think at this moment, I, it would be a great time if you want, if the, um, the applicant would like to, like to speak, we could certainly entertain that at this moment. I just wanted to speak to uh, Deputy Reeve, uh, Jenny Melhoff's uh, concern there. We are currently working on uh, the reclamation of the uh, six acres that are up for debate right now. Um, we've probably hauled about 15 truckloads of stuff out of there, about totaling about 30 hours worth of work. We've uh, organized to have a um, septic guy come in and dump the tanks that are there that need to be removed. Um, we uh, are looking at talking with, uh, they're coming out, Paradise Brothers, to uh, log that area so it's actually a field now, so there is like no <laughs> no one can ever come back and say, hey, there's a park here. It doesn't exist. So that's, and, uh, you know, I've been in discussions with uh, um, Mr. Emmons, and I was just currently talking with Adrian Clark about uh, when we can kind of organize some things that uh, Mr. Emmons had indicated that uh, he'd be willing to give us a hand with uh, moving forward in the future. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, and I guess at this time I would invite comments from any member of the public wishing to speak in favor of the application. Again, any member of the public wishing to speak in favor of the application. And I notice our gallery isn't overly full today, um, but uh, certainly do that one final time. Um, any member of the public wishing to speak in favor of the application. Seeing none, I would ask the development officer if there were any written submissions in favor of the request. Uh, no written submissions in favor of the proposal were received. Okay, thank you for that. And at this time, I would ask then any comment of a member of the public wishing to speak in opposition to the application. Again, that would be in opposition to the application. And one final time, any member of the public wishing to speak in opposition to the application. Seeing no one, I'll go to Mr. Clark again and ask if there were any written submissions opposing the request. Uh, no written submissions uh, in opposition of the proposal was received. Okay, thank you very much for that. That 
brings us close to the end of the hearing, and I would just uh, invite the applicant if they had any closing comments uh, that they'd like to share with us uh, before I close the hearing. Just one thing I'd like to say. I'm uh, greatly honoured and uh, very relieved by uh, Council's openness and uh, just uh, um, the way you guys conduct yourself. It, it actually feels like it's not in a Council environment. I've presented before to different councils and legislature and uh, this is the first time I don't feel like you know I got a billion butterflies in my stomach so it's quite it's quite awesome. Thank you very much for that. Okay. And uh, Councillor Northcott your light is on. I just, yeah, just you have a, a question. Just, sure. a, <clears throat> just a comment for the applicant or applicant sorry. Um, the, the state of the property, like I think it's great that there's there's reclamation activities, you know, to put that back, that property back into an agricultural state. Um, but for the timing of the application, um, like it's still in a, you know, on these pictures it looks like it, there's still gravel and stuff like that. So I was just curious about the timing of the application to rezone it back to agriculture or, if, you know, when it was more in a, actually said and done, seed it back to grasses and stuff and in a truly agricultural state applied, you know, at that time, because right now it is still in a, it's not back to original, uh, the original landscape it was in before the campground. I was curious about, for the timing of the application. Sure. But, really? Okay, I'll try and clarify a little okay. bit more. So it's not in a, it's not in an agricultural state right now. So, the, you know, in the future when it was, Reclaimed, and there was actually photos and pictures to show that yep, it's actually in an agricultural state. Then apply to have a rezone back to agricultural sometime in the future, uh, rather than now. Mr. Clark may have uh, some detail to add. The the rezoning and the reclamation of the site is a part of another legal matter, right? So these are following the steps of that uh, process right now. So. One of the steps is the rezoning, and another step is the recommend, uh, reclamation of the site. So one can't really happen before it's it's a part of a series of steps that they that needs to be met. Yeah, just thought, sort of thought maybe and, the uh, Um, Ms. Gillum, please. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> I just wanted to speak briefly to that too. Um, I think it's just showing the intent to put the land back to agricultural and um, Rick, they had had conversations with Rick and Rick actually suggested that they rezone it back as part of the process as well. Um, so that's kind of why it got started. Okay, I just, in my opinion, it'd be nice to be able to see it reclaimed and back to regional state and then applied and rezoned back to agricultural at that time in the future when, it, you know, when it's actually really reclaimed. What we can do is, um, as we move forward, I already got currently pictures of things that were left that we're cleaning up. I can put a photo documentary together if you would like and bring that into council, say, September-ish, so that you can see what we've done from this uh, season, say, from May forward, because, you know, um, Part of the concern that we've had is, is there's been a lot of drama over this. And I don't need to get into the specifics, but it's been very, very upsetting for us three. And so we're just trying to do what we can to make sure that no one can come back at us with any kind of, you know, pull the rug out from underneath us, so to speak. And, you know, we've been in discussions with Murray. We were here negotiating, you know, like we're basically cleaning up somebody else's mess is what it comes down to. I'll just leave it there. Thank you, and I'll always give you the opportunity for the last word as well. So if there's any further comments, uh, peace. Okay, well, well th thank you so much. With that, then I will close the hearing. No motions will be entertained at this time. So having said that, I think we'll skip ahead <laughs> to item 5.1, which is consideration of second and third readings 
of Bylaw 1141-23 for application number 0223 to amend the land use bylaw. And I'll go across the room to Mr. Clark again, I believe, to introduce uh, this item as well. I'll let you scroll through. <laughs> So thank you, Reeve Wahid. Um, the purpose of the purpose of bylaw 1141-23 is to amend Clearwater County land use bylaw number 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 714-01 to redesignate six acres of plan 892-2155 lot one from Recreational Facility District back to Agricultural District within the proposed parcel. Pending the outcome of the land use amendment, the landowner will proceed to continue the, continue the residential use of the property and pursue agricultural interests. Uh, refer, please refer to documents attached as agenda item 4.1 for further details in regards to this application. At regular council meeting held on April 11th, 2023, council received and gave first reading to bylaw 1141-23 as required by legislation. Pub notice, of, notice of today's public hearing was advertised in the local newspapers and comments were invited from adjacent landowner and referral agents. Upon the considerations of the representations made at the public hearing, council will consider whether or not to grant second and third reading to bylaw 1141-23. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so um, I would be looking to questions from uh, council or a motion relating to second reading. Uh, Deputy Reeve Melhoff. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Uh, not a question. I was able to uh, ask my questions uh, during the public hearing and during first reading, so thank you for that. Um, I look forward to this group being a part of um, the greater community, and I'm glad that our council is able to help them do that. Um, and I look forward to the reclamation of, of this back to agriculture uh, and you being a part of our ag community, and I will happily make, second, um, make the motion for second reading. All right. Okay. Discussions relating to a motion for second reading. Seeing none, I call the question. All in favor? And those opposed? And that would be carried. And then I would also look for a motion then for third reading. Oh, Councillor Northcott, go ahead, please. All right. <clears throat> would I be able to make a motion to postpone this item until the fall, till September, till, till there's some pictures and stuff, verifying that it's in more of an agricultural state? Mm. That Mr. Is, Clark, if, if that is definitely uh, a possibility, I would leave that to council to decide on that motion. If that's what council chooses to do. So, so are you propose? Are you asking to table this this uh, motion that's before us, a third reading? Yes, I am. Okay, Councillor Swanson, relating to that motion to table or postpone indefinitely. Or post, I, we need to set a date. I guess it's postponed indefinitely if it's not a date set. So, um, Councillor Swanson. Yeah, that's my question in regards to the process. If we do postpone, we have to set an, another date for the third reading. Correct, is the way I understand it. We'd have to select a, a meeting date for that. And uh, I guess question then, follow up question then to Councillor North, Northcott. Um, the way I understand. That what has been presented, that this is part of the, the process that they are currently under, and I they, they can't come back with, like a Deputy Reeve Melhoff has indicated, with a further development permit. So I would hate to stagnate something that is going forward well, and 
this is it would eat up more of council time again come fall so um, that's you know there are proper processes to follow up if, if you have any specific concerns I'd be I, I would like more clarification maybe on on the reason why because currently it's not in an agricultural state so um, <clears throat> I'd like to see just verification that yep the property is in an agricultural state before it's rezoned back to agriculture Could so Maybe, for, for my clarity, could you define an agricultural state? Uh, I mean, uh, we know that agri land is zoned to agriculture if it's a rock, a tree, a swamp. So, and, and I would ask another question, perhaps, of, of staff. The photo that uh, Councillor Northcott's referenced is up on the screen. That isn't necessarily its current state. That may be a photo, a file photo of perhaps a year or two back even. Uh, that's a era photo from last year. Okay. Yes. So it's not full representation of what the state is. I'm not sure when, when at what time last year this photo was taken. So it could have mass, um, be significantly different. No, based based on when this photo is taken. So. And yeah. sorry, so, I mean, yeah, I so with the gravel pads, it's not similar to the surrounding landscape there. Like there's, you know, there's forest, there's pasture, there's grass. Um, you know, there's the probability that there will be, you know, weeds and stuff that will grow on the gravel pads. It's, um, you know, it will be problematic into the future. So I just, I don't see it in an agricultural state. So it'd be nice to be able to see it into an agricultural state, whether it was, you know, uh, pasture planted back to trees or, um, you know, similar to the surrounding landscape there. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Deputy Reeve Mailhoff. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, I'm trying to look at this from the other perspective, whereas if we were wanting this to be, if they were turning this into, say, um, a gas station or um, wanting that type of work, I would want that approval prior to work taking place. Um, and I look at this, I'm trying to look at this very similarly. That's why I confirmed that there was a reclamation plan and that that was being followed in a different direction because normally we would do that through development yeah. permits, but because this is going the other way, we have to make sure that it's being handled in a different area. I, I like it when people come and get approval before they start work. And if this was to say become industrial, that's what we would expect. We would expect that it gets zoned prior to them putting a gas plant there. Yeah. So that's I'm that that's my thoughts on this, that they're getting it zoned. We've confirmed the reclamation is going to be taking place. Um, and and I won't be supporting tabling this today. Yeah. Um, Councillor Ratcliffe, please. I just had a, a, a question for staff, and that is do we have any reason to doubt that reclamation is not ongoing in good faith? Since the process has started, reclamation has been an ongoing process. Since uh, other matters have taken place, uh, reclama reclama reclamation is the main driving factor in bringing this process to where it is right now. So without reclamation happening, um, we probably wouldn't be at this stage. And parts of the reclamation uh, process is removing everything that was there as a campground and that was that's the first stage of the reclamation and then the remainder is to get the other stuff done and put in place so it's an ongoing process and and the reclamation is part of another process another yes. legal process yes it is okay thank you okay um councillor northcott please just a little, just I absolutely support the like the applicant's desires here with this property. I 100% support it, but to create consistency for future applications and app <clears throat> for land use amendments and stuff, that's my comments are supportive of that to be able to create consistency into the future. And and uh, but I absolutely support your desires with this property 100%. Like it's you know in the direction that you're going there. Okay, any additional comments or questions relating to the motion before us, which is a motion to postpone indefinitely? 
or is there a, is there a, maybe Tracy Lynn, if you have a read back on the motion, uh, Councillor Council Northcott till till the end of September 2023, if we can put a date on that, if, would that be would that be? It's actually really more for the applicant if that date were. Well, I I understand uh, your concerns, but uh, I will tell you this: I'm a man of integrity to the point where. <laughs> even if it breaks your bank account. Um, we are in currently working at it very diligently ourselves. Um, we do have Blue Mountain coming out on the 29th of this month to remove the poles that were in there and the transformers so that they can put that back into stock. So that gets rid of that. You did pass a development permit for us for the uh, pump house that is on the property and we're hoping to use that for future future agricultural purposes. Um, we have Paradise Brothers coming out, hopefully by the end of this week, to give us a assessment on uh, what will take to take the old growth trees down because they are a danger. They have been coming down in different windstorms and it is a, a concern. And what that will do is that outlined area, we take all the trees out, it opens it up so now it's a field. We have talked to Mr. Emmons about, you know, um, the gravel removal, the different things that need to go on that I just don't have the equipment to do. Um, I understand he's on vacation and that will be, you know, he's back June 1st, so I'm figuring probably by June 10th we'll be able to put some of your uh, public works guys to work. I hope that um, satisfies you, sir. But my concern, yeah. my concern with not getting this uh, closed with the third reading is it does leave an avenue open for certain individuals that have been robbed. There's no doubt about it. They've been robbed. And it is coming, it is, it is being thrown at us when we are aggrieved parties just like them. Thank you. Okay, uh, any further discussions on the motion before us? Oh, Councillor Graham, please. I will not be supporting the motion before us. I believe you guys mentioned potential, potentially having a greenhouse at first reading. I, I could be wrong. I believe you guys threw that out there. So maybe that gravel would even be helpful for when you guys got to that stage to stockpile it for that. So it's not really, really my business. What you're planning on doing is with the gravel and stuff so i will be supporting support or not supporting the current motion and supporting the third reading okay thank you any further discussion of the motion motion before us all right uh i'll call that motion then all in favor and those opposed that is defeated um and then it brings us back to the the item again as well, I would be looking for a motion then uh, to support third reading. Uh, Councillor Ratcliffe. I move that we uh, grant third reading to bylaw 1141-23 to amend the land use bylaw. Thank you for that discussion on that motion. All right, I call the question. All in favor and those opposed? That is carried. Thank you very much. Uh, let's take a five minute break here while we prepare for our next, uh, next public hearing. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you so much.
Well, welcome back everyone after our recess. We continue through the uh, agenda today and we move to item 4.2, which again is a public hearing of a bylaw 1142-23, application number 0323 to amend the land use bylaw. And I shall call this uh, public hearing to order at, uh, I'm gonna say 10, 12. And I'll just outline the process to be used today. Everyone present shall register. All persons wish, <coughs> wishing to speak shall be recognized by the chair. Every presenter, when told it is their turn, shall identify themselves and their organization, if any, and whether they are in favor of or opposed to the bylaw. If a presenter becomes repetitive, they may be limited by the chair. If a presenter or member of the audience becomes disrespectful, they may be asked to leave by the chair. No outside recording devices will be permitted. We ask that cell phones be turned off and put on silent mode and breaks within the hearing will be called at the chairman's discretion. Firstly, the development officer will explain the background of the application. Then the applicant will be invited to outline the reasons for the application. At any time, the council members may have the opportunity to ask questions. Any submissions received from other agencies will then be read out then any, anyone who is present and whom is in favor of the application will be asked to submit his or her presentation. Following this, comments will be, be requested from anyone who is opposed to the application, and the applicant will have the last word and thus respond to any issues raised previously. And so before I turn it over to staff for the background report, I'll, we'll just take a moment to introduce ourselves, and I'll start with Councillor Graham again. Good morning, Sydney Graham, Councillor for Division 2. Good morning, Jordan Northcott, Division 4, Councillor. Uh, welcome, Jenny Melhoff, Division 1, and Deputy Reeve. Uh, good morning, Daryl Lawhee, Division 3, and Reeve. Good morning, Neil Ratcliffe, Councillor for Division 5. We really are very nice people, so don't feel nervous. <laughs> okay, great. Greetings, Brian Cermak, uh, Councillor for Division 6. Hello, Michelle Swanson, Division 7. Good morning, Murray Hagen, Director of Corporate Services. Good morning, Kim Gillum, Acting Director of Planning and Development. Good morning, Christine Heggert. I'm the Director of Emergency Services and the Acting CAO. Uh, morning, Adrian Clark, Planning Intern. And if you would introduce yourself as well. There we go. It's on. Uh, Mike Metcalf, I'm an Alberta Land Surveyor with Pomoco Land Surveying. Okay, well welcome this morning. Um, I guess I'll turn the floor across to Mr. Clark, our planning intern, and he will outline the background to the uh, application. Uh, morning again, morning again, Council. Thank you, Reeve Wahid. Uh, numbered company 1516367 Alberta Limited holds title to part of Southwest 273405 West Southwest 5th containing approximately 0.93 acres. Harry and Jonah Blancart currently holds title to the remainder of Southwest 2734 5 West of the 5th, containing approximately 156.06 acres. The subject land is located approximately 15 miles southeast of the village of Caroline. The Menko Land Survey Limited on behalf of 1516 367 Alberta Limited, with support of Harry and Jonah Blancard, has made application to redesignate 0.55 acres to off Southwest 273406 from Agriculture District to Highway Development District, with a combined boundary adjustment to expand the existing 0.93 acres highway development parcel from the for the purpose of providing adequate parking, safer access and egress to the existing business businesses and one day provide future EV charging on site. The existing highway development parcel on the land is located at the junction of Highway 587 and Range Road 5-3. The property is accessed via Highway 587 adjacent to the south property boundary. The property contains a 7,200 square foot building known as the James River Store, a 1,000 
and eight square foot addition to the James River store, uh, 4,320 Ponzet, uh, 820 square foot building where the RMS Plus business operates from a modular aqua trailer on a property. There is also uh, 124 square foot auxiliary building encroaching on the property adjacent to the north property boundary and uh, 166 square foot auxiliary building encroaching on the municipal reserve, municipal road allowance adjacent to the west property boundary, both of which will need to be removed or moved to be in compliance with the land use bylaw. The James River General Store has legally operated for over 38 years. The addition to the James River Store, uh, the RMS business, and the remaining buildings do not have development approval. The landowner has initiated the process for development approval for these uses, which will be a condition of subdivision endorsement. The surrounding land use is in the immediate area is mainly agricultural with some residential parcels uh, located in the immediate vicinity of the store. The attached package provides more details on the proposed development and the applicant and the landowner will be present at the meeting to speak to the proposal. Therefore, this application to redesignate the vacant land containing 0.55 acres of Southwest 273405 West of the 5th to Highway Development District as shown on Schedule A of the bylaw. The county's planning direction. Uh, the county's munis municipal development plan 2010 guiding principle 3.2.3 uh, deals with land use, land use compatibility. Guiding principle 3.2.5 encourage diversification of the local economy. MDP policy 4.2.4 the evaluating, in evaluating the subdivision and development proposals, proposals that affect agricultural land and the agricultural quality of the land is one of the factors that the county will consider when evaluating. Other factors that are considered is the nature and extent of farming activities in the local area, the location, number, the location, the number and the type of existing planned non-farming uses, uh, the, farm the farm assessment rating um, of the adjacent lands, policy 8.1.2, promote, local promote locally appropriate economic development activities that enhance diversification of the local economy, 8.2.1, uh, Clearwater County encouraged the retention and expansion of its existing businesses and industri industry and the attraction of new businesses and industry by means of the diversification of the county's economic base. Policy 8.2.9, through the land use bylaw, Clearwater County shall provide a variety of commercial and industrial uses within the county. 11.2.1, deals with uh, ASP and outline plan. 12.2.2, uh, the county shall implement policies of, of the outline plan, making decisions, making decisions on any proposed redesignation or subdivisions. Policy 12.2.3, provide, provide in, provide information relevant to the proposed redesignation or subdivision. Uh, Clearwater County may require submission from a qualified professional engineer, such as an impact, traffic impact study. 12.2.4, the county may consider where applicable the following when evaluating uh, the application to redesignate, the impact on adjoining land and uh, nearby land uses, road requirements and traffic impacts, including access and egress for consideration, and any other matters that the county may deem relevant. County's land use bylaw, section 13.4.12, the highway development district, 
the general purpose of this district is to regulate development adjacent to public roads. Uh, some discretionary uses related to this district would be auxiliary buildings, uh, service stations, cafe, driving, uh, driving restaurants, and other commercial uses. Uh, policy 6.17.1 deals with the minimum number of off-street parking spaces required by um, various uses. Policy considerations. The redesignation of the proposed land is to allow for a boundary adjustment and the expansion of the existing parcel to provide adequate parking, safer access and egress to the existing businesses and to provide space for future EV charging station. No additional permanent structures are being proposed at this time. Access to the property will not be changed and continue to utilize the existing approach on Highway 587. Um, Alberta Transportation has been notified and they have uh, provided their comments for the proposal. The proposed land use does the proposed land use does not meet the intent of the current zoning being agricultural. It's better suited under the highway development district. At regular council meeting held on April 1st, 2023, council reviewed and gave first reading to bylaw 1142-23 as required by les legislation. Notice of today's public hearing was advertised in local paper. Comments were invited from adjacent landowners and referral agencies upon consideration of the representations <coughs> made at public hearing. At today's public hearing, council will consider whether or not to grant second and third reading to bylaw 1142-23. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Um, I'm gonna go slightly off script here just because we, our applicants have been joined. Or We've had additional joins to the applicant. Maybe we'll do a real quick round of introductions again, uh, just to uh, get us all familiar with who, who we're talking to. So if you would, Councillor Graham. Hello, Sydney Graham, Councillor for Division 2. Jordan Northcott, Division 4, Councillor. Uh, welcome, Jenny Melhoff, Division 1, and Deputy Reeve. Uh, good morning, Daryl Lahey, Councillor for D Division 3, and Reeve. Good morning, Neil Radcliffe, Councillor for Division 5. Good morning, Brian Cermak, Councillor for Division 6. Hello, Division 7 Councillor Michelle Swanson. Good morning, Murray Hagen, Director of Corporate Services. Good morning, Kim Gillum, Acting Director of Planning and Development. Good morning, Christine Heggert. I'm the Director of Emergency Services and Acting CAO. Morning, Adrian Clark, Planning Inter. And if, if you would introduce yourself, that would be... Uh, great benefit to it. Good morning, James Fieser, uh, owner of uh, RMS Plus, uh, James River Bridge Store. Okay. Well, good morning and welcome. Uh, right now, I'll open the floor up to questions of the development officer by council. Uh, would council have any questions of the development officer? Deputy Reeve Milhoff, please. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Uh, how far in the process are we on getting the rest of the property within compliance? Uh, we have received development permit applications. Uh, in regards to application, they would have to be brought before Municipal Planning Commission for a decision. When so, is that expected? And then next Municipal Planning Commission uh, will be in June that we'll be bringing this application forward for in June. Okay, thank you. And uh, Councillor Northcott. Uh, sort of similar type question. I was just curious, so over the previous 38 years, has there been... Uh, any instances of previous infractions and has that always been a, <clears throat> if there have, I, I guess I'll just leave it at that. Has there been any infractions where there, there hasn't, you know, they've been out of line with the policies or bylaws or um, regulations? Um, yeah, in regards to that, there have been, there have been, uh, we were in the process of carrying out uh, enforcement on the property in regards to some of these um, uses, buildings that have been there, and the enforcement process started. And during that enforcement process, uh, the applicant um, showed interest in getting his buildings in compliance with the land use bylaw. Okay, so we're, one more question, that's all right. Please. Uh, for the, 
for the infractions, maybe the, where they were outside of policy or bylaw or all the rules, but um, were they just, uh, because they were unknown, like the applicant maybe just was unaware of the, like there are so many rules and bylaws and policies and regulations. I mean, it's, it's easy to be unaware sometimes of all the rules and regulations. So was it, was it, was it more of a case of just being unaware of the, that they were non-compliant or was it intentional you know, where there were there maybe applications for buildings to be built, um, those applications denied, but the, where the applicant maybe went ahead anyways, uh, or, or was it more of just a case of just simply unknowing all the rules, regulations? Uh, to my knowledge, no applicant was made prior to enforcement, the enforcement process being started. I cannot speak to the landowner's um, level of awareness at the time when they were placing structures on ground, but complaints, we were received complaints, which we started the enforcement process. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, one question I'd have before I go to Councillor um, Radcliffe. This, this property has been operating as this store for some some period of time. Yes. Can you get any history length there? Has this been a long-term uh, operation? It's been... To my long. knowledge, uh, the store has been operating there. The additions that were done to the store happened uh, recently, as in within the past... I can't speak to how long ago the, those additions were made, but those are more recent additions. So yes, the store has been operating legally. Everything was in compliance for, to my knowledge, for over 38 years. Sure. Sure, so those additions were more recent and I that was when that happened. I just recall in my lifetime, there's always been a store there, but um, yeah. I'll go to Councillor Ratcliffe. Thank you. I just wanted to ask if uh, this application is part of the solution for enforcement? Uh, the application to rezone is uh, one of the steps I am, I believe the landowner is doing to s help with the enforcement process, but um, the rezoning application is a part to expand the business to okay. create that parking, parking space which is needed, and it just so happened that the opportunity to rezone this that part of the quarter section has lined up with this enforcement process. Okay, yeah. thank you. Councillor Cermak, please. Yes, um, can you give me the number of non-compliance letters that have been wrote by this count, uh, county and the dates when they were issued? Because I think this has been an ongoing thing for quite some time. Uh, to my knowledge, there were two letters that were sent out. I do not have dates. They were issued presently. Presently, I do not have the dates they were issued. But I know that two letters of um, enforcement letters were sent out. One was sent out last year. I'm not sure if, two, if both were sent out last year. But I know of one being sent out last year at the date. I cannot really specify of the exact date. Trying to get that information for you. In a second. Thank you. Yeah, because uh, I I know that uh, the area there definitely needs more parking because they're parking on roads and everything else. Uh, it's all out of compliance. Uh, I will not vote in favor of the second reading or third unless this compliance is brought into into order. Ms. Gillum? Oh, Sorry. Go ahead, please. <laughs> Should have put up my hand. 
Um, sorry, the initial letter that was sent to them was sent at the end of October. I'm just letting them know that we were aware of unauthorized development on yep. the property. Um, <clears throat> and then the, oh, January. another letter was sent out um, yeah. January, January 2nd. Um, or sorry, middle 17th. middle of January. My apology. Um, that is a, a written warning, um, and, and like we reiterate that we had sent a letter in October, and that, um, yeah, in contravention or whatever, and uh, what they uh, what they need to do. Okay, and do you have dates for when the applicant complied to these? non-compliant letters? <clears throat> like when they have to respond by? Yeah. Um, they, they... And did they respond? Uh, with they made, uh, to make application to Alberta Transportation by mid-March, which I believe they have already gotten approval for, um, and that require... Um, they, we've asked them to um, deal with some of this stuff by mid-April, and I mean, they've applied for the businesses. Um, they haven't come forward to MPC yet, though, for us to make a decision. So is this pretty normal that it would take seven months to get some actions taken on a letter that was sent to them? Well, I mean, the next letter was sent in January. I'm giving them till mid-April to do stuff. We usually try to give sufficient time to get permits for um, for businesses or to move buildings and things like that. And also the time for staff to kind of check back on things, which is why we're hiring the compliance officer so we can get some help with that. And it's been advertised. So, do you, <laughs> so. do you have dates for when he applied for, um, for the building permits for uh, these buildings that have been put on the site uh, without building permits? Uh, applications for those were recently sent in. They were sent in after our first reading to get those buildings in compliance. And the application for the land use amendment was made in um, March. So all of these came into approximately within close timing of each other. So they have been indicating that they'll be taking the steps to get everything in compliance. So they applied for everything prior to the date on the letter, but we just have to go through the process yeah. to see if they receive approval and meet those conditions. So all of these new buildings, he's being assessed taxes on that, and he's being paying taxes on all these new buildings that aren't in compliance? They always tax the, tax the buildings whether they have approval. Or not, yes. <laughs> just for the record. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Additional questions for the development officer? I would ask then if the development officer has any uh, comments received from referral agencies. Uh, yes, I do have comments received from referral agencies. Telus Communications has no objections. Fortis Alberta has determined that there is no easement required. Trans Alta has no concerns. Alberta Energy has no comments. Alberta Transportation send in their comments and the gist of their comment, a summary, summary of their comments would be that um, the existing access was to remain and if uh, that all access is considered temporary and if any um, changes are being made to the property that they would need to submit application to Alberta Transportation for any approvals going forward. Uh, public infrastructure had no objections with the land use amendments, but public infrastructure has been made aware of the non-permanent building encroaching on Range Road 5-3 of the right-of-way and request that the acquisition of the additional area with the subdivision application, the building should be moved to meet the building setbacks. So in essence, uh, Public Works was indicating that the building where that is encroaching on Range Road 5-3, if it could be relocated into the newly redesignated portion to meet all the setback requirements. Uh, Public Works Operations had no, no comments or concerns. Municipal Planning Commission received application on April 20th, 2023. 
Uh, Mr. Planning Commission recommended that Constable Fever be considered second and third reading of the land use amendment with the following conditions. Developmental, developmental, development approval or legalization of the existing buildings has, has to be obtained prior to second and third reading and parking associated with the building and businesses and uses on the property shall not be on Range Road 5-3 or within the road allowance. Those are all the comments received. Thank you, Mr. Clark. At this time, I would invite the applicants if uh, they would wish to speak to their proposal or add any comments in support of their request and to respond to any of the comments they've heard so far. Go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to, to mention that um, RMS Plus uh, provides internet and security to the community. Um, we donate a majority of um, services to our community on a daily basis. My wife is uh, my partner um, in, in the business. She's also uh, a federal employee through Alberta Post or Canada Post. Um, we, uh, we provide many different services to our community. We are very busy. We are very uh, dedicated to our community. Um, in building this uh, property, um, the, the approach, approach, approaching, encroaching um, building on 5-3 was placed there six years ago um, to provide a delivery spot for, um, the, uh, for Canada Post. Also to add security to the property, um, uh, with cameras um, and uh, and a uh, barrier between our, our our tanks that are existing, um, and uh, um, it's a uh, it's a tourist destination. It is um, we provide and we live on the property uh, above the store as well, um, and we were the other uh, building that was mentioned on the. Uh, the north side of the property has existed there for 30 some years. In 1909, uh, the store was placed there. It has been there for over 100 years, which we will also be interested in uh, applying for a historical site um, uh, in the future. Here. Uh, anything we can do to uh, work with, with council. We are definitely, and the county, we are definitely willing to do. We are just limited with space um, and functionality. Uh, we have um, a 50 zone in there that is never enforced by the county's uh, uh, bylaw officers or RCMP, which is also dangerous. We provide ice cream and the kids are out front eating ice cream. There's so many variables and so many moving parts within our company. Um, we. Uh, we want to work with everybody, and we are not ignoring or, uh, you know, um, uh, by in any way means disrespecting uh, the county bylaws uh, in any way, shape, or form. Um, we're just trying to work with what we have available to us on that property. Um, I feel that uh, <clears throat> the expansion on the on the property would would give us that space to, to not only expand, but um, to allow for safety. Um, for, uh, for our viewers, we get 300 customers um, a day in the, in the, like for May long, we just had uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, over 300 customers a day come through that door. Um, and, uh, and it's, we're, we're, we're trying to take something that was a sole proprietorship when we moved into there six years ago on June 1st um, and turn it into a business where it was uh, previous, it was ran as a family owned business. It was, um, was not incorporated um, or was, uh, it was only um, like a mom and pop kind of thing. So. We've, we've tried to expand it. We also need, with the um, RC or RMS Plus building that we've put in, um, it, it runs our offices. It provides, you know, 
extra space that, that's required. Um, and of course, when I go in there, I'm not thinking about paperwork. It's not that I'm ignoring or, a, you know, a, but it is a, an oversight on my part to try and make the property functional. Um, and uh, we were working to, to meet all your requirements. Absolutely. Thank if you. anybody has any questions at all directly for me, I would I'd be oh, happy to answer. Oh, sure. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Ratcliffe, your light's been on for a bit, and then I'll go to Councillor Cermak. Thank you. I just have a, a question for uh, Mr. Clark. Uh, you mentioned that Alberta Transportation called this temporary access. What does that mean, and what implications will that have down the road? Uh, essentially, all access onto the highway from from a residence or any access onto the highway is temporary. So therefore, if the Alberta Transportation needs needs to widen the road or move the access, it basically gives them the right to do so. Oh, okay. So that's the temporary nature of it. So it's not saying that it's not, it's not supposed to be there or it's only there for a certain time period. It's just get, allowing Alberta Transportation, if they need to move the access, they have the right to move the access. Okay, so it's not a significant factor. No. Thank you. Councillor Cermak. Yeah, uh, you said that you moved a building to the west side six years ago. Did you get a, burn, a building permit for that location? Because that's within our encroachment area. No, uh, I understand that. I, I did not require that because it was a, it's a, when we say building, it is a shed, a 12 by, 14 shed that's on skids that was located directly um, east of the store building and we we moved it across there um, for access um, the uh, um, the drivers for the um, for the Canada Post um, were damaging the building on um, the main building by backing into it constantly and and that's that was the the meaning for moving it over, but no, I I did not receive a uh, gain a permit to do to do that. I'm, I'm but I'm also coming from a, a farm background. We own a farm a mile east of the store as well, a quarter section, um, and uh, I just was not aware that moving a shed on across a commercial building or an agricultural building or a property because it's still listed as ag because they're trying to process it. The county hasn't done anything about that. Um, it's still listed as agriculture, right existing, which uh, I guess according to Adrian, the, um, it should have been listed as a commercial property. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm unaware of, you know, I'm a rules, I'm a, I'm a business owner and a, and a farm owner. I am, I'm, I know ignorance is no excuse. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> just busy, we have five kids. We are a, a very busy family. Um, and uh, uh, trying to make a right by being here today. I, right. I appreciate the business that you have out there and the things that you do, but we've got to be in compliance. Uh, I mean, you, you had a letter in October and you haven't done anything until you wanted to get some more land for parking. I think it's great that you get more land for parking, but I think first we need to have everything else in compliance before we issue you any more land to put whatever you want on it without building permits, because you approved to me. And my opinion is that a building permit doesn't mean anything to you. It does to us. And that's my opinion. Okay, thank you for that. Um, any further uh, uh, questions of, um, of uh, Councillor Northcott? Go ahead. For the, thank you. <clears throat> on the subject area, for the, is, are there any current buildings or anything on that uh, 0.55 acres that's no. completely bare? Yes, it's completely empty. Mr. Clark? Sorry, I missed your answer. Oh, I, I said yes, the, um, that 0.55 acre is completely vacant. Oh, it's completely yeah. vacant. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
I guess at this stage of the hearing, we would ask if uh, there were any members of the public wishing to speak in favor of the application. Again, any members of the public wishing to speak in favor of the application. Oh, can I? Uh, go ahead. Um, I do have letters from our immediate neighbors. There, there is that, there is an opportunity for those letters to be introduced oh, as okay. well. So I'll, I will be asking staff. Well, thank thank you for that. Right. Again, one final time for any member of the public wishing to speak in favor of the application. Seeing none, I would uh, look to the development officer if there were any uh, written submissions in favor of the request. Two written letters of support were received from the Fort Camps and Karen Osterholt. Uh, these letters were submitted to the county by the landowner on the resident's behalf. Um, and we also received a total of 140 signatures indicating support for the following statement. James River General Store, RMS Plus, uh, is, seeking, is seeking community support for the expansion of the location, expansion and location upgrades. The purpose of these upgrades, upgrades to the property is to increase the services we can provide to both, both our local community and to any, com uh, any commuter in the area. Your support is encouraged, Clearwater County. Your support will encourage Clearwater County to approve our development. We, the undersigned, are our concerned citizens, concerned citizens who urge our leaders to act now to approve the expansion of James James River General Stores and RMS Plus. Uh, the letters that were provided were submitted to council, providing council had a chance to review them, would you, would council like me to read the letters or has council had the chance to, had sufficient time to review the letters provided? Does council wish to uh, have anything highlighted in any of those letters or any questions relating to that correspondence? I don't think I see a, a need to do that. So, okay. um, Thank you very much for that. Um, at this time, I would invite any member of the public wishing to speak in opposition to the application. Again, I could invite comments from any member of the public wishing to speak in opposition to the application. And one final time, any member of the public wishing to speak in opposition to the application. Seeing none, I would uh, ask uh, the development officer, were there any written submissions opposing the request? Uh, no written submissions in opposition to the proposal was received. Thank you very much. Uh, so I would, as I promised, I would give the applicants the final word uh, here and uh, you know, an opportunity to share any comments or final remarks. Yeah, I, I, I feel like I've, I've covered the majority of it um, sure. for you guys. Um, uh, again, if I had any direct questions or anything um, or that I could um, speak to, then I would. But I think I, I mentioned most of it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I will give you the final word again, but uh, Councillor Northcott's light is on and Councillor Cermak's light as well. So um, I will... <clears throat> Allow um, Councilor Northcott to go first, please. Thank you. Uh, just to go, just a little bit uh, on Councilor Shermack's comments there. For if this item were to be uh, tabled or postponed into the future until all the the buildings were to be uh, like all the compliance had had been completed, you know, I, I don't know when all the the issues of compliance could be remedied and everything is now 100% compliant. If this was tabled into the future with that, what implications would that have on your on your application here? Uh, well, that would allow me to come to a compliance for sure. You know, um, we were, I was waiting on permits and, and, and hoping that, you know, uh, if there was no leeway, it was, you know, cut and dry, then if, you know, then if there was no exceptions, then then we could um, 
that would have to make those changes. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, you know, something in advance or you know, being postponed would would definitely help. So, and I guess, yeah, just to, if I may, just a little bit more, just, yeah, the app, like as the applicant and maybe planning with these, what would be the time frame roughly? You know, with all the requirements here to be able to bring this building or this this property up to compliance, what kind of time frame would that be? And then maybe have it postponed until have this agenda item postponed until then. Uh, two of the permits for RMS Plus and for the legalization of the additions will be brought to MPC in June. So that'll be the meeting in June. Um, in regards to the encroaching building in the right of way, uh, that application, Public Works has indicated that, you know, for them, for them, they would feel a lot more comf comfortable with that shed being in the redesignated area. So that would, the movement of that shed would be dependent on the approval passing of this uh, land use amendment. But other than that, the other buildings that need to be legalized would be brought before MPC in June. Okay, so not too far away, really? No, not that far away. Okay, I'll just leave it at that then. And Councillor Sermon. Uh, I just have one question for um, the people there, uh, that own the James River store. That is, your, that is their principal residence there also, I believe. Uh, I was just wondering where and how he was handling wastewater. I know it's not up to us to, to know that, but it's a real health concern. This is a pretty small piece of property. Uh, is your wastewater pump out or, or what kind of a system do you have for your wastewater? Um, Go ahead. We have, we have a mound that's been that was placed there um, within the last 12 years um, that was placed in by the previous owner that lives now north of us on the property, uh, just north of the property, um, adjoining lands. Um, so it is a mound that is our septic field. So it's on private property, is it? It's on our property, yes. It's on your property? Yeah, uh, yeah it's located right behind the, the fuel tanks, that open area there. Um, is the mound that was put in. Isn't there a certain setback that you have to have for a mound, like a thousand feet I, from property line? I would imagine it was grandfathered in um, uh, prior to purchase okay. of the property. Ms. Gillum Maybe has, I'm getting out of my jurisdiction. Uh, well, I think <laughs> Ms. Gillum may have some light to shed on that issue. Um, I know it's yeah, we have a little pamphlet place. that we have from Alberta Safety Codes that we hand out, so I was just double checking it in for treatment mounds. They have to be three meters or ten feet from a property line. So that's pro like if it's in the open space, it's likely achievable there. Oh, just ten feet. That's what it says. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. And again, as I promised, I will allow the applicants the final final word uh, before I close the hearing. <coughs> um, not that you're forced to say anything; we just have the opportunity to. Yeah, I think like this rezoning is just a mechanism to move forward with with um, a subdivision to allow the problems to be fixed and come into compliance. It's just all part of the, the stepping stones to get there. So I, I think if this gets tabled, it would potentially not necessarily railroad the the remedy to some of these issues, but it may postpone it and trip up the process. That's all I kind of wanted to add on that. Is so. Well, thank you very much for attending today. Um, I will close the hearing at this time and no motions will be entertained at this time. Thank you, for, thank you for joining us today. Now, having said that, I will skip ahead very quickly to item 5.2, which is consideration of second, third readings of bylaw 1142-23 for application 0323 to amend the land use bylaw. And again, I'll go across the room to Mr. Clark to introduce this item, please. 
Thank you, Reeve Lahid. Uh, the purpose of bylaw 1142-23 is to amend Clearwater County Land Use Bylaw number 714-01 to redesignate 0.55 acres of Southwest 2734-5, west of the 5th, from the Agricultural District to Highway Development District. Pending the outcome of the land use amendment, the applicant will proceed with the proposed boundary adjustment to consolidate 0.55 acres of the redesignated highway development district contained in Southwest 2734, five west of the fifth, with the remainder of the land containing the James River store. Please refer to the documents attached in, gen in documents attached as agenda item 4.2 for further details on this application. At regular council meeting held on April 11, 2023, council reviewed and gave first reading to bylaw 1142-23 as required by legislation. Notice of today's public hearing was advertised in local paper and comments were invited from adjacent landowners and referral, referral agencies. Upon consideration, of the representations made at the public hearing, council will consider whether or not to grant second and third reading to bylaw 1142-23. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions relating to this item? Uh, Councillor Swanson or a motion? Uh, yes, um, I know for myself, I realize that uh, we want more rural economic development and this is a much needed service we, we talk about the, the need for broadband and need of connectivity. So this is an important service for, our, especially for our Southern re region uh, residents. So I, you bring value to our community and, and that's well understood. And I will trust that the MPC will be, uh, next month, will be um, dealing with the, the permits as, as, as indicated. And I trust that they will put conditions as needed if that, that need be as far as timelines, et cetera. So I am going to move a second reading. Thank you very much. And reviewing what I've seen here, I see uh, a great many signatures that are supportive of this business within their community. I haven't heard of complaints or opposition to this. Uh, so I will be supporting second reading myself. Ultimately, I want to ensure that the public knows we hear their voice and, uh, and respond accordingly as well. So, Councillor Ratcliffe. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Reeve. Um, I guess I have to say I, I don't condone what's happened here. Um, it, it looks to me like it was a, a space issue that was partly behind uh, setting up the situation where it's, it's out of compliance. Um, and that th this... Uh, application is to support um, resolving the compliance issues, but also for future, future growth. I appreciate that you are bringing more services to that area, to that community, and uh, we need to see that happening. So I have to applaud that. I'm going to trust that our processes in place through administration and uh, through MPC will be sufficient to ensure that this is followed through. I, I will be supporting the motion. And I'll go to uh, Councillor Northcott next and then Councillor Graham. All right, no, just in the, the background information here, it says the unit you know, store is operated legally for over 38 years. Um, and it can be confusing with all the bylaws, regulations, policies in today's world. Um, but I think this does really bring awareness to really for all residents and people to really contact the county and you know uh, prior to development and just double check and confirm that they're um, in compliance with new development or buildings or, or that kind of thing. So it does raise a well, level of awareness really for all residents. So yeah, that's all. Councillor Graham, please. My question is for planning. So a complaint was already received and you guys have already sent letters and everything. So let's say hypothetically this, we approve second and third reading here. 
that would still, if nothing were to change, you guys would still proceed to enforce the complaint anyways. Yes, yes we so would. So even when we approve this, there's still a timeline, technically really, on, import, on, on being in compliance. So we don't really need to worry about approving this and things not being done because we're already in the process of that, correct? Yes, we are, okay. we are in the process. And, um, the steps to enforce would still be in place until everything is uh, been met. And if we were, hypothetically, if it were to not be approved, then is it it's six months, I believe, to reapply? Yes. So then that would be six months when that area is needed to improve the safety, which is the number really important for me because it is a tricky parking lot, especially when you get big trucks and, and trailers and stuff in there. But so the safety would be put off for six months and also potentially being in compliance would be put off for six months because that land is required to be in compliance. Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Cermak, your light is on. Yeah, the comment. Uh -huh. We've heard in our council and all our MDP meetings and everything that agricultural land is pretty vital to this community. And here we are taking some agricultural land out of agricultural and putting it into highway development. Uh, it's totally against what all of our people had voted for. In two days or three days or whatever, we dealt with the MPC. It says that it looks like lots of people down there want subdivisions down there now. It certainly is a flip-flop from what I've heard. I think that's always the danger of only having a small sampling of public opinion. That's that's the danger of that. I, I think But we that, can't force those opinions to come out, can we? No. And I, I think that what he does down there is great, but we've got to get into compliance so that the rest of the people that are coming into our community knows that we have to have building permits before stuff goes ahead. And moving buildings and I have no idea why this piece of property with this store that's been there for over a hundred years is still designated agriculture. Why would it not be industrial or light industrial or whatever? I think um, administration or staff have some comments on that, maybe Please. help some clarification. Um, it is actually designated highway development. Oh, okay. So it's not agriculture. So it's not agriculture, it's highway development. Okay. And I, I know the applicants were perhaps wishing to comment on some of those. Just for that particular portion of the land, Harry Blankard, um, uh, it was an unusable location because of the moisture issue. Um, it is a, a low-lying area. So just for that one from Mr. Cermak, um, just for that particular, um, not in a general Com in comment just in that particular situation for us um, the the by bringing that it was an unusable piece of ag land um, to the east of us and that's uh, just for that particular use it was so low lying that the water moisture coming off of that was going into the basement of the property and that would allow us to uh, um, uh, develop that or, or fill it in to prevent that moisture sitting in that in that corner just for that one one particular Thank you. Um, and I'm going to go to Deputy Reed Melhoff, and then I'll come back to, I, I think, yourself, uh, Councillor Sermon. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, I understand that this is a much needed development, it's a much needed upgrade um, to the area um, and to your business in general. Uh, my concern is that applications to come into compliance did not come in after the first letter requesting compliance, after the second letter requesting compliance. They didn't come in until a subdivision was needed or wanted. Um, I would support this um, fully if uh, that had already happened, if um, coming into compliance had already happened or if we table this until compliance can be made. Um, the current motion on the floor will not be supporting um, just because of, of the timeline. Uh, I would rather see you in compliance before giving a new raid designation. Okay, any further comments? Com Councillor Cermak, please. Yeah. Um, just something, I was down by the place uh, the other day, and I noticed that um, 
where this uh, diagonal line is across there, across uh, the quarter land, I see that there's a brand new fence there. It's been in there for quite some time. Did Harry put that in? So that he's already said that, yeah, go ahead and do the subdivision and stuff. Or he just wanted to put the fence in there to keep his cattle out of. But that's a, far, that's a piece of farmland there that he farms there. Uh, I see that Harry puts a crop in there every year. Yes. And he's chosen not to do this area this year. Yes, he, uh, he normally, um, you can see the existing, in the, in the picture line, you can see where he did uh, cut. So he's not coming too far out of his, um, you know, out of his field, but you can see where it was, it's dark versus where it's light. Um, that's where he normally cut. And he said that, um, and I, I, by discussing it with him in the, um, in the past, uh, I, he said that it would be easier for him to go from the corner of the existing uh, five acres, from that corner, kitty corner across, um, for his equipment. Uh, and he said, so he, he more or less decided where his line was going. Okay, so he's done that on his own. He did that on his own to um, last fall, uh, to because he, he grazes his cattle in there. Okay, yeah. thanks. Okay. So I think we've uh, had had much discussion around second reading here. Um, unless there was any further comments, I'm going to call that uh, question. All in favor? And those opposed? That is carried. Uh, again, entertain motions then for third reading. Um, third reading. Uh, Councillor Graham, please. I would make a motion that Council grants third reading to bylaw 1142-23. Thank you. Discussion on that motion. Deputy Reed Milhoff. Uh, thank you, Reed. Just for um, the formality of explaining why I, I will be voting against it, I had already stated it during the second reading why I'll be not in favor of third reading today. Thank you. Further discussion? Seeing none, I call the question all in favor. And those opposed? That is carried. Great, thank you very much for, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. We're gonna take a short 10 minute break and then uh, carry on with the agenda at that time.
Oh, I'm sorry. Welcome back, everyone. It's uh, so great to be back and in session again. Um, we're moving through our agenda today, and um, just bear with me for a second. We're uh, welcome to have strategic steps uh, with us today to uh, speak to the Clearwater County Village of Caroline Amalgamation Study Report, and I would uh, welcome Ian uh, to join us. Thank you very much, Reeve. It's very nice to be back in front of you in 3D, uh, and it's important enough, I think, today to, to actually have that conversation here together. Uh, I don't know if that was an introduction. Just keep going. If there was anything else you it, wanted to provide, very poor introduction. But if you would, if you would continue, so we'd certainly be so appreciative of uh, seeing what you have have for us today. Sure. Thanks, Reeve. And I understand you have you've got a, a bit of a request for decision, even though there's no decision being requested. A little bit of a background. You've also had this presentation. Um, I will suggest say to you that uh, nine o'clock this morning, I gave the same presentation to Village Council in Caroline. So this is the, both councils hearing the same information on the same day. So, so thank you for that. Uh, today's opportunity is to provide you with the summative results of the amalgamation study we did in terms of both the survey and the engagement and the research and all the rest of that. And then not looking for a decision, but asking you to receive this and for information as part of uh, the ongoing process as we go through this voyage of discovery. So with that in mind, Reeve and other members of council, I'll just go through a little bit of what we want to talk about today, and I'm more than happy to respond to some of the questions that you might have or insights that you might want to provide as well. So really what I would like to do is, for those of you who are part of the, um, the ICC, you have seen this all in detail before. For those of you who weren't part of that or aren't part of that process, but have been part of joint council meetings with the village and the county, some of this will be a little bit more detail and some of this will be stuff that you've seen before. We we'll talk a bit about engagement. Uh, from that engagement, we developed a series of themes to try and stream the information to a, to a space where it becomes digestible rather than just a whole lot of data. Your job, of course, then, is to provide the insights that come out of the theming that we have provided. We worked through a series of assumptions with the ICC and in terms of ourselves, too, and because that can sometimes color the results, we wanted to speak to the assumptions. As you embark on the process of discovery that continues, of course, this becomes something that is neither completely good nor completely bad, neither black nor white. But this is where your political lens becomes really important about how you decide the best uh, for the long-term future of your county and the region as a whole as well. We have a conclusion we'd like to present. And then just to, uh, talk to you a little bit about next steps in terms of legislative process, as well as other topics that are coming up too. You have a fulsome report uh, of this, so we're, uh, what I'd like to talk to today are just some of the high points. I'm more than happy to respond to questions about anything that's in the report, but uh, just for the sake of time and recognizing you have a full agenda, we're just going to stick to some of the high points. So looking through the, the engagement, which was really hearing from everybody who wanted to be heard. First of all, our principle was meet people where they were and are, and this was meant both physically and philosophically. So because of that, we held engagement sessions around the county, three of which were in the county itself, one of which was in the village of Caroline, and then we held a fourth, a fifth engagement session, which was online. Um, there were representatives of elected of the elected officials from both the village and the county at every one of the sessions, including the uh, including the online session too. We had between 20 and 60 people show up at each one of the sessions. The heaviest attended was the one at the Ag Culture Hub in Caroline. The other ones in community centers or community halls around the county had greater or lesser attendance. And then we had about 20 people who chose to avail themselves of the, um, of the online session too. The people who came to the sessions kind of fit into three different groups. The first one was people such as yourselves, either elected or appointed officials from both the village and the county. Of course, as the stewards of your municipalities, that makes sense. The other group, and as the second group of people who came were interested citizens, ratepayers, business owners, those sort of things who see any change in the structure of this particular region in terms of municipal status having an impact on them. Uh, good, bad, some just wanted to find out what was going on. And the third group was a group of people who showed up to regularly to most, if not all, of the meetings. So those were people like the Taxpayers Association, representatives of the Caroline Library, those kind of groups, who were perhaps 
I would I would suggest it's somewhat disproportionately represented because they showed up to every session. So, was, whereas one person may have showed up to one session, other people showed up to all four. And so they so I just give that give that as a note for for a grain of salt, if you'd like. So those were the people who came. We also had some people who were interested in how the United Nations or the World Economic Forum had an impact in the future of Caroline, and you can deal with that as you see fit. What we heard in, when, we, when we heard from the people who provided engagement, and we synthesized the results of it in the engagement sessions, whether in person or virtual, from the surveys, which were provided either in hard copy or digital, were a series of themes. And this is where the, the, the data starts to be turned into knowledge and where you get a chance to put your own political lens on it, knowing the best of your communities too. The surveys, we ended up with about 112 survey results coming in, most of which came in digitally, some of which came in in hard copy. We combined the results of both of them because they were the same surveys. We wanted to make sure we caught people uh, to make it to attend, so we wanted to catch, just cast the net broadly. So we used the county's newsletter, we used all of the regional newspapers that we could find, we used social media, uh, those accounts which were uh, either municipal, which were the municipal accounts, and finally we relied on some of your networks as well, whether you were county councillors or whether you were village councillors, to bring people out to the engagement, and uh, they, you came, and they came. So this is a synthesis. What you see in the report, if you've had a look at it, really is a synthesis. And when we started theming the comments, they kind of themed into seven, seven different areas, each of which I'd like to speak to very briefly, but I'm more than happy to respond to in more detail if you like. The first was about debt and infrastructure deficits, specifically and particularly the infrastructure deficit of the village of Caroline and a lot of which has really brought us to where we are right now in terms of the maintenance. And Caroline's been around long enough now, of course, that some of the original infrastructure is in a condition where it needs to be repair, replaced. A lot of it needs to be on, with an ongoing maintenance, ongoing repair too. The same could be said of the county, though to a lesser extent in terms of the, the cost per capita, if you like. The second piece we heard was around economies of scale and efficiencies that would come about if you combine two current municipal entities into a single entity. Some of this appears to be inherently makes sense. There are some, some functions we only need one of if there are two municipalities that are combined. Some of them doesn't make as much impact because there are still the same number of people who require service. So the same number of greater drivers, the same number of rink rats, those sort of things, because there are the same number of people. The conversation happened about what's the fundamental nature of the decision. Is this a governance decision? Is this a finance decision? Or is it something else? And of course, if we use the Municipal Government Act as an example, this becomes a governance decision with significant financial overlay to it as well, in terms of the sustainability of the village and the, the long-term adoption of things like revenue streams, expense streams, of infrastructure deficits, of assets and liabilities. There's a piece here too around governance around self-determination versus outside determination. At the moment, this study is called an amalgamation study. And that is because there is a, there is a, a lens of self-determination as part of this. Both the village and the county have an opportunity to progress as they see fit. Should the decision be made not to proceed at some point or in the short term, the village continues to face its infrastructure issues and financial issues and sustainability issues, which may take it from the realm of self-determination to an outside determination if the village is determined to be no longer viable by the provincial government. We also saw a theme around types of services that people want, uh, both in types of types uh, and the mix of the mix of the services and the costs of the services. And this is a really good opportunity for a reset, of course, to determine what it is that people actually want without just bolting bits on or subtracting individual pieces. So there's an opportunity here to look at service mix and service level. Taxes always shows up whenever we have an opportunity to work with local government. And it can be taxes in terms of the total amount that a residence pay or a property pays or a business pays or an industrial area pays. Or it can also be a question of value. How much do I get for the amount of money that I provide to my municipal government? And finally, there's a theme here about where you stand depends on where you sit. And that we saw different results collectively from people who live in the village of Caroline than we do from people who live in in Clearwater County. And even within the county, we saw some differences between those who are proximal to Caroline and interact with it, and those who are not proximal, who live significantly further away and for whom there would be less impact. 
So just at a very high level, if we went through each one of these, uh, these themes, if you like, and you put your own lens on them, when we look at debt and infrastructure deficit, a lot of this was associated with just the actual cost. Some of it was also based on the, the, um, um, the sorry, sorry, debt limits. And neither the village nor the county is anywhere close to its provincially prescribed debt limits. So the ability to carry the current debt is appropriate. What happens in the future, of course, would likely change that, particularly for the village, maybe less, certainly less so for the county. And the question then became from county residents, does this mean the county would end up taking on infrastructure costs, infrastructure deficit or infrastructure debt costs for the village? And the answer becomes yes. It's also reciprocal in that the, the village people would end up taking on infrastructure costs for the county as well, though recognizing there are 500 people in the village and 12,500 in the county, there's quite a significant difference in how those things would work out. The ultimate sustainability of the village of Caroline is based a lot on those infrastructure costs. You all know that. Uh, the, count, the village councillors are aware of that too, and that there is a cost associated with maintaining and replacing that infrastructure, which is something which threatens the fiscal sustainability of that, that village. It's not new. Every municipality has a municipal infrastructure deficit. How you handle it and how much of a deficit there is changes, of course. With the age of a particular community, particularly urban ones in this region, the infrastructure is all aged at the same rate. So we're seeing villages across the, across the province have similar issues with similar types of infrastructure because it's day aging in a similar fashion. When it comes to efficiencies and economies of scale, I made a comment too about just a little while ago about the number of CAOs, if you like, versus the number of people who uh, will maintain the roads and clear snow, that there's a difference, of course. You need a single CAO, but you probably need a very similar number of greater operators. The difference to this, of course, is that the county already provides a lot of financial help and service help to the people who live in the village of Caroline and to the village of Caroline itself. So it's not like there's a, there's a, a, a complete wall that's built around the village where there is no interaction. So this type of thing on efficiencies and economies of scale is something that would give you an opportunity to think about how you might do things different. There's an expertise too that some there are some there's some expertise that lies in the village. There's a lot of expertise that lies here too, and you have the opportunity to take advantage of where that lives, uh, wherever it is at the moment. If we move on to governance versus finance, we're looking here at the opportunities and impacts of any potential change. And I, I keep equivocating because, of course, the decision is yours. We came up with the themes. You add your own lens to that. You would need in a in a combined community a single set of bylaws, policies, and plans. And as such, then you can take some from one municipality and some from another. What some amalgamating municipalities have done is take all from one and then modify as necessary. Asset management is something five, 10 years ago, which wasn't mandatory, even though it was a good practice. That, of course, has changed, as have things like municipal development plans, uh, I, I, ICFs for smaller communities that didn't used to be there either. So those become uh, governance tools, even though there is a financial component to it. The financial component is primarily the, the, sustain the fiscal sustainability, recognizing that re re residential properties typically don't pay the costs of servicing residential properties. So a lot of the non-residential ends up paying some of that. You would see an increase in the overall value of the assessment in the region if you combine two municipalities into one, but that just becomes a summative piece rather than anything that's qualitative, just because there are now more people here. Something that what has been of concern is political representation too, particularly when it comes to a governance decision. With 500 people in a, in a population of 13,000, if we add the two together, give or take, there would not be enough people in the village of Caroline to merit a full time, a single councillor around a joint council table. Because the constitution, of course, calls for the plus or minus 25% based on representation by population. The suggestions that came up were uh, if there's a rejigging of electoral boundaries, a reallocation based on property change, on population changes and population movement, it's possible that a single councillor would represent Caroline plus some of the region around it. 
It's also possible that it would remain the way it is at the moment, where it could conceivably be two members of, of a new council <coughs> would have some part of Caroline as, as their political representation. But that's, it's unlikely, very unlikely, unless you double the size of council, that you would have a single representative representing just the village of, current village of Car Caroline. When it comes to self-determination versus external determination, of course, that is amalgamation versus dissolution, both of which had come up. At the moment, both municipalities have the ability to negotiate with one another, to, to provide some sense of self-determination in terms of service types, service levels, the, the governing documents, all those sorts of things, because you're engaged in an amalgamation process. If this does, if no action is taken, and this does end up in a dissolution in years to come, which is quite likely, that becomes a provincial government process rather than a regional process. And as such, the province would do a viability review or studies to that account that, that, in that nature. And then the, the, the decision would be provided to you rather than having you actively engaged in that. If we look at services, I've spoken a little bit about services already, but just a little bit of change to this too, is that as part of a negotiation process that is, some, that is kind of the next step, should both the county and the village choose to proceed, that becomes a, that's where the negotiation starts to happen. And it's not a collective, we'll talk about recreation, then we'll talk about culture, then we'll talk about the library, then we'll talk about agriculture. Everything is thrown into the mix all at once. And there becomes some quid pro quo, some give and take the as the negotiation begins to happen around the, the, either this table, a joint council table, throughout a negotiating committee, or throughout the IC, ICC as you currently have it. Those would all be settled through governance documents, like your policies and your plans and your bylaws that ultimately become public, public documents. We know at the moment that you share, essentially, you share staff, you share equipment with the village of Caroline just because of the number of people who live there and their capacity to, to pay for that. There's a significant financial contribution from the county to the village already. And so that becomes something that gets put in the mix along with the assets and the liabilities and the, uh, the infrastructure deficits and those sorts of things. This does give you the opportunity, of course, as I mentioned earlier, to figure out what has changed over the last little while as the definition of community has changed. What used to be purely geographical, where Caroline used to be a regional center because transportation costs and communication costs were expensive, has now become a community of communities where people live there because they've always lived there. They live there because they have kids in school or that's their faith community or recreational community. People, people are much more mobile than they used to be. So that, of course, has a change in terms of the types of services that people require that maybe they didn't require so much 20, 30, 40 years ago. You can use practices that work here. You can work, use practices that work there. You can learn from other uh, hamlets, if you like, in other counties in Alberta, other amalgamated communities too, although there aren't, there's only a couple of examples of amalgamated communities in the last <coughs> 10 or 50 plus, getting on for the last 20 years. If we were to speak about taxes, taxes showed up in two different forms. The, the first form was purely the amount of money. How much money do I give to my local government to provide whatever it happens to be? The second question came, or comment came around value. Of the money that I provide to whichever local government it is, do I get, do I think that I get that amount of money back in terms of value? Do I think I get more? Do I think I get less? And of course, that's depend on the individual's perspective and a lot of cases about how they actually interact with what their local government does. They all live on roads, for example, but they might not avail themselves of the programs that you happen to offer. So in the case of taxes, when we combine revenue, expenses, assets, liabilities, including infrastructure deficits, that has an impact on taxes. What sometimes shows up in other municipalities where we have worked is an expectation of continued service levels in urban areas that are no longer urban areas. Uh, service levels sometimes change to whatever the larger population base wants. An example of this, we've done some work in places like Alex or Mirror on the other side of Highway 2, where there are, for, for all intents and purposes, urban parks in some of these smaller villages, which if you move to a rural standard wouldn't get their grass cut quite as often. That there's, a, there's a dollar saving to that, but there's a question then that comes back into service levels as well. You, as elected officials, get the final say on whatever tax rates happen to be. You can't change the assessment, but you can modify the tax rate to be what, based on what people, what you, people need versus what people want. 
And sometimes it's a bit of both. And sometimes there are external considerations as well, such as changes in commodity prices or, the, or what happens uh, externally to you. There's a piece here too about communication. And one of the things we heard loud and clear throughout the amalgamation study has been that communication is important. Topics like accountability and transparency, whatever that means to an individual came up a lot. And so any moves forward ought to consider the use of that continuing, particularly from um, trusted sources like your own publications through newsletters, through articles that get written to newspapers, for social media feeds, those sorts of things, whether it's for the county or whether it's for the village. And I have noticed things like press releases thus far have gone out with both logos on them, both the town, village logo and the county logo, and I think that adds a sense of credibility. We do have to monitor and sometimes counter what we see in social media, in non-municipal social media, the rant and rave pages on <laughs> Facebook, what we see in the coffee shop senates that gather throughout the community and talk a lot about common sense as well. So knowing those sort of things is really important and needs to be pro pro projected forward as you continue to go. <clears throat> Excuse me. As I mentioned, the final aspect or theme that we identified was the where you stand depends on where you sit. And the difference in perspective between the people who live in Caroline and have voiced their opinion, those who live just outside Caroline in the county, and those who live further beyond. There's no universal opinion that came out. However, there were a uh, balance of probability or balance of opinions that, that showed up based on those three groups. And this is where the rumor mill comes in as well. We had more people show up at the Caroline engagement than at any other. That's, I think, in, in significant part because it has an impact on them more than it would have on a lot of county residents. It's also because it's, it's easier, transportation is easier if you're traveling within the village than if you're traveling throughout the county. So there's a disproportionate, you know, disproportionate volume of what we heard based on proximity to the village of Caroline. So in that case, combating that rumor mill is really important and recognizing that there are what we've termed special interest groups that want to have a say in this too. I made a reference to them as things like the Taxpayers Association, Chambers of Commerce, the Library. And I don't mean in a pejorative sense, special interest groups, but those people who are people or groups who are interested in a particular outcome. Certainly there is validity to that and they should be listened to, but they should be listened to in context of the other pieces as well. So those were the seven major theme areas that, that showed up. We also asked staff what they thought. This isn't something that was part of the public engagement because uh, we did a, an internal survey within the village and within the counties asking staff a bit about what their opinions on the amalgamation or potential of an amalgamation. By and large, they saw the benefit in it rather than the detriment, though there were some concerns that showed up in areas that you would expect, like what would happen to my job if it becomes redundant? What happens to equal compensation Do we need as we have to make it consistent between the village and the, and the county? And compensation also moves into the area of things like pensions as well. So long-term interest in the people who live here. Also recognizing that there is expertise that you don't want to lose in the village and in the county there. So we did ask them and those are, that's a lot of what they had provided to us. So I mentioned early too that we made a series of assumptions and we tested these with the ICC and some of the things that we had worked on. And these were some of the pieces that kind of form a framework, if you like, that we knew that if you add the county population and the village population and the businesses that operate in both and the community organizations, you end up with a single entity that is larger than both of the others. So that sounds rather simplistic, but that's one of the assumptions we went on. We also went on the assumption that municipal government exists to provide something to the people who choose to live in this location, people who move here, families who remain here, agricultural operators. And so they've chosen to do that, stay here for a reason, even though their <coughs> needs are different. And your job is to address those needs as you see fit. We also thought about combining the financial aspects of the two municipalities into one, uh, regardless of if it's an amalgamation or if it's an annexation. And we also know that there are existing patterns of travel already, that the, there are lots of people in the county who interact for social reasons or business reasons in the village, and a little bit goes the other way as well. So it's not like somebody is going to take a sign, uh, take a, dig out the sign that says Village of Caroline, one kilometer. The village is going to continue to exist. Its identity is going to continue to exist. The, the, the um, 
programs that are, sorry, not the programs, the community organizations and businesses will continue to exist there and in the county as well. The village readily admits that they are not sustainable in the long term. So the, one of the fundamental questions is, is it sooner or is it later? And if the amalgamation happens and you maintain a sense of self-control, which is why it becomes a governance decision in the, long, in the short term, you can make that decision. Should the county or the village or both choose not to make a decision at this point, it's likely that a dissolution is going to occur in the next few years over which you, you don't have as much control. So those were our assumptions. We've also seen some outside impact, and that is some telegraphing of intention from, say, the provincial government. In 2020, of course, they provided the three municipalities with a grant to, to do a study similar to this. In 2022, there was a second grant also provided from the province to do this particular study. That it shows interest from the provincial government in having fewer but more sustainable municipalities in the province. And there are flavors of this right across the country. We're working in New Brunswick at the moment. Last October, they had 50 new municipalities developed because of amalgamations. 2015, the uh, province of Manitoba went through a similar situation where they advised local governments to go and find some dance partners until they could get to a minimum population threshold. There's happened to be 1,000 people, or they were going to go and do some amalgamations too. The province of Ontario has done something similar. So we're seeing this flavor start to be more and more prominent as we move throughout the through, uh, move across the country and over time. The dissolution may not happen in the short term, but it's quite likely that it would happen in the medium term, and it certainly will have happened by the time the long term rolls around. So in that way, status quo is, I suppose status quo is always an option, but in this case, for the people who live in Caroline, it's not really an option because something is going to happen to them if something doesn't happen with them. And finally, there's a recognition, and this is a peculiarity that we've noticed in some other municipalities which have combined forces too, is if you increase the population of a municipality, it becomes uh, more attractive to, to business. If you're dealing with a population, of, it was more so on the part of the village, but it has a little bit of a resonance here too. If you're dealing with a population of 500 versus a population of 13,000, you're going to find different businesses which are interested in locating in that particular geographical area just because of a number on the sign as you enter into the community. You also then see that the residential and the non-residential tax base would, sorry, the residential tax base would, would benefit from that if there's more economic development. I will say too that the village has looked at things like their industrial park and pace as, uh, as things that they potentially could bring to the dance. And I, I mentioned pace specifically because there have been rumors that the, um, that the village should they get an additional $100,000 in revenue from that every year would not be interested in amalgamation. I asked the mayor that this morning. He assured me no, that they want to come into the partnership having brought something as an asset rather than not. So that was his response to me this morning. And I know some of you have asked that same question as well. So those are some of the other considerations. This is where your job kind of comes in. This is not black and white, but it does fall into a yes or no decision. Do we proceed or do we not proceed? And as such, then, your will matters. You have some political capital that you have the opportunity to spend where you see the greatest long-term benefit. This is one of those inflection points where you would be investing some political capital for sure because there's an election coming up in October of 2025. So in that case, there are some items that we see as likely next steps. Neither of you have completely uh, opened up and shared all the financial details all your particular interests. Uh, Councillor Cermak early on talked about things like a negotiation list. You haven't shared those things yet, and neither have the village. And these are some, just on the, the list here, are just alphabetically some of the areas that a negotiation would likely have to contain. And it's not a one-to-one -one relationship wherein, first of all, we're going to talk about culture, then we're going to talk about economic development, then we're going to talk about finance and taxes, because there's a bit of a trade-off. But if you want to talk about culture and I want to talk about taxes, it's like all the pieces will all get tied up to at the end, but they're not likely to come out in neat little packages as you continue to proceed. Hopefully it's not a last minute thing, but my suspicion is it would be the last quarter of the negotiation phase would be when the agreements start to happen. And even so, those would be likely internal to either the ICC or the negotiating committee or your joint councils. They would likely not be public decisions at that point for reasons, uh, for FOIP reasons, if for nothing else. So these are some of the things that you would likely need to consider as you look at the next steps. 
there are both advantages and disadvantages to whatever decision you happen to take. And this is where we saw some of the themes based on the assumptions and based on some of those other considerations that we kind of already talked about. And the pros, if you like, the advantages to doing something like this are the increased uh, tax bases, residential and non-residential. You take a, a nagging topic that has been there for quite a while off the table and you can concentrate on some other things. You've spent a lot of time talking about amalgamation, about these sorts of things over the last three or four years, through the, certainly through the duration of this council's term and before as well. You also provide some security for better or for worse, with the people who work for the county and the village too, that they're no longer worried, they're no, no longer wondering what's going to happen. You have expertise that you can learn from each other. You are merging your policies, your plans, your bylaws, your regulations. So people who are wondering what, what's going on in, in the region can know that there's a single set of rules that are applicable to everybody. We already know that population is moving. This takes that into account because, again, nobody built a wall around the village of Caroline. So those people are moving back and forth now, and there's a recognition that that is going to continue regardless of what happens. Mergers aren't new in this region. When we looked at the history of Clearwater County, going back years, of course, you have changed your structure, your status, uh, several times from the time you were first incorporated in, into where you are right now, this becomes another step on that process. And it's also different, of course, because we've sometimes heard from, well, what's the difference between Caroline and any of the other hamlets that are in the county? And of course, the difference is they weren't incorporated. So this is a change, whereas the other ones weren't a change. Uh, one of the small ones, too, is about address changes. Uh, do we have to change my driver's license because all of a sudden the village of Caroline doesn't exist as an incorporated uh, entity? And the history of dissolutions and amalgamations has shown that that's not the case. I, I do make reference frequently to, and I know some of you don't appreciate it all that much, between Diamond Valley, about Turner Valley and Black Diamond, but it's the only amalgamation we've seen in the last 15 years. So while it's not, while this situation is not directly uh, not apples to apples, if you like. It's kind of red delicious apples to golden delicious apples because the process would be the same. And so they had concerns, for example, around things like address changes, post office boxes, postal codes that remained the same, some of which were grandfathered and some of which just plain old remained the same. In terms of next steps, should you choose to proceed in whatever way you do, there are legislative requirements for what you, what you do. There, then you have kept the minister formally up to date in terms of what's happened so far. The next decision at some point in the near future would be do we, do we formally enter negotiations or not? Now it's probably do we formally enter negotiations and there's no not because you just wouldn't do anything because you wouldn't, you wouldn't vote not to do something. You would just vote to do something. Should you choose to enter that process, there's a notification process that has to go to the minister too. If both councils vote to embark on, on negotiations, which by the way is not an admission or an acceptance that there will be an amalgamation, but it's a next step down the road. Should you do that, it would begin. Should one or the other do it and the other one not, it's likely that the process would still proceed based on the, what the provincial government is kind of telegraphing at the moment. Should both choose not to proceed, i.e. do nothing, then the status quo remains and you start to move into that area of what happens over the next few years versus kind of what happens to you. So if both, both, both vote in favor, it would proceed. If one votes in favor, it may proceed. If neither votes in favor, you remain with status quo. So just to wrap up about what we, where we have been thus far, the, we, we recognize that there's however many pages in that report plus the conversations you've been part of and the engagement and all the rest of that really means that you have a binary decision to make, a yes or no, based on information that is not black and white. That you have to determine on balance what you see is the best for the long-term viability, the long-term growth, the long-term sustainability of this region, village, and county either together or apart but occupying the same, same space. When we did our research, and it's in your report, since 2007 we've seen two amalgamations. We had to go back to 2007 on this just to find the second amalgamation, and that was Lac La Biche and Lac La Biche County. Uh, at the same time, there have been over a dozen dissolutions. Um, most recent, of course, happened in 2021 at the time of the last municipal election. So those are significantly more 
uh, common than the amalgamation processes. There is predictability in what you're doing now. There is less predictability if you choose not to act, but perhaps the outcome remains the same. That there's a recognition that over the long term the village isn't sustainable, and at some point the county's going to get involved in that uh, one way or another. I do recognize that there's political will that's necessary for you to embark on whatever the next step has happened to be. And we also know that not everybody's going to be happy. Uh, in fact, listening to the people say, uh, speak at the engagement and on the surveys, people gave us all caps responses, thou shalt do this and thou shalt not do this. So it tells us that on, you have to make a decision on balance. And sometimes the short term on balance and the long term on balance can be different. And for you as your eyes towards the vision for this community, the vision for this region, you might be looking, you ought to be looking at the long term. So uh, really that's kind of where, where we ended up. In terms of what the next steps might be, and I equivocate here because this is of course is your decision that you have to make. You have an ICC which meets regularly. You could ask them for a recommendation to both of the councils. Something that we have been asked to do is is come up with terms of reference or draft terms of reference for a negotiating committee so that the ICC could kind of get a bit of an idea about what next steps might look like. That would be a draft, of course, just because it's easier for you to edit something than it is for you to, to do it from scratch. So we'll do the from, from the scratch part. At this point then, should you choose to enter negotiations, you and or the village, there's a notification that would go to the minister. There would be the negotiations that have to happen. And then to go with the committee would likely be beneficial to have representatives of council and of senior administration. Those people who are interested in the governance of this entity and those people who know how the service delivery works and the management works because there's a lot of expertise and knowledge in the room too. We do recognize that the final decision rests with councils about yay or nay. However, at that point it goes to cabinet. So the ultimate decision is a provincial government decision too. So you can make a recommendation to cabinet. Though there have, I can't recall any times where, the, where cabinet has gone against a recommendation, whether it's in a dissolution or in an amalgamation in recent years. Somebody had brought up the topic of how do we do in these negotiations. And one of them is the traditional quid pro quo. What do we do to agree on whatever the topic area might be? The other is more around interest-based. In the long-term best interests of this community, what do we have to agree on? And so some of it then becomes back and forth. So both of those are ways that you could choose to go. You could choose to incorporate both of them depending on what the topic is because some are pretty black and white, like money. Some are less black and white, things like economic development or your governance rules. The other final thing on this is about communication. Those topics of transparency and accountability, which have been so important. And if there is a vacuum, that vacuum has been filled by those who have an interest in one way or another. So by putting out information in a regular way, in a factual way that people can check up on, that includes you as individual elected officials, you as a council, you as a county. I think there's a real opportunity here to, to, to get out ahead of whatever, the, whatever any of the topic areas might be. So with that, Reeve, I'm more than happy to, I'm happy to turn it back to you and your colleagues, uh, recognizing, of course, this is coming to you for information today, that there is no decision that is being requested of you. Well, well thank you very much for report, or presenting your report to us today. I think it was very informative, and it kind of recaps the work that's been done. Over the, over the last months, and uh, I appreciate that. Questions from Council? Uh, Deputy Reeve Milhoff. Uh, thank you, Reeve. We had the opportunity when you presented to us a couple of weeks ago, or is it longer than that now? Like, <laughs> days are melding together um, to ask um, many of our questions, um, and I'm just looking forward to us being able to figure out what the next plans are. Um, thank you for the in depth of this um, report and the engagement sessions in general. Um, and I think it also proved how much the community really wants the opportunity to speak with their elected officials. Um, since much of the conversations didn't even fully surround amalgamation, it right. surrounded many other concerns. Um, and uh, I think we need to recognize that as well and perhaps have the opportunity to give them more opportunity to um, converse with us as council as a whole during these um, engagement sessions. So thank sure. you. Thank you. Any additional questions or comments? Uh, Councillor Ratcliffe, please. Thank you, Reeve. Um, I've talked with some other uh, municipalities or councillors from other municipalities who have been through this. 
And one of the options that they mentioned is that sometimes you're better off to subsidize uh, a neighbor rather than have them become part of you. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any comments on that for this situation? Uh, yikes, Reed. Um Certainly, I believe in the 2023 budget, the county has, has budgeted to invest $750,000, give or take, in the village of Caroline. The topics that you have as a council invested in don't deal with the infrastructure deficit. So conceivably, if there was capital dollars to be put into that, you certainly, you could, they could be, if you like, sustainable, but with help from a friend. And yes, there's a lot of instances. In fact, I believe, I believe the county actually provides money to other municipalities already as well, in a recognition that your citizens use other municipal services. And so that's very common. Without doing the financial analysis, which we haven't got into because of negotiation, it's hard to figure out exactly what that cost would be, but I suspect it's going to be very high, if you, should you choose to go down that path. Okay, thank you. Um, additional questions, comments? Uh, Councillor Graham, please. I don't have any questions, but thank you very much for your great work on this presentation. It's lots of valuable information in there. And I would like to make a motion that Council accepts the May 2023 Clearwater County Village of Caroline Amalgamation Study Report as presented by Strategic Steps, Inc. for information as presented. Thank you very much. Uh, discussion relating to that motion. I guess the only comment I would make is that Sitting in this seat, I'm, I'm a, a keen believer in asset management and less so in <laughs> crisis management. So I, I think it's good to continue the discussion of how we can avoid crisis in the in the future. And I think that's part of part of the process here. We've got some good fundamentals uh, behind us now, and I think we continue the discussion uh, to next steps. So, uh, any additional comments, questions? If not, I call that question. All in favor? And that is carried. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing sharing the information. And uh, with that, looking at the clock on the wall, I think maybe it's an appropriate time to take a break. So uh, we will recess until uh, 12.35.
Welcome back to uh, Clearwater County's regular meeting for the 23rd of May. Uh, we move through our agenda of today and we go move down to item 6.2. And that is a notice of motion, uh, item 11.1, .1, third party review of Clearwater County Municipal Planning Commission. Um, Ms. Haggard, am I having you introduce that? Um, and then I will rely heavily on Councillor Northcott since it was his notice of motion as well. So. Well, good afternoon, Go Reeve, and members of council. Thank you very much. Um, this item uh, is before council as per Councillor Northcott's notice of motion at the April 25th, uh, 2023 regular meeting. Um, so this agenda item, I'll turn it back to council for the decision today. And um, if there's any further direction, uh, we can go from there. Okay, thank you for that. And maybe I'll look to um, Councillor Northcott for um, um, his, his input on this um, notice of motion. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's just I've heard uh, comments and uh, concerns from residents. Um, but I do have just a few little notes here uh, that I've had from some residents. So. Um, one of the things that has been stated is the existing development review and approval process has some issues. Uh, there appears to be a strong bias in the concerns brought forward by residents um, that are sometimes dismissed using superficial conditions on approval and that there's a real possibility of past and current MCP members asking themselves how can we approve this as opposed to should this be approved at all? Um, a little bit more to this is um, <clears throat> recommendations that come from the Municipal Planning Commission lack written justification for the recommendations and may lack any justification at all. Um, the current system is weak and is due to reliance on opinion. Um, this resident also would like to, uh, has rejected <clears throat> suggested a set of cold eyes review on the MPC. Um, so for some of the recommendations uh, or the type of review to, to get into a little bit of a detail here would be, um, you know, one would be request that the, uh, if, if a review was to be completed, that it be conducted by a third party who has no previous employment by Clearwater County or uh, working relations with any staff, um, but one. Uh, so the type of review and a specific point to be reviewed would be one has the fragmentation policy and guidelines regarding the top topographical features of the landscape has it been followed as intended or have there been <clears throat> instances of policies and guidelines uh, being relaxed or abused to just simply create additional acreages um, number two um, has there in the past been any instances where an MPC member has been involved with selling real estate? Have they ever voted on approving a fragmentation? And would that be a conflict of interest? And number three, I only have two left, if, if that may, there's two. Uh, Three would be a, uh, <clears throat> I've also heard from some residents that there's a lack of public consultation and public advertising of applications that are submitted to the MPC uh, regarding fragmentation. Um, and just on that one, I think it's really only adjoining landowners that are notified and uh, residents would only have 21 days after the decision date to appeal that. So. That's a very short time frame for anybody to really be aware of it or appeal any of those applications. Number four, and this is last, <clears throat> uh, that I've also heard is that it appeared that uh, public members that were appointed to the MPC at the October 2022 organizational meeting were possibly predetermined prior to the voting process, um, not really giving all the applicants equal opportunity. So, <clears throat> That's really it. I, I, yeah, that, that was the, the uh, type and the scope. I think the time frame, as far as the time frame will go, that would really be up to staff to have a, you know, to, to be able to give some feedback on what would be a practicable 
time frame to maybe be review those items if they were passed by this council. That's all. Okay. Um, thank you. There's quite a number of comments within there and, and assertions. Um, I, I'll, I'll go to Councillor Swanson first. Um, in regards to your question in regards to fragmentation, fragmentation, frag, fragmentation. thank fragmentation. you, all together now. <laughs> must be lunch. Um, in, in those guidelines, um, are you referencing that we should go back to the MDP to that we just passed to reference those guidelines? Because those guidelines are within the MDP and the land. Maybe not. I, mean, I know they are referenced in the MDP, and I think they're more detailed in that. So the, uh, to me, the, the fragmentation guidelines, if it is more uh, detailed in the LUB, we will be reviewing that at some point in time, so we could go over that, but um, just look for clarification maybe uh, with Kim. Ms. Gillum? Um, I might be able to respond a little bit to that. Um, <clears throat> with the new MDP, we essentially removed fragmentations, except for as a first parcel out, and they made um, some clarification where they removed wetlands as a boundary, so, um, and maybe that's where, like, I mean, usually the wet areas, whether, um, like, understanding of what a wetland is, maybe. I, I don't know if that would have been a question, but, I mean, that's been limited through the MDP already. Um, so there's not additional fragmentations other than as, if, as a first parcel out. So that policy is um, less relevant now, I guess. Um, and the second thing I wanted to address was your comment on subdivisions. Um, the referrals are our standard referrals to adjacent landowners as per um, our requirements and also the 20, um, actually adjacent landowners aren't allowed to appeal subdivisions, um, only agencies and the owner themselves. So the 21 days is for agencies or the owner or the person that applied. So they can't appeal subdivisions as per the MGA, just for clarification. Thank you. Um, and I see uh, Councillor Northcott, your light is on, if, if you would. Absolutely. So, yep, yeah, back to your clarification there. So the joining landowners can't appeal, you're correct. But, but what about residents, <clears throat> the rest of the residents from Clearwater County, if they're not adjoining landowners? Would they have the opportunity to appeal? No. Okay. Yeah. Um, somebody could, I suppose, write in a letter, like, as part of the referral process, but we only generally refer to the adjacent landowners per the MGA because they would be more directly affected being an adjacent landowner. Um, but um, I suppose anybody, if they heard about it, could send in a comment per um, the referral process. But yeah, the only people that can appeal is the applicant themselves or um, an agency such as like Rocky Gas Co-op or something like that if they had concerns with the decision that was made, if it affects them. But yeah, uh, no landowner and no other landowner within the county after the decision is made can appeal it. And I'll go to... Uh, uh, Councilor Ratcliffe and I will come back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Could you define adjacent landowners? Is that just land touching on the affected parcel or is it a certain distance? Uh, so adjacent is like land that's touching. Um, so like if it's a quarter section, we usually do all the quarter sections around. So even if it's like just the corners that kind of touch it, it's like that half mile around that quarter section that we would do a, a referral for. So not even someone on the opposite side of the road? Uh, no, they would, because they would be, um, they're still an adjacent landowner, even if there's a road between, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and I'll come, go to Councillor Northcott and then back to the Deputy Reeve. All right. Uh, just for Councillor Swanson's comment. And, uh, in the new MDP, yet those policies have been changed. But in the past, residents do have some concerns that there was maybe uh, land that was fragmented that maybe didn't quite meet the qualifications and maybe it wasn't, uh, they were, there was parcels that have been fragmented with really unreasonable opinions with uh, minuscule reasoning or topographical features that maybe really truly didn't fit, you know, the railways and, and the, uh, that the, the intent of fragmentation so like 
really doesn't actually have anything to do with the current MDP, now the draft, of, like the past one, but the previous one. Were there previous fragmentated parcels that were, that were fragmented but maybe weren't, uh, didn't follow the guidelines and the policies in regards to fragmentation? That's where I was going with that one. Uh, um, yeah, so I think I answered it. Her. Okay, and Deputy Reeve Melhoff. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, if there was a concern with uh, public consultation, um, it's my understanding we do the adjacent landowners, um, and it's advertised on the website and in um, paper publications as well. Um, just wanting to confirm, wanting to confirm that. Um, like we. Mountaineer. Yeah, so. like, and that's afterwards. So again, people can't appeal, but they're aware that the subdivision was approved. Um, I know, like, we have development referrals that we put on the website. I'm not sure if we do the subdivisions or not. To be honest, I can look that. Okay, it's Thank been you. a while. <laughs> I don't. I don't do that part. <laughs> Thank you. That's Bobby Sue's job. <laughs> and I will go to Councillor Radcliffe. Um, after we uh, allow Ms. Gillum to seek the information she seeks. <laughs> Perhaps maybe, uh, Councillor Ratcliffe, there's a question you could uh, use in the interim. Um, that would be yes. great. I'd like to ask Councillor Northcott what outcomes he would see from this review. Councillor Northcott? So. <clears throat> the intent isn't really to be extremely severe or anything. Really what this, what, what I brought this forward was to really, um, if there has been instances where, you know, these policies or guidelines for fragmentation have been uh, maybe relaxed or uh, abused and maybe not used as intended, it's just to, yep, to, to bring to light that yes, there either there was or there wasn't, uh, just to, to bring some, uh, If everything's good, then hey, everything's good. And if not, well, <clears throat> then there needs to be, you know, then at, at least it was identified that, and then there could be corrections made to the policies and stuff so that that doesn't happen into the future. Um, if that, do, do, that you, do you have a, a list or an idea of what those adjustments would be in the policy? And that's where it would be nice to know if there was instances or cases in the past where Yep, they you know the, they weren't these policies weren't used as as, as intended. And they were just simply used from personal opinion to create additional acreages. So, if there is none, then I guess there's really no changes that would be required. But if there is, well, then you could look at that at that time. If that makes any sense. Or... Yeah, I'm not okay. sure if there's a follow up question uh, yeah. or an answer. I'm I'm. Uh... I, but I will go to uh, Deputy Reeve Mailhoff for her uh, feedback. And, uh, uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, I agree. Fragmentation is all like previous. Um, the previous MDP was super subjective in uh, many of its uh, fragmentation uh, policies in the way that it was written, which is why I believe this council has tightened up on that subjectivity um, and has made it so that the the 2023 is not as subjective, um, eliminating some of those concerns. Any additional thoughts, comments? Um, oh, Councillor Ratcliffe, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I just have another, <clears throat> pardon me, I just have another thought, and it, this doesn't seem that significant, and I wonder if, if there is another way to achieve what do you feel um, needs to be reviewed or changed? Uh, Councillor Northcott, if you would. So, yeah, just <clears throat> maybe go over this here, just, uh, just this comment here, piece from a resident that had written this. Um, it, it would be nice to have clarity that there really is biased or not, but there, this is from the resident. Um, there appears to be a strong bias in the concerns brought forward by residents. 
are sometimes dismissed using superficial conditions on approval. There's a real possibility of past and current MPC members asking themselves, how can we approve this? As opposed to, should this be approved at all? Um, so, if we get, if there's an opportunity to be able to get clarity like on, on that <clears throat> through a review. And um, that sometimes the recommendations that come from the Municipal Planning Commission they lack written justification for the recommendations and may lack any justification at all. So again, if that could be clarified through a review, that would be. Were, were any specific examples mentioned? Um, actually, I guess this morning there was a recommendation from MPC, but it had very little or almost no information, but it was recommended from MPC. But there, was, there really wasn't anything there recommendations, it was very minuscule, and it did lack written justification. Anyways, I just want to thank everybody really for taking the time to even to consider sure, this. Or, and I yep. appreciate you bringing, bringing this letter, letter forward. There's obviously a number of concerns that have been brought forward. Looking back through my records, I know that the, um, the bylaw that establishes our development authority um, has been reviewed from time to time. I think it was reviewed in 1996 or 1998, and then again in um, 2014. Perhaps we're due for a review of that uh, defining bylaw that that really creates creates the development authority, which is our municipal uh, planning commission. That might be a good start. Um, I'm just um, thinking of a process forward. I, I, I'm not exactly understanding the, is the intent here to overturn decisions that have been previously made because that has a, that does have, there is an appeal process all the way up to the Court of Queen's bench for, for such things and uh, I think those, those options and things remain there if there was some specific um, concern or challenge to any of those decisions in the past and maybe you have some knowledge of that okay so <clears throat> that, no the intent is not to go back and, and overturn decisions and stuff like that but to actually just see if if the decisions that were uh, you know, made in the past if they were legitimate or maybe not but I am not a professional municipal reviewer person but there, I'm sure that there are organizations and parties out there that do do this. Um, so as an option, maybe they could, um, you know, administration may be able to inquire to a, you know, with, with, a, with a party that does these kind of reviews and then bring that information back to council and see what it would cost. Because now that I've sort of identified a few of the things that I've heard from residents and stuff, you know, it would be much easier for a reviewer or a third party that does this for their specialty. Um, they could bring a budget, they could bring a time frame, and, uh, you know, absolutely a practicable time frame for staff. So, maybe it's an option. Okay. Thank you. And I'll go to Councillor Graham, because I haven't heard from her yet, and then I will come back to Councillor Ratcliffe. Yes, or is that I a go, Steve? <laughs> I, I'm very torn on this one, because I believe it's really important to make sure people are doing a good job and that things are being done properly. But I also personally think that our MPC is doing a wonderful job and they are following the bylaws and everything that we have for them to follow. Um, one thing that I wanted to comment on because no one's really mentioned anything about it was the predetermined applicants for MPC. We tried, we all know that we tried something new this year and talked about those applicants in closed session for the privacy of those members at large, which I thought was a great way of doing things. And we did have some great applicants. I think we chose two wonderful applicants and I've heard nothing but positive reviews from them and the work that they've done. So I just kind of wanted to stick up for our, our two residents that, do we have two or three? Two. Just two, okay. <laughs> Wasn't sure, but we had two this year that, that were chosen. So I just wanted to kind of stick up for our two members at large because I've heard very positive things about them and they were not predetermined. We all had a discussion, we were all there and we know that that, that discussion happened. So it was in it was in closed session, but I just wanted to to mention that. And I think part of, if I recall, part of the idea there is that we we get a a, a number of applications in to fill these community um, 
service positions, such as the Municipal Planning Commission, and I think they are worth the due diligence of, of reviewing their applications in a more um, FOIP-related way, that they're, they're not sharing a lot of their personal information there, and then allow the appointing uh, committee, which is the committee of the whole of council, to, to do that. That has served us well in the past, but I guess that's something we can always look at changing or altering or something. Ultimately, we want to do this in as transparent a method as possible, yet still, um, you know, build the pool of people that are willing to put themselves out there and fill these roles within our communities. Um, Councillor Ratcliffe. Thank you, Reeve. Uh, I, I did have some concerns in the selection process. I, I think next time we should have a secret ballot um, for the members. But uh, listening to the conversation, uh, I'm sort of filtering out that the major issue is bias. And that comes down to subjectivity. I, I don't know how we could uh, adjust that in any manner. Because it, it's the subjectivity of the, the people looking at the information and um, I guess needs of the community to make those decisions. And Councillor Graham again. I just wanted to address Councillor Radcliffe's comment. We could have had a secret ballot. We did it with other categories where people wanted to vote for different people, so it was an option that we weren't not allowed to have a secret ballot for that top for that category. Additional comments, uh, Councillor Swanson, please. In looking at our bylaw, um, it's yes, it was uh, last updated in two thousand and fourteen. Um, has there been any legislative um, updates in that, that have been from the Alberta government that we should be looking at updating our own bylaw in that, that capacity? Because if we're going to open it up, I'd just sooner open it up and, and uh, get it all done at once versus just a select topic. So, I don't know. Ms. Oh. Ms. Haggard, I believe, is. Uh, yep. I didn't even press it, but I, I will definitely take that question, Reese. <laughs> Or not. <laughs> Thanks, Tracy. Um, certainly the MGA has been updated since the, the bylaw. I don't know that the clauses within it um, require any amendments, but certainly something uh, we could get legal review on should council so direct. Yeah. Additional thoughts, questions, comments? Um, I will just, you know, I've definitely heard the conversation around the table. I think the, the, the concerns brought forward are serious. I, I think I've heard that the system by some are viewed to be flawed. We want to do, I think we should do a review in a transparent way uh, that somehow brings some focus to that. Um, I, I guess I'd look to counsel to the depth of that review and how much we, there will be a there will be a price tag of both time and money to do that, um, and does that put does that put our development authority on pause while we're de dealing with concerns of relating to what has been presented here today, uh, Ms. Haggard? I, I know yours, a nod there or a, or a shake of the head. I can't. I didn't notice which one. Thank you, Reeve. Uh, unfortunately, no, it wouldn't because we do have existing bylaws and Municipal Government Act that uh, we have timelines that we have to abide by um, and the duty to applicants when they come forward with an application uh, to follow our, our legislated procedures. Um, so I would say no. Um, the other thing I could put before Council as consideration is that um, the legal uh, review of the bylaw would be a, a recommendation as a starting point. Um, if they so chose to do um, a further review, that, that's fair as well. But in that legal review, we could ask them what is allowable in terms of, of review pro uh, process um, and whether that would be procedural or uh, would, would certainly not be to uh, go back in decision making uh, of the past, but a, a review of the actual decisions made or the numbers of decisions made on a type of parcel could be something that would be included. Thank you. 
Um, I see Councillor Swanson's lights first, and then I'll go to Councillor Northcott, please. Um, I appreciate that that comment, and I was just thinking that might be the the quickest way to start this is to go through a legal legal review first, and then decide whether this needs to be going in depth even more so. Um, at, at that point in time, as far as having a third party independent of any municipality, um, I don't know if there's a consultant out there that doesn't deal with a municipality, so um, there'd be bias there anyways from that regard, so um, I, I would be in favor of a third party, or sorry, a legal review first to start with the bylaw and then go, for, and go from there. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Northcott. Um, just one more little, <clears throat> just a little bit of a comment on the, the actual fragmentation of parcels. Like a lot of times the uh, <clears throat> properties that were applied or where the applicant had applied to have the property fragmented uh, were often um, visited during winter months when the landscape is blanketed in snow and unable to really see the topographical features. And I don't know if that's appropriate. <coughs> Um, Councillor Graham? I just wanted to ask Councillor Northcott if you're the one hearing from these people, so do you think that a legal review is okay, is a good way to start, or what are your thoughts on that? Well, it, 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 it's definitely a good start, but I don't know if that really captures the intent of kind of what I was, you know, what I had put forward in that notice of motion. Um, the bylaw, you know, if it hasn't been reviewed since 2014, so probably, you know, getting up there in a few years here now so that probably is a you know, an additional good measure um, but I don't think it really captures what the intent of my notice of motion was and I know we're we're, we're continuously in the process of reviewing our bylaws and updating them I've never run into any trouble with reviewing and updating updating a bylaw I can't imagine anything bad but uh, ultimately I think it's um, it's worthwhile to have a process where we do review those bylaws and see if you know they're, you know um, that they are meeting the current needs, um, and that we. I think quite often the decision making process has to has to do a judgment call. It's not just black and white. There is sometimes little shades of gray, and that's where I think where I'm hearing some of the difficulties come in when people were. Um, having to be posed to those questions that weren't just self-serve, that you had to have a, a, group of, a group of minds and data before them in order to come up with the best possible decision relating to um, uh, an application before, before that development authority. So um, I, I would certainly welcome a, a review of that bylaw as a first step in that. And then we can maybe get an understanding of, you know, where we're at in comparison with other municipalities. Have we missed something in the past that we need to adjust to now? I can see the benefit for that. I don't necessarily see the benefit right now from a full-on review of every decision made by the MDP <coughs> and the appointments to that committee over the last number of years. Uh, uh, but, I mean, I'm still willing to be convinced that that would be a positive positive thing. Uh, Councillor Northcott and then I'll go to Councillor Swanson. Thank you very much. <clears throat> yeah, just a, I know if it would be an opportunity to have a, you know, to, to be able to contact or reach out to a third party reviewer and see what the cost was because, you know, um, a simple review, something that's feasible, not, uh, again, with practical cost. It's uh, in a simple time frame, but to look back, <clears throat> you know, and then have that discussion with the third party reviewer uh, into the future to see how, you know, they could give us a budget, they could give us a time frame, and we could sort of, um, you know, if it was maybe only three or four years that we look back on, because they know, you know, there's the number of cases you, I wouldn't want the intent to have a five year review and endless numbers of dollars spent on that. That's not the intent. It was just a, simple review to really just, um, you know, uh, you know, give, give the residents that do have concerns that either, you know, yeah, there was maybe some stuff in the past that shouldn't have been passed and 
we can change it and correct things to go into the future. And, and I know that the MTP is now different, but um, or maybe there was everything was you know uh, appropriately the, uh, the decisions were appropriate and there was no flaws. Everything is is completely fine. So just to, the intent was for a simple review that that doesn't have a, an exacerbated cost or anything to it. But I think if we could have a reviewer come or something like that contact it, and then they could give us a price time frame and a little additional information. Thank you. And I'll go to Councillor Swanson, please. Thank you for that, Councillor Northcott. Uh, and just, I'm going to kind of re reiterate what I just heard from you, and that is you want a specific specific point in time. So when you're saying three years, I, in my mind, are going, okay, since the draft of this MDP started three years ago, you may more inquire about specifically about fragmentation of perm uh, a subdivision that's that's where your concern is settling at is that fragmentation uh, subdivisions that have happened in the last three years is that with with is that the scope of what you're asking as far as what the decisions in the past because I guess for me my cautionary is then we've had the, of those that were approved um, you know they've those residents have gone on with their lives and everything else and I'm not interested in, we can't reverse what, what has already been approved, but are we opening up Pandora's box by allowing those that were not, not approved right. coming to the table and saying, okay, I want my fractionation approved now because you've opened this box of, of this review. So I'm kind of wondering, I, I, this is what I hear, it's three years, it's specifically about the fractionation per, uh, developments and in regards to the, the people that were sitting around the table making the decision. Those are the three things that I heard from you. And so uh, that, that's what you'd like to be reviewed. I think, yeah, three or four years, something like that would offer, <clears throat> uh, would, would appease the concerns. But um, I absolutely, the, with, the, with the applicants that were applications have maybe been declined or approved, but I would say the large majority in the past from what I've seen have mostly been approved, but so I don't, I. And maybe just for clarification for me as well, and I agree with what you're saying, but opening up a whole series of challenges because many ones, as you say, were approved, but they were approved with conditions and sometimes many conditions, and those are difficult for people to achieve um, and some probably didn't follow through with with their proposal or their or their project based on those um, conditions that were placed on there so are we opening up all the conditions that have been set on by the development authority as well and, and I mean I, I just want to be cautious that we, we we go down a road that we know that we're committed to going down um, because it it will open up I believe it will open up all the decisions of our development authority um, as we move backwards. If that's that's if that's the if that's the desire or that's what the um, expectation is. So, so uh, Councillor Ratcliffe, thank you. Um, I, I do share your concerns about uh, fragmentation maybe being overused but we have fixed that with this MDP with the new MDP so I, I think that's really no longer an issue from what I understand of your comments I, I do support the idea of bringing the uh, MPC bylaw up to date or bringing it into alignment with the MGA if that requires any work um, I think we can really only look at issues going forward because, you know, trying to reopen and undo anything from the past, uh, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm gathering one of your major concerns that, that hasn't been dealt with already in the change to the MGA is that approvals may have been too liberal for the applications we've received. I 
also recognize that a fellow counselor has concerns about what's happening, and I do take that seriously. Maybe uh, for my comfort level, um, certain, certain aspects of decisions of the MPC uh, have a certain time frame where they can be appealed. If it's procedural related, is like if it's going to the Court of Queens for, or Court of Kings, sorry, um, is there a time frame on those kinds of things as well? Ms. Haggard? Absolutely, there are um, prescribed time frames um, in terms of what is appealable and then uh, courts will look at whether the, the body that hears the appeal had jurisdiction um, and whether the proper process was followed. So um, that would be a court-related process when there is an appeal. Um, might be different with a subdivision. Um, but in terms of if council was to approve the notice of motion, uh, which was that a third party review or examination of Clarota County's Municipal Planning Commission uh, be done, uh, administration would come back with all the information um, for council on what that could look like. So this is kind of that beginning phase um, with the notice of motion and then we would be able to come back with more information for, for council based on whatever that notice of motion reads. So that would include costing related to the different varying degrees and depth and scope of this review, as well as timelines, depending on how deep and far back we want to navel gaze. Um, that those kinds of issues and the availability of some firm to do this kind of work too. I'm not sure if that's um, the kinds of things you'd be able to enlighten us on at a later later date if we chose to um, continue down next steps thanks Tracy uh, thank you Reeve Lougheed so yes additional detail if council were to um, carry the motion um, there would be a third party review um, and that's that's what would direct administration to proceed uh, certainly the scope uh, time frame would be dependent um, on what council wishes as well um, to, to provide clarity for um, that third party review if it was to be approved. And um, again, going back over the years and, and types of parcels, uh, it, it may or may not be as simple as it sounds. So it'll just depend on that um, initial uh, notice of motion and whether that third party review is uh, proceeding and then what that scope would look like. So if you're saying three or four years, only fragmentation, um, although that seems like it would be a limited number over three or four years, it could be 20 or 30 applications to review. So I, I'll leave it at that and, and turn it back for council. Uh, but I would, I would say that that first motion um, was the one that we need to deal with first and then we can certainly provide um, recommendations uh, at a future meeting in terms of what that uh, scope would look like um, in terms of cost and consultants availability and budget adjustment if needed. Sure, thank you very, Sorry, very much. So I, I would hold, open the floor again to comments or motion relating to any of the three recommendations that staff have, I think there was three, <laughs> sorry, yes, three. Uh, any of those that we can, um, bring a motion forward on. Uh, Deputy Reeve Melhoff. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, I feel that doing this singles out our Municipal Planning Commission. Uh, we have dedicated community members that sit on that, um, and I want to continue ensuring that we have dedicated community members that want to sit on that committee, and all of our committees for that matter. Um, however, I understand if there's people that have, a, if there's community members that have a concern regarding our, um, one of our committees, that, that is valid and needs to be looked at. But I would be more in favor of doing an, an entire 360 review of all of our committees and all of our um, governance legislation rather than just one. It feels really unfair to single out one committee. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Northcott? I was just thinking. <clears throat> um, Yeah, there are many, many residents, and there was many applicants that applied to, to apply that, that that wanted to sit on the municipal planning commission. There was yeah, it was a great turnout. I think there was uh, pushing up close towards twenty or in the mid teens of 
applicants and residents that did apply. So I think <clears throat> there's interest for residents that want to sit on the Municipal Planning Commission. Um, but I was just thinking for a, if there was to be a recommendation here for motion that the re, that a review of the Clearwater County's Municipal Planning Commission um, yeah, to, to move forward. So I'm just trying to work on the reading here. I'm still a year and a half into this. And I'm not a professional at this by any means, but we'll try. So that council uh, authorizes a review of the Clearwater County's Municipal Planning Commission and in the future with a third party agency you know, list the type, scope, and time frame and cost, maybe at that time. That way, the administration might have the opportunity to bring some additional information back to us. Okay. Were you able to capture that, Tracy Lynn? And, and uh, Councilor Northout, don't put yourself down. You're one of the seven councillors in this county that do this on a regular basis of making motions. So you, uh, you are one of the experts in Clearwater County for yeah. sure. So. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. A uh, year and a half into it still feels brand new. So it really does. So were you able to capture capture that at some level? Um, uh, not quite, not yet. Okay. Um, but just a, a, a couple of items regarding process. So there was a notice of motion made, and that notice of motion uh, comes as it stands. However, okay. if... Councillor Northcott would like to amend his notice of motion um, to what he would like to change it to. That that would have to come first. Okay, okay. Did did that? Oh, absolutely. So I could. Yeah, it is. Allow for an amendment to that notice of motion to. Um, so where were we at? So your original motion was that there be a third party review or examination of the Municipal Planning Commission. Is and, that correct? Uh, yes, but if Councillor Northcott wishes to make an amendment, there would be a motion to amend the motion, okay. and then um, the amendment or the amending motion could be made. Okay. So okay. That, does that? Absolutely. Okay, so, so you would make a motion then to amend your original motion? Yes. Okay, so I'll make a motion to amend my original motion. So there is a, a motion before us then. Uh, any further discussion for clarity on what we're voting on? So it's a vote or a motion to amend the original motion presented by Councillor Northcott. Okay, all in favor? He hasn't, we, we just have a motion to amend and then he will make a motion to amend that, since there is already a motion. For a motion for the amendment. Oh, yeah. okay. The, yeah, the original, the, my original motion might be just a little bit too broad. Like it, 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 it might be unattainable to achieve that task. And that's not what, you know, as you start to learn about this, it, that might be too big of a broad. So I'm just making the motion to amend it so that we can just uh, make the workload a little bit smaller, but sort of pinpoint a few of the concerns that residents have. So I'd like to make the motion to or repeat the motion, I suppose, to amend my motion, or the notice of motion. Okay. Okay. Clarity on that? All those in favor? And that is carried. So again, I will go to uh, Councillor Northcott for his amendments. Okay. Now we'll have to work through this together, hopefully. <clears throat> that we make a, that council. Um, proceeds with a review of the Clearwater County's Municipal Planning Commission and that administration provide council with a third party um, organization to provide a scope, time frame, and cost associated with So I'll give Tracy Lynn a few seconds to capture, capture that and see if there's any clarification needed. Uh, Deputy Reeve Northcott, or sorry, <laughs> Deputy Reeve Melhoff. Sorry, my brain, uh, yeah, uh, I'm thank you, squeezing Reeve. my brain um, today, that's the problem. 
Sorry, I'm just wanting some clarification on your amendments. Um, the beginning you said proceed with a review, um, but yet after that you said have administration provide counsel with a third party um, scope, timeline, and cost. Why would we need that if we're proceeding with the review regardless? Did you want to be able to determine whether we proceed with the review once we learn scope, par third party person, and cost? Because that those are contradictory statements within your amendments. Councilor Northcott. Excellent. No, thank you very much. That was just a verbal. I don't know if Tracy, are you able to or to just type it out so that we could actually see it and then if we can all work on this together, but you're absolutely right. If we can get this turned out where it's a it's a nice neat clean notice motion that simply a, you know will provide for a third party to supply us with the cost, a time frame, and, and really be able to uh, to accommodate the concerns that these that, that residents do have. To the, to the to the questions and things that I've raised here on those these points um, so yeah that that amendment was just a verbal I didn't have it written down um, so if I didn't have it properly where did that mean we'll I'll work on this together until we think it's okay and then either approve it or defeat it Um, Deputy Reeve Melhoff. Uh, thank you, Reeve. So my my suggestion from what I'm hearing then is that you would like to direct administration to bring back information on cost scope and the, th the third party companies that could provide this information for council's review. That be Rather than proceed with review, it's that they would be bringing back so technically just, that would be a friendly amendment to the amendment i'm just reiterating what i'm hearing i'm, I'm getting all these i'm getting all these once in a while's that happen in in procedure <laughs> uh, so Um, Councillor Ratcliffe. Thank you, Reeve. For myself, I would like to see uh, first, as first step, a review that the bylaw is in alignment with the current MGA and costs uh, to proceed with a, a third party review, but the decision to proceed with a third party review be made after we are confirmed that we're in alignment with the current MGA. But in addition, I, I really like the suggestion by the Deputy Reeve, every time the province does a municipal inspection and it hits the news, I get emails from people saying, when can we have one? And that in the interest of transparency, maybe accountability, that would be a better way to go. Well, a lot of water has passed under the bridge already. Um, so we do have a motion before us. There would be the opportunity to amend this as well uh, to meet part of the discussion that has occurred around it. Um, I guess we'd always be willing to look at that. Uh, Councillor Northcott, please. Okay. It's, it's always nice when you can actually see the <clears throat> seat on the screen. So maybe just to, to amend that just a little bit, but to direct it, you know, the council directs administration to provide council with information regarding the third party agency, scope, time frame, and cost of review. So actually we could just delete. How does that sit with you? Would you uh, agree with that capturing your, your motion or your amendments? Yeah, the council <clears throat> directs administration.
So, Councillor Northcott, does that uh, does that capture your capture your thoughts uh, or you know your motion or your amendment to your motion? Just letting Tracy. She's doing a wonderful job there. Okay, so the council directs the administration to provide council with information regarding a review of Clearwater County's Municipal Planning Commission, including third-party agency availability, a review scope, time frame, and costs. I think so, yeah. Very well done, Tracy. Thank you very much. <clears throat> That's Thank you. And thank you to the council for that as well. So I, yep. I, I get the concept that that is what you would like to put forward as your amendments. Yes. And further discussion on what's before us on the screen. Seeing none, I would call that question then. All those in favor? And, uh, well, I don't have to ask for opposed. All, uh, all in favor, that's carried. All right, that takes us down to uh, 6.3. I'll just say I've allowed three hours for this. So. Oh, oh so 8.1? Oh, I'm so sorry, yes. Um, let's, let's move ahead, please, in our... Um, in our uh, uh, agenda today, and we will invite uh, a presentation from uh, Paramount Resources. Uh, well, let's take a five minute uh, break here in order to set up for that um, presentation, and uh, we'll see you in five.
Welcome back everyone after a short recess. Uh, we move on to item 8.1 and that is a delegation from Paramount Resources Limited and it's relating to a proposed suite natural gas and liquids processing facility. So maybe before we get started we'll just do a quick round of, of introductions and I'll start with Councillor Graham and we'll work our way around the circle. Good afternoon I'm Sydney Graham, Councillor for Division 2. Good afternoon, Jordan Northcott, Division 4 Counselor. Uh, welcome, Jenny Melhoff, Division 1 and Deputy Reeve. Welcome and thank you for your patience today uh, as we work through a busy agenda. Uh, Daryl Lougheed, uh, uh, Division 3 Counselor and Reeve. Good afternoon, Neil Ratcliffe, Counselor for Division 5. Greetings, Brian Cermak, uh, Counselor for Division 6. Hello, Michelle Swanson, Division 7, the presentation I've been looking forward to all day. Good afternoon. Murray Hagen, Director of Corporate Services. Ooh. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Christine Haggard. I'm the Director of Emergency Services and the Acting CAO. Good afternoon. Dwayne Stauffer. I'm the Land Rep for Paramount Resources for the area. Hello, uh, Robin Powell. I am the Asset Director um, for this area, the Central Area, and at Paramount Resources. Uh, good afternoon and thank you. I'm Spencer Sinclair and I'm the Vice President of Land Department at Paramount. Hi, I'm Eric Norgard. I'm the Project Manager for the proposed project you'll be hearing about here today. Yeah, Blake Reed. I'm the Executive Vice President of Operations with Paramount Resources. light myself up again. Um, ultimately, thank you so much for being here today and I'll turn the floor across for you to uh, present uh, what you have to, to show us today. Well, super. Well, you know what? Thank you guys very much for the opportunity to do this. We appreciate it. Um, am I doing this correctly? Uh, was Power on, that, uh, that will help. So we thought we'd just um, uh, give you guys an appreciable understanding of what we are proposing to do uh, in this area. Um, we thought we'd, we'd start with just a quick summary of who Paramount is uh, and what we are about and how long we've been operating in, uh, in the municipality. And we'll go through the, the development plan for, for the proposed <coughs> facility and uh, why we why we need it, why we've picked the location, and then give you guys just a, a brief summary of, um, of Paramount in the community. Uh, we do have some uh, 3D uh, renderings of what uh, the proposal will look like. So just uh, real briefly, um, Paramount Resources has been operating in Alberta for about 45 years, um, and we, we operate in conventional um, oil and gas, uh, natural gas, production, um, transportation, and marketing of, of the products that we produce. Uh, Paramount's a family company. It was, it was founded in 1978 by uh, a gentleman of the name of Clay Riddell. And um, after more than 45 years, the, the company is still the same company that was started. Um, Clay's son, Jim Riddell, um, is the president uh, of the company now. And Clay's grandson, Tyson Riddell, is also... Uh, um, a member of the company as well now. So um, it, it was founded on family values and still very much so operates uh, on those same values. Um, it's grown significantly though. We're just under 100,000 barrels of oil equivalent a day that we produce. And there's roughly 550 people that uh, Paramount employs throughout the province. Um, a little bit more. Uh, so Paramount entered the um, Duvernay uh, play in Clearwater County. It was where we bought our first uh, Duvernay rights. We had other, other mineral um, ownership in the area, but uh, um, the Duvernay, uh, we started off about 10 years ago and we drilled our first well um, just outside of the town of Condor. Um, we have grown significantly over the over those last ten years. Uh, we've we've bought um, multiple different companies: uh, Black Swan, Crescent Point, uh, Repsol, and Apache Canada. And through all those acquisitions, we've grown this very very small, um, um, very 
uh, focused land base into roughly 240,000 net acres of land. Uh, so about 375 sections of, uh, of Duvernay rights that we, that we have, and which is the reason why we want to make this presentation and the reason why we want to increase the, the, our facility, our capacity in the area, is um, our president really, really likes the area and he likes the, the, the resource and it's, it's an economic play. And so we're going to invest significantly in the area over the next uh, multiple decades uh, with uh, the construction of this facility and the drilling of um, hundreds of wells in the area. Thanks, Spencer. So I'm going to um, dive into a little bit more about the project itself. Um, I thought I might just, if you don't mind, uh, bear with me. I'll give you a little intro um, because I'm very excited to be talking about this. Um, I've been with Paramount now going on six years and and so this development uh, concept's been around for that whole time. Although it's grown in size and scope since we have acquired additional land over the last number of years. But I'm also excited because um, I used to live in Rocky, spent five years out here um, and things were, um, when I was out here, uh, fairly busy. There's lots of activity going and um, I think it's uh, it's exciting to be part of a big project that's going to bring a lot of activity and uh, work uh, to the area. So um, with this project basically we're going to develop um, what's called the Duvernay. It's a, uh, it's, it's, um, a lot of oil and gas that sits under the ground um, a couple of kilometers down. It actually covers quite a large area and uh, as you can see on the map you know, we go from a couple of townships um, east of Rocky and, uh, and then on the other side of the river um, west of Rocky as well. But what we're focused on developing is, uh, is the portion that's west of town. And in specifically early days, we'd be looking at developing this um, portion that's southwest, um, south, and, uh, south of Highway 11. And that's uh, my, one of the reasons why we're looking to put the facility there so that we can have the facility close to where we'll be drilling the wells. It'll um, obviously reduce the amount of piping that we need to put in the ground early days. And um, if you're not familiar with this type of development, basically uh, we're, we're going to be drilling a number of horizontal wells. The technology in the last even the last five, six years has advanced quite a bit. So we can drill further out with these horizontal wells. We can reach three plus kilometers, uh, four kilometers um, from one surface location in numerous directions. And so that minimizes the, uh, the amount of land disturbance on surface because you're, unlike the conventional way of drilling where you had to drill a whole bunch of vertical wells straight down and you're only accessing the reserves that are literally just straight down. Now we're accessing a lot of the oil and gas that's numerous kilometers away from the actual surface location. Um, we're looking at uh, a play that's going to have a lot of natural gas and a lot of condensate. And uh, if you're not familiar with condensate, it's basically a very light oil. Um, uh, it's, it's nothing uh, you wouldn't be familiar with. It's basically product that would go into gasoline or um, uh, lighter uh, blending. So in other words, uh, it gets, gets shipped to heavier oil locations like in Fort McMurray, it would get shipped there and used to blend in with the heavier oil that's coming out of that area to lighten it up. And it will also produce uh, sweet gas. So that's a big point too. So there's no H2S or hydrogen sulfide in this gas. Um, and as I'm sure you know, the hydrogen sulfide can add a whole bunch of complexity because it's quite dangerous. So um, thankfully we don't have to deal with that. We don't have the sulfur SO2, sulfur dioxide emissions associated with um, having H2S. And in terms of this development plan, we're going to be, um, the plan is to, to build the facility, the main facility in stages and um, eventually get up to 150 million a day of capacity. 
we're looking at building in three trains. So train one would be 50 million a day capacity and then two more trains beyond that, each 50 million a day. And that's partly to um, just manage our budget because as you can imagine, building a you know the full plant all in one go, it's, it's a lot of dollars. And so we're trying to uh, spread that spend out over numerous years. We're looking at um, building that over the course of about seven years um, with the first train uh, being planned to come on in 2025, assuming we get all everything lined up and get all the permits and everything approved, that would be the timeline we're, we're shooting for. And, um, and as you can see in the slide, we're, we're looking at spending uh, north of $100 million um, in the next couple of years. Actually, that didn't, didn't pass our QA, QC, but that should be 24, 25, I think. Great. Budgeting 125 million next year and 210 the year after. Um, but yeah, that's the level of spend we'll be looking at spending the next couple of years. And that, that essentially gets us uh, with the first phase of the plant built with um, initial drilling to, to start to fill up the facility. And then we're looking at spending um, you know, rough numbers, a couple hundred million a year um, for the next Kind of 20 years so the so essentially what we're looking at doing is filling up the plant so getting up to that 150 million a day of of, uh, of production and then with our land base as we drill all that up we can sustain that production for uh, about 20 years so we'll be dr we'll need to drill wells each year every year for those these years to keep that uh, facility full and um, and then you can see the numbers are quite large right we have 700 locations um, and we'll be drilling kind of a dozen or, or so locations a year. Um, once we get to plateau, we'll need to drill more wells early on just to, to bring the production level up. And then once we get to that plateau level, 150 million a day, the, uh, the number of wells per year will, will drop a little bit, but we'll have to keep drilling every year just to sustain that production. Okay. So as I mentioned, we're looking to building a plant in three phases, 50 million a day of gas capacity for each phase and 10,000 barrels a day of condensate capacity. So um, these are considered fairly liquids rich uh, wells. In other words, a lot of, a lot of condensate or liquids that come out with, uh, with the gas production. I mentioned that they're sweet, uh, it's sweet production. So we're not having to deal with the H2S thankfully. Um, which also makes the um, treatment a little more simple from a process point of view. And then, as I mentioned, we're, bringing the f we're planning to bring the first phase on in 2025 and then subsequent phases a couple of years after that and a couple of years after that. Um, we've already been speaking with uh, TransCanada, or to, well, formerly TransCanada TC Energy, about tying in. And uh, their system is actually quite close to the proposed plant location, which is again convenient because it uh, makes the pipeline distance uh, that much shorter. Uh, planes, uh, however, is a bit of a longer tie-in. Uh, the planes connection is just south of town here. We need to build a line up to their uh, to their um, uh, facility to tie in. So that would be for the condensate and actually for the natural gas liquids that'll come out of the plant. Um, we would. Uh, follow an existing right away for most of that. So there is an existing plains line that comes from the south and ends up going um, past, past the town and then and heads north, uh, north by northeast from here. So we would follow that, uh, that pipeline for a lot of that, uh, for that new connection. As I mentioned, we can drill these wells um, horizontally from a common pad. So typically we'll be looking at 10 wells um, potentially more per, per drill site or per pad. And um, like I said earlier, uh, it's different from conventional oil and gas if you went back a decade or two where you drill a whole bunch of wells um, to, to drain out a certain area. We tend to now be able to, it's a lot, a lot more cost effective to drill a bunch of wells from one location and, um, and then drill long, long horizontals to, to drain the, the reserves. Um, yeah, and you can see we're looking at uh, 80 acres for, for a typical site. Um, 
sorry, that's for the, the plant site, not a typical pad site. That's for the plant site, 80 acres, and that would be for all three phases. Um, and we're debating whether we clear, we would create the uh, the site for, for all three phases uh, right away or do most of it in phase one and then extend it phase two. But at any rate, we'd be looking at uh, needing up to needing up to 80 acres for the entire plant build. Um, yeah, and if you're, if you like process, uh, we've got some of the highlights on what the process looks like. But condensate stabilization basically means when we when we ship the the condensate, the liquid, it has to be stable, which means it can't have a bunch of gas coming out of it. Um, that's partly uh, so that if you're putting it in a truck, you're not having any vapors uh, escaping while the truck's going down the road. In this case, we're not planning on trucking. We'll be we'll be pipeline connected, but you still have to meet. Uh, the pipeline spec, which requires stable condensate. Um, and also, so, so when it goes into tanks, it's not emitting a bunch of gas coming out of tanks. We'll have natural gas liquids recovery using refrigeration. Um, we're looking at putting in on-site power generation. And uh, we've contacted Fortis to determine what would be required to do that, to be able to connect in and, uh, and also um, potentially sell excess power, um, but we will primarily want to be able to generate our own power rather than draw off the grid. Uh, we're looking at having water disposal, so as pretty much all oil and gas development, there'll be produced water, which will be high salinity water. It's not, not useful for much of anything, so we'll be just disposing that and injecting it back down into the ground in a disposal well. And then of course we'll need a control room, warehouse, and that sort of thing. Um, to uh, to su support the plant operations. Okay, so then we had a few um, uh, graphics basically from our 3D modeling to give you an idea of what this plant or this facility would look like. Thought it might be helpful. It's hard to visualize when you say 150 million a day facility and what what is that? Um, so uh, this is a picture looking southeast and. You can see there's a little teardrop just um, just above the north side. So there's actually a well site, an uh, existing well site there. That's that little teardrop. <coughs> and then what you're looking at is um, on, on the top, or the, I'll say the, the left-hand side of the facility, there's a warehouse and a control room. And then the actual facilities itself, you can see there's, there's looks, should look like three trains. Basically, there's three pieces to it. And uh, and then the far corner is where we're going to have our tanks and flare stack and such. So you can you can imagine each one of those three um, chunks, those are the three trains that we would build. So, um, so the plant would, with just the first train built, will only be about half the size. And then we'll extend it and put in the second train, the third train. And then there's already existing, uh, so some of the trees on the, again, the top left are existing, so they've been drawn in. But then we've also, uh, through the magic of uh, computer software, just put in extra trees along the plant boundary that we'd would, uh, propose to put in. So you knew what my questions was question. Yeah? <laughs> if you guys have questions too, I don't, it doesn't have to be that formal as far as I'm concerned. So if you have questions, throw them out. Otherwise, I'll keep droning on. <laughs> so this is a picture looking west. And so this is um, essentially from the Gazdag property, right? Yeah, because that's, that's right. Sorry, I was going to point. But yeah, the, the corner there is where uh, the road loops around and the Gazdags are just on this, this side. So they'd be at kind of the bottom of the screen, below the screen there. Um, so looking west, this this is from elevation. So this would be if you were able to be above the treetops. Um, if you're down at the ground level, you'd, you'd try and be. You wouldn't see much of the facility, to be honest, because you'd be staring through the through the trees there. But um, but yeah, at height, you can see um, kind of a good idea what the plant would look like once it's fully built out. And again, the trees that are in the forefront here, are pretty much all existing. Uh, it's the trees to the right. That would be uh, a lot of that would be new addition, correct? Yeah. Well, good. Yeah. 
And then looking southwest from the southwest corner, uh, from the, the neighbor's yard there, you can see it's a bit of a distance, so you're not, you don't see much, to be honest, um, just to give a perspective. And I think at this point we've got the models created so that you can, you can visualize what the facility would look like from each of the neighbor's properties, each of the neighbor's houses, so that when we're talking to the, to the uh, people in the area, they can kind of see what the, what the facility would look like once it's in, in place. So why this location? Um, so you can see, so I, I didn't mention, sorry, I'm, I'm so used to looking at these maps, I, I, I sometimes uh, forget I should explain exactly what we're looking at. So the grayed area on the map is where we, Paramount has their mineral rights. So all that grayed area would be where we um, would be looking to develop and, and drill wells so that we can get the resources. The, um, the black lines that are within that gray area show existing wells. And so you can kind of get a sense for each, like the length of those lines, kind of the, the, the length of the wells that we drill. So where it says existing plant site, you can see we have an existing uh, well pad and there's wells kind of heading off to the north uh, northwest and then to the southeast. Um, so you kind of get a sense of how much area you can drain from a single well pad um, looking at those black lines near the existing plant site. So that existing plant site is uh, Leafland Plant, which is um, just east of town here off the Beaver Flats Road. Beaver Flats, yeah. um, and we are doing some work there, uh, actually doing some expansion. The plan is to do some expansion there this fall. Um, we did look at expanding that site to meet our requirements for the for the whole development, and um, it just wasn't suitable. the The plant is 1980s vintage. It's um, it's it's rated capacity is about 23, 24 million cubic feet a day. So it's it's a fraction of what we require, and then um, it's also um, uh, there's not enough footprint. There's not enough available land there on 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 the plant site. At least land that we currently um, uh, have for that plant. There's not enough room to put all the equipment we'd need to expand the plant to the point where we could we could meet our full development. So uh, so that was one of the reasons. Although we did take a hard look at expanding that plant, and then the other thing that that um, drove us to put the proposed site further to the south is. For the next number of years, we would be drilling that area south of Highway 11. So kind of around that proposed plant site and even further south of that is where we're going to drill for the next number of years. And then we'll ex eventually start drilling further north, north of the highway. Um, and the other thing that I'll point out is the right to the right of the proposed plant site, the, the red line, it's the TransCanada system. So we'd be tying in there. So it's quite quite uh, close to the proposed site. And then there's a green dashed line that's a little hard to see, but um, it would head wed west from the proposed plant site, go straight west, and then it follows the kind of purple line towards the town, Rocky Mountain House. So that purple line is the, um, is the plane system. So as I mentioned, we have to tie in to planes. So we'd just be building that dashed green line west and then follow the existing uh, pipeline right away up to town or just south of town there for the tie-in. So from a uh, pipelining perspective it was a really good site and um, and close or not too far away from uh, planes but very close to NGTL system and um, yeah and as I mentioned so the the portions of the Geology to the south is actually where the best geology. That's the best rock. That's where we want to develop first. So um, that drove us to look at sites that were further south. And then a little more on why this location. So when we looked, <laughs> as you can imagine, there's there's no there's no real site anywhere in that general vicinity that doesn't have um, you know a lot of uh, disturbances, landowners, um, people, or other developments in the area. So we tried to pick something that was lesser populated 
Um, obviously, still a, a number of landowners in the vicinity, and then and uh, we've been speaking. Well, I won't say we. I haven't done the work. Dwayne's been doing the work and talking to all those landowners and explaining, you know, why we're why we chose that site, what we're looking to build. Um, <coughs> Uh, but definitely compared to if you got closer to town, it gets even more densely populated. Or even if you kind of went north of there, it gets a little more densely populated. So this was uh, a, a good spot in terms of that. And then, um, yeah, in terms of the use of the land, um, these guys can speak to it a lot better than I can. But uh, it really is somewhat limited in terms of potential. And there is some wetter, a lot of peat, <laughs> wetter soil down there. Um, so... Uh, I guess in the grand scheme of things, it was, say, less impactful than other locations that are better, better farmland. And with that, I will turn it back to Spencer. Yeah, thank you. And, and Dwayne is just going to speak to, um, <clears throat> uh, Dwayne lives in the area, so uh, he's going to speak to what we do in the community. Yeah, you I'll know, maybe ask, is our time okay for a few more minutes? Oh, for sure. Yeah? Okay. Um, this slide just shows a little bit more um, who Paramount is and especially maybe as a company how we're operating from based on 2022 and obviously these numbers are going to look a lot different moving ahead. Um, and also Paramount's made a strong commitment to being a good neighbor so this slide is about our community involvement so there's two portions to this so the top portion there um, the estimated uh, tax assessment that uh, we are paying based on 2022 numbers is just over a million dollars. And so respectfully, uh, as Blake indicated, our operations in the coming years, those numbers are going to increase. Uh, currently, we employ around uh, 21 full-time staff in the Rocky area. And then depending <coughs> on our activity, which we have some smaller pipelining, even projects this year, and moving into maintenance and drilling and completion. Um, we're estimating that that spin off from just some of those alone, that's gonna be uh, upwards of 80 to 100 individuals per year. So, the, and the other component of that is that we're hard to measure is the economic impact to the rest of the community and the rocky and surrounding areas. Um, and then with that, so obviously our proposed facility will have another uh, full-time employees at that location as well. And then the spin-off from that is the supporting contractors too that would help us with our operations for that area. Um, and the other part of our community involvement is that we're an active member with the West Central Stakeholders Group and currently the industry co-chair of the group. Um, and then in addition to the second part of our community involvement definitely is our com community support. So within the local community centers um, of the area, so Alhambra, Lesseville, Rocky Mountain House, we consider those the central part of our operating area. And then so within those, uh, we've broken that down even to smaller, uh, so the Rocky uh, Chamber of Commerce, uh, Lesseville Elks Hall, Alberta 4-H and the Wild Rose School Division, Alhambra Ball Diamond, and then the Lord's Food Bank Program. Uh, Lesseville file, Volunteer Fire Department and then this year we added a number of local rodeos that we sponsored as well and also the uh, Rocky Agriculture Society as well where we're making a donation to them as well so um, that whole note there alone is roughly around 70,000 which is a moving target because we're continually adding to that which we're happy to do so and that's part of our look ahead uh, looking forward. Um, and in addition to that, um, we do have an open house planned for next week, which is on May 31st, and it's at the Arbutus Hall, and it's from 3 to 8 p.m. So thank you very much for allowing us to present that to you, and please, uh, we welcome any and all questions that you guys may have on any of the, any of the topics here. Well, thank thank you for presenting, and I'll open it up to uh, I'll open it up to council. Uh, Deputy Reeve Milhoff. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, with this being a, a 
larger build within within your organization. Um, what strain does, does will this put on our local emergency services, or do you guys have those ERPs subcontracted out to industrial fire service, or will we see an increased strain on our local groups? Yeah, so um, uh, we uh, would currently have emergency response um, procedures, and uh, um, we're well set up to manage a, an emergency if there were one. Um, now, if there were one, would, would there be a, um, a pull from local uh, services? Depends on the emergency, of course, but if it was, a, say, a fire, then definitely we'd be contacting local fire responders. Um, so there could be a, a pull for that in the event of an emergency. In terms of um, uh, emergency management, though, there wouldn't be much of a pull. We'd, we'd definitely coordinate. So we're, we're set up um, to, to run an emergency under using the ICS um, system. Um, and the, part of that would be to coordinate with, you know, local people. Um, but yeah, the, definitely, you know, the facility's not large enough that we'd have, say, our own uh, fire fighting capabilities or, um, um, you know, on-site uh, um, kind of first responders. Although during the build and during drilling completions, it's typical that we would have uh, on-site medics. So we would contract uh, through one of the many uh, services. You know, we'd have a, a medic on each one of our drill sites. We typically have one on each one of our completion sites. I would imagine during construction, although we haven't, talked about that specifically, but typically for construction builds, if they're sizable, we may have, a, may have a medic. Thank you. I'll go to Councillor Swanson. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just a couple questions. Um, first one is, um, I'm very happy to see that you guys are doing some cogen uh, opportunities out there to uh, create your own power. Uh, you mentioned Fortis. Is it not something that, um, and I guess I'm just putting it out there as far as the, the local co-op, the Blue Mountain Power, is that something that, uh, is Fortis a better partner than Blue Mountain Power? Or if there's a difference between the two, I, I'm just, just asking the question on that one. And the second one is um, in regards to connectivity for your new plant. Will you need a fiber connection to that at that point in time? Or are you guys going to plan on going wireless? Good one. I'll think about that. Um, in terms of the uh, yeah, discussion with Fortis, so Fortis basically is is the company that uh, I'll say controls the the grid. So they're they're the ones we need to talk to when we talk about um, uh, whether there's enough transmission capacity, what they have to do the distribution network to to um, bring power in or to allow us to sell power. Um, in terms of actual um, kind of marketing and such, we actually. Um, the entire company uh, power uh, marketing contract goes through NMAX. So we, we'd likely just add another uh, site on the NMAX um, contract because we, we literally have hundreds and hundreds of power sites, as you can imagine. And uh, NMAX is the one that we deal with. Yeah. Uh, in terms of fiber, um, we haven't talked about that, Eric. What, you got any thoughts on that yet? Or it's kind of <coughs> early days. I think so. It's, I think we've worked with whatever local providers there is to figure out what the best uh, connectivity solution is yeah. for the plant um, with a view to um, supporting the operations, not only um, from the facility operation itself, but also any sort of office work that's going on there too. So, so yeah, so yeah we're, 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 lo we're looking at that, but not sure yet where it's going to go. Yeah. I'm sure operations would like the fiber connection if we can get it. If it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's uh, not something that comes up in other areas because often we're too remote. It's not an option, but yeah, yeah here, here would be an option. So it'd be a good one. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Ratcliffe. Thank you, Reeve. I'm just wondering, is there any uh, significant amount of oil production or is this all lighter product? That's, um, um, so what we're uh, on the map sheet, um, if you want to flip back to the map, what we're looking to develop, kind of, um, I'll say in that, broadly speaking, in the township um, that's west of Rocky and south, that's all uh, gas and condensate lighter product. If you go the next township to the east, further east, um, you get 
you get into block oil. And so there is a block oil play and, um, and it is on the radar for development, but it's currently further out down the road. Now it's, so I'll say as of last year, it wasn't in our five year development plan to go and develop the oil window on this Duvernay play. Um, but that, that can change. <laughs> it depends on the price of oil and gas and how, how much we want to, uh, you know, how large we want to have our capital program on any given year. But if we did develop it, it would require a substantial amount of capital um, and infrastructure out there as well. Yeah. Okay. Are you able to use any of the uh, abandoned pipelines that crisscross this area? Um, we, uh, well, we, we can't really use abandoned pipelines. Typically, once they're abandoned, they're no longer um, corrosion protected. So the cathodic protection is turned off. So, they, so then you basically end up with rusting metal in the ground. And um, so the integrity would be you know, highly suspect. Um, but there are a whole bunch of discontinued lines. So discontinued essentially means they're no longer in use, but they're still being maintained. Um, and therefore the integrity would be um, acceptable. And so there's discontinued lines, um, some of which we acquired. So there's a bunch of uh, Repsol lines in the south, or pipelines of Repsol installed that we, we card, acquired when we um, purchased their assets. And so I know Robin's uh, been working with with her team to look at um, how can we make use of those discontinued lines for sure. They tend to be smaller diameter lines and so, um, but we can still use them for um, bringing fuel gas, for example, from the plant site to the, to the different pad sites. Um, so our gathering system modeling that we've been developing is making use of those lines where they're in that area. Okay, yeah. great, thank you. Deputy Reed Melham. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, does Paramount have policies regarding local contractor use? Um, I'm just curious what your guys' intentions are, hopefully, to use as local as possible. Um, yeah, I, I had a bit of a cheeky response. So um, <laughs> <laughs> I just say, any careful what you ask for, because um, uh, we don't have a policy specifically saying local contractors only. Um, which was probably a good thing since uh, in, in past years, most of our programs been up by Grand Prairie, and, but we have used a uh, bunch of construction quite a bit. We've used WPW um, and, and uh, so had we had that policy, we would have you know, kind of almost forced us to use Grand Prairie <laughs> contractors. Um, so, you know, it, um, so we aren't locked down to that extent, but we will, we, we already have good rapport and good experience with some of the local contractors. So, you know, we're gonna definitely um, look at using those, those contractors and others. Um, we will, of course, when it comes to some of the um, smaller uh, services, you know, it makes a lot of sense to, to stay local because you're paying a whole lot of extra money to bring somebody from afar. So um, where it could, makes good business sense, we'll definitely be looking to bring in local people. Um, but even where, you know, the bigger contracts where you could justify bringing people from further afield, um, I could see us using local people just because it's, it's worked out with, <laughs> with our Grand Prairie projects in the past year, in the past few years. Absolutely, yeah. a follow up? Please, and then one last question from Councillor North. Uh, thank you, um, many of our other uh, uh, companies or even, uh, for example, our healthcare system has placed housing as a concern um, when trying to recruit and retain employees. Has your company seen um, that as an issue? Um, I'd say, uh, well, if you're if you're specifically asking for this in this area, uh, I would say we haven't seen that as an issue, but we haven't been, um, we've been, um, fairly static in terms of our employees in this, employee numbers in this area. So we haven't been recruiting or trying to, you know, build up our numbers. Um, we definitely have seen that as an issue in other areas. For example, Fox Creek, where we have extensive operations in that area. And uh, people, one of the big deterrents to get people into Fox Creek is a lack of suitable housing. Um, it's not much available and what is available, uh, you know, is maybe, um, 
not suitable for families, you know, small apartment kind of thing. Um, and uh, and so it, it is a deterrent for getting people to move in a fox. So yeah, it's definitely uh, can be a concern. We haven't tested the, the waters here, I'd say. Yeah. Thank you. And Councillor Northcott? All right. You know, this proposal, it's just really, it's a great example of really the the uh, fortunate resources that Clearwater County really does have for, for natural resources, whether it's oil and gas, aggregates, or, you know, all the natural resources that really are truly here. Um, there are many, many skilled uh, residents that live in Clearwater County, whether it's, you know, welders, crane operators, instrumentation, electrical insulators, line locators, the list is quite long of all the very skilled people that do live here. Um, <clears throat> the amount of wealth, uh, employment, community, and economic benefits from from the natural resources that Clearwater County is, is fortunate to have here. It's great. Um, it just goes to show to the, the ability to maintain a distinct rural landscape um, to allow for natural, to, for development of natural resources. It's very important to have a, a rural uh, distinct landscape and not urbanized. Um, to have a, you know, just on those comments of housing, um, you know, Fox Creek, it just goes to, again to support Previous comments I've made to have strong urban communities that have a variety of amenities uh, for families, youth, seniors. Um, that's that's where people like to, you know, whether it's retention for staff, operators, um, healthcare system, doctors, nurses. Um, and one, uh, as far as third party, uh, like for emergency services and stuff, I know that you had a comment there, uh, Deputy Melhoff, the in the oil industry, there's many, many very diligent people that, uh, that do look after your safety programs. I do have a little bit of background in the oil field, but from many, many instances, I've seen very diligent people and uh, do hire many very competent third-party uh, response contractors to attend to any emergencies in the oil field. But it was, it's, yeah, that's all. Thanks. Thank you, and I'll go to a Councillor Graham, please. All right, I did hear that that was the last question. Mine is to make a motion here, but I just wanted to thank you guys so much for your presentation, and there's so much great information in there. I learned a few things. I'm not, I don't have a history or background in oil and gas at all, so that was great for me. Um, and thank you for all that you do for our community. All those lists of the places that you guys donate to, that's, people forget how much, how what good industry does for the community, and thank you guys for all that you do. We very much appreciate it. And with that, I would like to make a motion that Council receives Paramount Resources Limited Limited proposed sweet natural gas and liquids processing facility presentation for information. Thank you for that motion. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, I would call the motion all in favor. And that is carried. Thank, thank you. Yeah, I, <laughs> a little bit of a background uh, dramatics there, yeah. but nonetheless. <laughs> Um, time that well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time to share share your plans and your projects uh, moving forward. We're excited to see you continue to be a great community partner as we move forward together. And uh, and uh, thank you, thank you again for being here today. Yeah, you're welcome. You. Thanks. Appreciate Thanks for your time. <clears throat> Maybe we'll um, let's take a ten here, and uh, we'll be back at two thirty.
Welcome back. Uh, we jock jockey around in our agenda again. We move back to item 6.3, and that is a notice of motion relating to Alberta Rural Health Week and a proclamation. And uh, I'm not sure who takes this one away. Maybe I'll go across to Ms. Haggard. Sure, and, uh, pull it up. And then I know Councillor Melhoff or Deputy Reed Melhoff may have something to add as well. So. Thank you, Reeve Lahey, and good afternoon again, members of council. On May 4th, 2023, uh, Councillor Melhoff provided a uh, written notice of motion for council to proclaim May 29th to June 2nd, 2023 as rural, um, Alberta's Rural Health Week. And um, I think the detail is in the agenda item. Um, but essentially, that proclamation uh, indicates that Alberta Rural Health Week is set aside to celebrate healthcare professionals and volunteers. Uh, and the theme for this year is we keep care close to home. So I will turn that back for council discussion. Super, thank you. Um, so yeah, with, with that, I think it's it's a period of time. It's not necessarily a week. Is, is it more or less a, a month? Maybe I'll look to Deputy Reed Melhoff with uh, some detail around this. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, th this month in general, May has been devoted to health. Uh, however, uh, May 29th to June 2nd specifically is rural health. And uh, the, rural, the health engagement team, our local team, um, is requesting that we, we do the proclamation for that week. Um, just to put another little celebratory uh, way of thanking uh, our rural health professionals within our community. Um, it's uh, my understanding that, that the town will be receiving other, a similar request because, uh, as I stated, this is coming on on request of the our our local engagement team that is made up of town and county. Uh, so I sent this forward for that. And Thank hopefully you for the that. council will uh, consider it. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, discussion? Uh, Councillor Swanson, please. Uh, no, I, I believe that uh, uh, Deputy Reeve Melhoff has kind of nailed the, the ask. And of course, uh, I'm in full agreement of this particular um, Rural Health Week. I, think I agree with her with all points as far as it's very important. Our community is uh, very much indebted with the health professionals that currently reside here and work here. So. I will be supporting this motion. And I certainly will, would be supporting of that motion as well because I think we have a tremendous group of rural health professionals and community volunteers here and I think they need to have a little tip of the hat. So I will certainly be supporting that. Deputy Reeve Melhoff. Uh, thank you Reeve. Did you, did you want to make the motion proclaiming it? As the Reeve, um, I, and we I, can support you I could so make that, but I think since it's okay. your notice of motion, let's have you you do that. Okay. And um, the council proclaims May 29th to June 3rd, 2023, Rural Health Week as follows. Did you want it read out, or are we comfortable with as recommended in the in the agenda item today? Then, as recommended in the agenda item. Okay. Further discussion. Saying none, all in favor? And that is carried. Thank you very much for bringing that forward. To Thank us. you, team. I appreciate it. Um, and it will be kicked off on Saturday at uh, Rival Trade, who we've partnered with to help celebrate the week. Thank you for that. Uh, we move forward through the agenda. I know we're joined by Mr. Hansen from Public Works. And this is a discussion around the 2023 contractor equipment rate review. And I'll turn, oh, so, sorry. Um, I even put a star beside <laughs> that, right. and I did. Uh, Councillor Graham. Due to pecuniary interest, I would like to recuse myself for this, title, for this Thank item. You. Thank you for that. I will also. Okay, Councillor Cermak as well. And so I'll probably turn the floor across to you, Mr. Hansen, to outline, uh, outline uh, the information around this review. Well, thank you very much, Reeve Lougheed. Uh, good afternoon, Council. So this is the second time uh, Council has seen the uh, Clearwater County equipment rates, the review. We did a thorough review um, last year, last May. Um, 
there were some really good questions. I actually went back and, and, and watched the, uh, the questions and, and some of the comments there by counselors. So um, I think this is really going to uh, be a brief presentation, um, but I will walk through some of the highlights. Um, I figured it's important to actually come right back to the hiring equipment policy, which really drives um, the need and the necessity for, for what we're doing. This is um, in the policy. It also refers that the council will set the equipment rates annually. Um, but I really wanted to really drive home the policy statement. I'm going to read it. Clearwater County recognizes the importance of community and will seek to use hourly work contractors located within the boundaries of Clearwater County, the town of Rocky Mountain House, and the village of Caroline in the delivery of its construction and maintenance, maintenance services where it's practicable to do so. Um, I think that is important, you know, even with some of the discussion we had earlier today about how much Clearwater County invests in its local contractors and uh, other service providers. Moving on, staff recently received the 2023 Alberta Road Builders uh, Heavy Equipment Rental Guide, the ARHCA for, um, for ease of, of uh, an acronym. That of course is being the peer reviewed book. Uh, members include some of the largest construction companies in Alberta. So those rates are vetted through that association and then published. And even as part of our policy, we recognize that that will be the basis of our setting our rates and an associated percentage of. So as per the policy, as per the hiring equipment policy, council approved the rates annually considering a percentage of the ARHC rates. Um, it can say there was a significant increase in the book rates from 2022 to 2023. So that correction has been made. Uh, this increase can be associated primarily with operating costs. Um, so in the rate guide, it actually provides a breakdown on the components, how a hourly rate is, is um, derived. So there's four major components. There's ownership costs, operating costs, overhead, and profit. And then once you add all those four items up on an hourly basis, that's how they come to the hourly rate. Uh, the biggest increase was seen in operating costs, typically associated with fuel. Um, so in 2022, for example, the fuel that was used in the calculation was $1.18 a litre. As we can recall, when we actually council approved the rates last year, we were up as high as a dollar fifty or dollar seventy as high as, and of course the rate the rates were actually based on dollar eighteen. Even though it is a very, um, it is a um, applicable rate book for that year. You know, it's done usually typically January February when they would set those rates. Uh, they were lower, and by the time we got to the construction season, it was significantly higher. In um, twenty twenty three, the example that we're using here today. Um, the fuel rate that was used in their operating cost was $1.79 a litre. That still is not indicative of what we've seen today because of the ebbs and flows that we've seen with our fuel prices. So really, the one example that they provided was a rubber tired loader, mid-sized. There was an 18% increase from the 2022 rate to the 2023 rate. That being said, um, staff is still recommending that we stay at the 80 to 92% of the 2023 rate book um, as a percentage paid. Um, and staff continues to monitor fuel rates, as, uh, but is not recommending a fuel index at this time. Um, so with that, I've provided a comparison. Um, as the, so what you're seeing right now currently is uh, with the schedule aid that's attached to the policy every year, once council approves the, the revised rates, they get attached to the, to the policy itself as the schedule A, and then um, included in the, doc, in the agenda here today is the revised rates shows where the rate was in 2022, what the new 2023 uh, Alberta Road Builders rate book would be, the percentage paid, which was the exact same as last year, and then the revised rate. Um, of course, you know, I just want to throw that in there again. It's outlined in the document that uh, the fuel index is actually applied from a uh, administrative perspective if need be. So, of course, we would monitor those rates if there was a major fluctuation throughout the year. But um, I think the rates, the current Alberta Road Builders book, you know, really did well to accommodate for the increased uh, operating costs that we seen to our contractors, and the rates reflect that. We're seeing anywhere between a six to eight percent increase, even over top of our rates that we had last year, and which this council, um, you know, approved those rates with an eight percent fuel uh, fuel index. So, we are recommending this year that the, the rates are as highlighted in yellow provided, and that does not include a fuel index. And with that, I'll open it up to any questions. Deputy Reeve Melhoff. 
Uh, thank you, Reeve. Uh, when the lens that I put on this is very similar to when um, Mr. Gross comes and talks to us about uh, staff. Um, it looks fairly similar to that, where we've been, we, 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 given what we are currently at, what the, being the index that is being, not indexed, sorry, the Alberta Road Fillers numbers, and you're using a percentage of that in order to drive ours. And it looks like we're sitting kind of right around that 65th to 70, like of our, the same we would be expecting of staff. So I, I commend um, your team's ability to be consistent throughout um, our staff and then our contractors. So as long as I'm got the right lens on this and I'm interpreting accurately, and feel free to correct me if I'm not. No, that, that is fair. Um, you know, I think that even the discussion we had last year, it's hard to get a good representation of other municipalities because even our local ones are so much different. Um, you know, when we look at our road builders rates, we compare them to what we do have is a lot of local contractors and we are, we are competitive. We are, you know, lower, slightly lower. I'm gonna say probably most of them have adopted a Alberta road builders rate as their, if I were to walk into a large construction company today and say, give me your rate list off the floor with no relationship, they would they'd be very indicative to the road builders rates. Now, of course, anybody that does any volume of work would get a significant different rate. And I know for a fact, if we actually went to tender for rates, we would probably get a different rate again. Um, we like to split that middle. And I think what, you know, the analogy you've used is the, the percentile. I think we fairly meet that expectation of what a discounted rate should look like compared to the, to the uh, rate book, you know, given the volume that we do. And it is, it is a lot of volume, as we outlined in there. It's $6 million worth of work a year. So it's, there's nothing to, to sneeze at. Okay. Uh, Councillor Ratcliffe. Thank you, Reeve. What, what's the rationale for the percentage discount range? Should we go from 80% to 92%, I think? What's the... Yeah, it really boils down that? to the, the type. Um, that we're seeing in the rate book and, and in our local experience. So when we canvas our local contractors and get their rates and how they compare, um, we found that some, some uh, companies are actually, equipment availability pricing around in this area is actually less than the road builders book. So that's why we actually percent less. And some of it's sheer volume, you know, with the amount of volume that we put on for trucking and um, our truck and pups, for example. That's why we've kind of, you know, a, uh, I think one of the highest ones is a, is a backhoe. We don't use a, a backhoe a lot, so it's not surprising you would pay a higher rate. And there's also just boils down to availability. There was, there was some times where you could not get a backhoe for that at an 80% of the road builders book. So it was availability of that, of those contractors. Whereas we can fill the seats at the rates that we have today. Um, so the science comes from behind, come, comes from evaluating the receptivity of the contractors being able to work for us and our general knowledge of how the rate, rate book works. Um, there again, the volume that we provide and the amount of work, we should, you know, it justifies a discounted rate. But it does vary from different equipment groups. Okay, thank you, I understand. Okay, okay any further, further questions? Um, Councillor Swanson, please. No further questions, but I'm prepared to make the motion. Okay. So um, the council approves the 2023 Clearwater County equipment rates as amended and directs staff to include the revised rate schedule to the hiring, hiring of equipment policy as the new Schedule A. Okay, okay. discussion on that motion. Uh, Councillor Ratcliffe. Actually, it doesn't relate to that motion that much. I should have asked it earlier. I'm wondering how are we doing it, spreading this work around through the community? So currently, sorry, Jeff. No, that's fine. So in 2022, uh, we had 65 contractors signed up for our, on our contractor list. We utilized 61 of those. So we had 64, sorry, 94% utilization of all the contractors that um, registered to work for us. Um, there's also, that's not including, those are the ones that have just, for, for our day labor contractors that come in and register heavy equipment. Now some of those contractors just have equipment that we don't, we don't need. You know, as we, for as, all the things that we do here at the county, we don't need every type of piece of equipment that somebody would in, come in and register. So 
Um, last year we had one example that actually, one example of a contractor that even though they registered, they wouldn't work for the rates because they had work elsewhere. And the other ones were like rental companies um, that we just didn't require the, they, so uh, we do well to cover off, you know, utilizing and spreading out that work to the available contractors in the area. Um, and like I say, that's only a fraction of all the contractors we use because that's not including all of our other contract work and other vendors that we use on a regular basis, which would take that 64 up into a probably 120 of all the vendors and contractors and relationships that we manage there uh, throughout the year. So I say for, for specifically the ones that signed up, we had 95, no, 94% utilization. Okay, thank you. Okay, any additional questions? I'm ready to call that, that motion then. All in favor? And that is carried. Thank you very much for uh, presenting today and uh, look forward to a successful year again. Thank you very much. Enjoy your day. Um, with that, we move through our agenda. Um, Teammates? Yeah, I think we can wait for our teammates to get back, but we'll allow um, Jujitsu to join us for the um, 2023 annual communications update. So we'll uh, I'll turn the floor across to Ms. Tudyk to to. Um, Share the, good, share the good news and the good communication. Good afternoon, Colonna Reeve. Um, the strategic communications plan that was approved by Council on November 22nd, 2022 was created to strategically link organizational communication to Council's strategic plan and therefore will be reviewed for every updated Council strategic plan. This presentation will cover a review of the progress is made towards this plan as noted in the document which is attached to this agenda item to ensure that the plan remains relevant. This is a part of our uh, annual summary report that will be presented to Council during quarter one of each year. The attached presentation includes analytics that describes how communications supported county departmental programs and services from January 1st to December 31st, 2022. This pres presentation is to provide Council with an update on what is currently being done and if Council wishes to make any changes in the upcoming year. You can go directly to the first slide of the PowerPoint. Can we, can I use this? That was just a little bit of a glitch during the export. Um, so these communications goals are pulled from the strategic communications plan. Uh, they focus on cultivating a, a well-informed understanding of our county programs and services. Uh, they foster two-way communications, so providing timely information and also ensuring that we have a proper feedback loop for residents to provide feedback on any of our programs or services or if it's um, filling out an application form or any other documentation. And then the last uh, part of our goal is to ensure that we're building communication processes. An example of this is during emergency preparedness, um, having templates and checklists ready to go in the event of an emergency or during road closures. So I provided this slide last year uh, during this time when I did an update. Uh, th these are all of our different uh, channels of output that we uh, provide for the public. So we utilize our county website, our mobile app, we've got our official Facebook and Twitter uh, pages as well as Instagram and LinkedIn. We have a podcast which is both uh, outputted versa, uh, via audio and video. We of course maintain our YouTube channel which um, uh, stores our council meetings and also our economic development videos and promotions. We have an e-newsletter. Uh, right now we have over 800 subscribers through our website. We also advertise in the local newspapers in three publications in the Mountaineer, Western Star, and the Albertan. We also advertise on the local radio. We use Facebook uh, Messenger as a way also to answer questions from the public. 
Alberta Emergency Alert is utilized during emergencies, and then also signages and, and posters. So this could be an example uh, during fire bans, um, flipping the fire bans on our municipal entrance signs. We also have the County Highlights Newsletter, uh, traditionally published six times a year. And then we also contribute advertising to the local visitor community guides that the Mountaineer and Town of Rocky Mountain House publishes. So currently, uh, or in 2022, we published six uh, County Highlights Newsletters. Uh, each uh, issue was mailed to approximately 5,200 households in the county. Um, in 2023, we're going to be reducing to four issues a year, and the primary reason for this was um, because there, there has been a slight uh, consistent increase in cost every year for producing each issue uh, due to time constraints of staff and also the availability of information on projects, also because of the publication cutoff date. And also just to effectively utilize our time in communications between myself and my coworker, Alana McLean. Um, by reducing the number of publications, we hope to create an opportunity for more cost efficiencies, improve public, public education awareness through utilization of other communication channels. So we can hopefully utilize our time um, to, per, to outputting uh, better value in other uh, areas. Our website analytics have been pretty consistent uh, with the previous years. Um, there has been a slight decrease from 2021, and the primary reason for that was in 2021, we had several um, sort of high traffic events. So we had the 2021 municipal election, we had our regional waste change, and also uh, January 2021, we had our website redesign, which uh, resulted in a lot of page visits um, to the website to verify content. Uh, this, the, the peak that you see in the middle of the year last year was due to the June flooding. Uh, so that, of course, happens every time we have some sort of uh, big emergency or disaster. We get lots of traffic to our website. Uh, but so far, it's been pretty consistent, which is really good to see. Uh, what we plan on doing for the latter part of 2023 is researching and preparing for a redesign in 2024. Um, it'll be sometime in between January and December of 2024. Uh, what we are gonna be doing is uh, reformatting the way the content is laid out, uh, which is why we're, we're dedicating the next six months to it. So rather than the pages being laid out by department, um, that's how it's currently uh, laid out, we're gonna reformat it to be more uh, public facing so that services are categorized on an area that the public might understand and be more likely to click in and visit. We're also going to be doing some interviews with departments to see um, what other uh, common themes and issues they're having to increase uh, efficiencies and usability of the website. Instagram, we did a trial last year um, to um, have Instagram be our economic development uh, focus so we can attract people and businesses. Uh, what we found was it wasn't quite working as well as we'd liked. Uh, we're happy that we tried something different with Instagram, um, but we just felt that the current audience uh, that we had uh, following us on Instagram wasn't into that uh, niche. So the result was very, very difficult to engage, uh, engage uh, our users and followers. So what we're proposing to do uh, this year is to do a little bit of a pivot and change our strategy to be more event focused. So when we have events uh, happening in the community, whether it's a public engagement event or a work workshop, uh, we'll be promoting those. Um, and also in the event of, of emergencies, we're, we're noticing a, a smaller niche uh, of the younger uh, age demographic also utilizes Instagram. So that may, may be a good mechanism to reach that uh, age range. Facebook has been pretty consistent uh, with previous years. We, we have um, increased our reach and follower range in the last year and a half, which is really great to see. So every time we get an emerg uh, emergency or we're publishing lots of information out, we get a lot more followers. So that's consistent to see. We're not changing anything on Instagram or, uh, sorry, uh, on Facebook. Um, we're, keeping, we're keeping that status quo. Uh, the only uh, addition that we'll be adding is just more graphics to increase engagement. Uh, Twitter has been also pretty consistent. Uh, we're seeing engagement on sort of more of the trending topics when it deals with uh, emergencies um, or with any kind of um, political issues. So the direction for 2023 will be uh, pretty status quo and we'll just continue to add more graphics to increase engagement. Uh, YouTube saw the biggest um, jump in viewership uh, and even though it is a, a storage hub for videos um, I think we are uh, linking it a lot more in our uh, social media posts so people are relying on YouTube to access past recordings or, or even upcoming uh, live stream live stream meetings of council um, so that's really good to see that it's, it's consistent um, and that we're getting a little bit more uh, of a viewership 
The next slide just shows uh, the top six videos uh, in, la uh, in 2022. So it was uh, um, an AGA video about uh, get control of uh, Canadian thistle. Um, and then there were three council uh, live stream meetings that were um, the top ratings last year. And then we have uh, one podcast episode as well. So the only difference that we'll be doing in 2023 for YouTube is that we're going to start to catalog videos better with better labels and descriptions and also utilize the playlist that's available on YouTube so people can hopefully uh, search um, and find uh, their videos that they're looking for under certain categories. LinkedIn uh, was consistent from 2022 and will be this year and we're just having that to be uh, HR recruiting and active strategy focused uh, and we'll continue that this year as well. Uh, podcast, um, so I've got two overlay images here, so it might be a little bit difficult to see, so I apologize about that. But um, in collaboration with an economic development officer, we're seeing a lot more um, video uh, views uh, rather than the audio um, views of these podcast issues. So we'll continue this um, as interviews and topics are made available. And that is the last slide of my presentation. Are there any questions? Deputy Reed Melhoff. Uh, thank you, Reef. Um, it's always super informative when, when you come and teach us about how things are actually being absorbed by the community, because I think that's a really important way for us to determine how we're getting our information out there. Um, something that I have been asked several times is, there, is there an opportunity to have council more involved? Like, um, as I said when we Strategic Steps was here earlier today, people seem to really want the opportunity to be able to ask us questions directly. Um, similar to what we do at RMA or at AV Munis where there's a ministerial forum where we get to ask them questions. Is there an opportunity to add that to the communications um, strategy that people would have? A council, it's obviously not a ministerial forum, but a council forum where they can ask us questions directly whether it be in a council meeting, we can have a few minutes at the beginning once a month or set it up outside of a council meeting and have us set up a forum where they can ask us questions and we can answer it. Is there an opportunity to add that to the strategy? We could certainly explore that, um, but I'll direct either to Christina Murray to answer if they have any questions or comments. Thank Ms. you. Hager. Thank you, Reeve Lahey, members of council again. Um, in terms of the, the forum, that's totally up to council's discretion. And um, I know that that occurs currently with our um, many open houses that you've had throughout the year. Um, other municipalities have, have seen that as part of their um, municipal process to do that kind of before the council meeting. Uh, the only caution with that is that we wouldn't be prepared to answer those questions. So it can be challenging because I think sometimes folks would like an immediate response to their, their question or concern. Um, so a mechanism that we can take information from the public and then provide that answer, uh, which is what we do through regular communications, is probably preferred. Uh, but certainly that's up to council's discretion how they wish to engage with the public. Uh, you guys also do your, um, I don't know if it's coffee with a counselor or the, the counselor, the counselor drop-in times um, as well. So that's another mechanism that people could come in and speak with their individual counselors. We also know that they have your phone numbers and email addresses, so they use those regularly also as another mechanism for communicating. So uh, again, I'll turn that back to the council floor, but um, with notes that the one, the one thing about looking for an answer that we may or may not have uh, without the administrative research and review would be uh, something to consider. And Councillor Swanson, please. I'm happy to see that you're going to drop the newsletters from 6 to 4. I know it is a big undertaking to put those together. Um, so two questions in that. Is there, is there a minimum amount of pages that have to be published in order to make it cost effective? And is there an opportunity to have a question, a bit of a survey question put out? Maybe not everyone, but at least once a year where we say we want your feedback on a certain item and maybe the hot topic of, you know, what do you want to see addressed in the land use bylaw, like, you know, upcoming so we yeah. can kind of preemptively get that question out versus a tax notice or whatever else. Um, so the first part of your question is yes. Um, 
Um, there's a, the, the, the printing press out of Edmonton does in bindings of 16. That's the most cost efficient, which is why we either do a 32 pager or a 48 pager at the end of the year. Um, in terms of adding surveys, we have done special edition newsletters in the past with the MDP in September of 2021. We issued a special uh, issue which was just about the MDP. The, it was the full 32 pages was about that. So we have done that in the past. Um, my only concern with doing some sort of survey inside of it is how do we um, attach some sort of uh, self-postage on it. That's, uh, that's prepaid. Um, that will be my only sort of limitation, um, but we can certainly research that, how it could be utilized. Uh, my recommendation would be having the survey in there, advertising it with a QR code for people to su su submit it online. Just a bit of a more, of a, a more cost-effective approach. And uh, Councillor Ratcliffe. Thank you, Reeve. Uh, um, I notice you've got great information on the digital because it's easier the digital communications at uh, one of our recent seminars the the word was that you can't just stop it at mm -hmm. digital communications do, do you have any way of uh, sort of providing analytics on the hard copy communications that we do are you specifically referring to the county highlights newsletter or the local newspapers? Both. Um, the county highlights newsletter gets mailed to 5,200 households. That's the extent of our, our information. And then we also offer hard copies here. Um, we also, in the past, used to drop off hard coffee copies at some of the local um, places in town that are common get-together places. That's the extent of our, our, um, our newsletter. And then we also offer that digital version. Um, the local newspaper, it's really difficult because it's not uh, a matter of... Um, they they um, have a set number of people that uh, have subscriptions. It could be household-based. Um, they could also have certain quantities at newspaper stands. Um, it's really difficult to get a readership versus a subscription-based analytic. Or even more so of who actually um, accesses the information. Right. We have, in the past, um, left a static um, we have in the past left a static message in our newsletter. Tell us how we're doing. Um, you know, let, let us know what you'd like to see more of. Give us a comment on what you'd like to see in the newsletter, and we seldom ever get a response back. Um, so in, in my almost six years here, we've, we've left it at least once or twice a year um, as a message in the back. Tell us how we're doing, um, and very seldom responses. Okay, thank you. Councillor Graham, please. Thank you for your presentation. Great information, as per always. I find it interesting because when you're looking for the information, it's just everywhere. Like I, I was watching my niece and nephew at hockey practice, and it was on the in the arena. I think it was for the MDP public hearing. It was advertised on the little TV in the arena, and it's just really interesting how. Like I remember when I bought my blue truck when I used to have a blue truck, and then all of a sudden everyone copied me and had blue trucks. <laughs> and it's kind of like that with with the communication when you're looking for the information. And I just appreciate everything you do. I think you do a great job. And I'd like to make a motion that council receives the 2023 communications update for information as presented. Thank you for that motion, uh, Dip or Councillor Northcott or Radcliffe, please. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Reeve. I'll keep, um, I'll keep guessing until I get it right. <laughs> 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 um, just a couple of comments. You said you're redesigning the website. I hope part of that is uh, improving the search engine. I know when I've tried to use it before, it'll come up with 1,060 um, options, most of which don't relate to what you're looking for at all. So I'm pleased to hear that. Uh, I also should mention I had a comment from Nordic that with the recent evacuation alert, somehow it wasn't clear and people thought they had to pack up and go rather than just be ready. So maybe not the right time to mention it, but uh, I did it anyway. Thank you, though. Okay. Thank you for the comments. Super, any additional comments? I shall call the question then, all in favor? And that is carried. Thank you so much for the update today.
Um, brings us into Emerge and leg Legislative Services and uh, item 10.1 is a no discrimination policy update and I believe uh, Ms. Hagert would that be oh, checking my, my agenda package here would that be yours? All right just a couple more to get through uh, before the end of the meeting. Uh, Clearwater County uh, has an existing no discrimination no discrimination policy, uh, HR 1006, which was originally adopted by council uh, resolution on July 23rd, 2019. Um, and when I wrote this item, it was recently, but it's no longer recently. Council had indicated to um, the CAO the desire to review and amend uh, the county's no discrimination policy uh, to further align its language with its partners' policies, including that of the town of Rocky Mountain House and the Wild Rose School Division. I believe that was following a joint meeting with both parties. Um, at that time, um, I don't think that council had the policy before them, so I wanted to, to provide that policy with some recommended amendments that are shown in, uh, in red and track changes within the document. Um, so again, attached for council's consideration with amendments um, to include some of the principles that I read within those partner agencies' uh, re um, discrimination policies. They're both very different um, between the, the way the town, um, the Wild Rose School Division, and the Clearwater County writes their policies are, are quite different. So um, what I inferred from the, the general principles that I, f uh, I felt council wished to include was that to extend the policy beyond just Clearwater County employees uh, to elected officials, our contractors, any volunteers working for the municipality, um, as well as any individual on county property. So that is essentially the add-ins to the, the policy itself. Um, and certainly this is a, a draft for council's consideration. If there's any uh, further amendments or deletions of the amendments, um, we can do that as we go through. Uh, but essentially, if, if, I, if council so wishes, I can walk through the, the policy statement um, and changes as we go. Um, in the first section, we added uh, a, a sentence about uh, diversity in the community. Um, looks like there's a question. Apologies. Sorry, I was on the Tool area further down. Should I wait? Totally up to council. If you want to ask it now, we can skip forward. Oh, sure. We're already okay. on, on your thoughts, so why not? Yeah, why not share it? <laughs> it was under purpose. I was, or it would be in other parts of the document as well, but should it include our board members appointed by council? Yep. That was the only thing that I had. Absolutely, I think that can certainly be added um, under the policy statement as well, where it's listing, um, where sure. it's uh, including but not limited to, we'll add uh, in that location as well if, if council agrees to that. Uh, under definitions, we added the definition um, of discrimination. Under purpose, uh, we added who the policy applies to. If you can just keep scrolling down, Tracy Lynn. Under principles, um, and this is where it materially changes the policy. Again, this one was focused on uh, county employees. It's part of our um, package that goes to employees with human resources and administrative policies. Adding that council component, the council principles, including that modeling of be inclusive behavior and language, uh, follows, following, following and fostering the principles of the policy in their work and interactions and uh, reporting incidents of discrimination. Uh, similarly, so with same kind of principles listed for management um, and then adding to that, uh, requesting any folks that would enter a county facility wearing or displaying a symbol of hate to leave the premises. And then finally, uh, the section that encompasses employees, volunteers, contractors, um, and it would, board members would likely fit best there. Um, again, not engaging in any um, discrimination, reporting incidents, and again, requesting folks to, to leave a facility if they have any hate materials on them. So that is the recommendation um, from staff in terms of the policy changes. I did also want to mention for, for council's awareness, uh, we do have a more detailed uh, no discrimination procedure that goes with that, and discrimination is also mentioned in several other county procedures 
uh, including whistleblower policy and procedure, um, use of social media and technology procedure, respectful workplace uh, policy and procedure, anti-nepotism procedures. Um, so there's certainly, it's, it's peppered throughout our employment package for policies that we give to employees. So it's um, something that I believe we already had uh, well covered, and I, I think that this is just an enhancement to the um, the current no discrimination policy, and it gets you to where you want it to be in alignment with your partners in the Wild Rose School Division and the Town of Rocky Mountain House. Deputy Reeve Melha. Uh, th thank you, Reeve. Um, you said that there's many other policies that are associated with this, so perhaps they're covered in other in other areas. Um, however, this the principles they they speak very specifically about racial a lot. Um, there's many other discriminatory factors. Um, we could spend all day listing them, but these ones are very pointed towards racial discrimination. I'm curious if we need to add um, all of the other as well, the gender discrimination, et cetera, um, or what your thoughts were on that. You bet. And I think, um, Tracy, if you scroll back up to the yeah, definitions, perhaps if, perhaps if we just um, maybe use the word protected human rights, and then there's a list of all the different things that are protected um, under the Act, uh, that we could add that to each of the instances where we mention racial discrimination or racism and say, or any protected human right, and just add that as we go through, because it's defined there already. Would that meet your objective? Deputy Reed Melha. Uh, yes, thank you. I think that that would be that would be helpful. Just as it's not as clear in principles as it is in definitions, so that would be great. Thank you. And I'll go to Councillor Northcott. All right. Thank you. Um, it always seems like there's more policies, more bylaws. Um, you know, I don't think really uh, the large majority of People really don't stand for discrimination at all in any way, shape, or form. But these policies, they sort of seem to be endless. When really a lot of this stuff is already covered by the, like our other levels of government, by the Alberta government, the federal government, like there's, you know, it's, it's some of this can be criminally charged, right? So, so why do we have to continue to create additional bylaws that need to be maintained and updated and why, why can't it just just simply be as per like the Alberta Human Rights Act, as per the criminal code of you know section 319 and, and so on and so forth. Why 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 all these Clearwater County bylaws more and more all the time? I just just curious, because they're already covered in so many other levels of government. Mm -hmm. Um Ms. Hager, please. Absolutely, Councillor Northcott, and I I appreciate the comment and, uh, and tend to agree. Um, I think the focus for some of the policy development is, is supportive of um, those other levels of government uh, and legislation and the, the principles as a community that we, we stand for here. Um, although you're 100% right that federal or provincial legislation would trump uh, municipal policy making or uh, even bylaws um, if there was something to be progressed in that manner. Uh, in a sense, for these policies, I believe that uh, it's philosoph a philosophical uh, organizational value um, that we support those existing pieces of uh, legislation provincially. Okay, and I'll go to Councillor Swanson, please. Um, I believe this all generated from our conversation with Wild Rose School Division and the town of Rocky Mountain House and how we wanted to align ourselves uh, together so it would be in, re in response to uh, the community schools out, out there, so let the new schools with Lessieville and Condor and also in Caroline, so that that way we were ensuring that uh, none of us were stepping out of place and it would be something that's common to all and agreed, fully agree, Ms. Haggart, with all that you said about the other levels of government in this. Um, but I believe this was a, a synergy that we all agreed that we were going to uh, implement. So I think that's where this basis of this uh, policy is coming from. Uh, the sentiment was, I know uh, the mayor of Rocky Mountain House was very forthcoming with this. I thought that was a very good with, with what was happening. And again, with uh, the Wild Rose School Division trustees that were sitting there with us as well. So um, 
I don't want to go back on my word that we said that we would do this with them. I think this is very important to show the collaboration with our municipal partner and uh, also with uh, Wild Rose School Division. And this is not necessarily on an adult level. This is also to protect our children. So that's uh, why the Wild Rose School Division was is was brought into this discussion. So um, I'll be supporting the, the new changes and amendments to this policy. Uh, Councillor Northcott. Yeah, I'll, I'll support the policy as well, but it's funny. It's just, it just seems like, you know, it's, uh, there's good people and there's just, there's sometimes there's, you know, a very small margin of not good people, but to, you know, respect and all that stuff supposed to be te like, like taught to children and adults are supposed to have it. But these, it just, you know, it, it does take, it's, it does cost money to maintain all these bylaws and more rules, more rules, more rules, or like these policies, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll support it because I don't, like, it's, uh, don't stand for discrimination or harassment, but uh, it, it's amazing how it can just get into such a, it's burdensome. And uh, Councillor Graham, please. I would just like to make a motion that Council accepts the no discrimination policy as amended, approves as amended. That made sense. Yep. Okay, cool. <laughs> okay, discussion on that motion. All those in favor then? That's carried. And I think there was a second part to that suggestion as well too that we um, approve a revised no discrimination or am I off out of line okay no nope, that's fine I think, I think we're good sorry we're good <laughs> all right um, 10.2 uh, RMA 2023 fall resolutions and Miss Haggard again I believe Thanks, Tracy. Uh, thank you again, Reeve Lougheed and members of council. Uh, you will recall this is uh, somewhat commonplace for me to bring an agenda item like this uh, for council's consideration. Uh, as we know, resolutions are, are crucial to the rural municipalities of Alberta and their lobbying and advocacy efforts um, as they allow municipalities to have a direct involvement in uh, identifying priority issues, requiring action by other levels of government. Um, Again, resolutions are typically directed towards uh, federal or provincial governments seeking changes to like legislation, regulation, uh, funding, uh, that sort of thing. And uh, as I think council is well familiar with the, um, the process uh, in terms of the governance around resolutions. Uh, we've talked about that before. Uh, I also put a link in the agenda item to the resolutions database. Uh, which has the uh, status updates for any resolutions that have uh, been tabled um, and approved by the group uh, over the years. So it provides a good history, but also we can check in. Um, our main now also provides a monthly resolution update bulletin uh, to report on the progress and outcomes of, um, of either selection of the uh, resolutions and uh, of the over 70 currently active resolutions that are tabled before government. Uh, the, the agenda item also notes that uh, Clearwater County is a member of the Central District 2 for RMA and that the next meeting uh, is in the fall of September 6th uh, is the deadline for resolutions and then making October 6th the date uh, for that meeting in Lacombe County. So that'll be something I'm sure is already in your calendars. And um, as council is also well aware, uh, the process would be if we're tabling a resolution that we would also need to find a seconder. That's typically the Reeve or Deputy Reeve's uh, role to try and solicit that when they're in discussions with their, their colleagues. And uh, this, this item also kind of listed off a few of the resolution topics that I've heard uh, anecdotally throughout council meetings or in um, regular meetings with uh, elected officials. And uh, just wanted to throw a few of those on the table for council's consideration and then uh, perhaps have some dialogue in terms of which, if any, we want to proceed with um, in terms of resolution creation. It'll give us the summer to, to put the words to paper and do some of the research for you and, and bring that back before your September and October deadlines. 
Um, so the first one was uh, rural municipalities needing to have a, more of a voice with the RCMP. I believe that one was tabled as part of the discussion um, with a new uh, Rocky Mountain House staff uh, sergeant um, job posting. Uh, I think council would have received either in this package or the one previous, the uh, letter inviting uh, us to participate as part of that hiring process, which we've agreed to. So that one might already be addressed. I'm not sure if there was more um, in-depth voice that council was wishing. Sounds like there's a question. Um, Deputy Reeve Melhoff, please. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Yeah, I had asked um, for this to be added. Just um, when the new funding rural police funding model was presented, it was supposed to come with um, police uh, committees or commissions uh, made up of rural so that we would have a say similar to people that have contract police services and that still has yet to come. Um, when that question was broached at RMA, um, it was met with uh, there's an opportunity to have a grant to switch to private policing. So that still has not come to fruition, the um, committee slash commission that was promised with the police funding model and I think that that's something that needs to be we shouldn't have to switch to a municipal police force to get a say on how our community is policed. And I think that it, it would be, this would be a welcomed resolution at RMA. Thank you for the further clarity. So that one is uh, relating to the police funding model and rural commission or committees. Uh, the other item that uh, we heard about was um, ambulance staffing and hours of work. I'm not sure if that's been addressed with any of the province's recent announcements for their um, action plans or um, or not, but if there's any more background on that one. Uh, Deputy Reid Melhoff. Uh, yes, I think that they are working towards that, and I'd like to see how that the new plans roll out um, to see if that actually is going to make a difference, the 45-minute um, uh, staffing at the hospital and the 811 secondary triage, see how those roll out. Um, Perhaps before these are even due, we'll have a better idea, you know, going through another quarter. Um, but it'd be nice to kind of have a few weeks of that under our belts to see if that actually is going to, if it's going to work or not. It's only been on the floor for a few weeks now. So see how those work out before we jump on this again. Okay. All right. Seeing no more comments, I'm going to move to the next one. Uh, rural school funding formula adjustments. I don't know if this was brought up in a council meeting. Uh, <laughs> Deputy Reid Mel. I feel like me again. Um, we have brought this up a few different times, even when we were talking with Wild Rose School Division um, and how the, the funding formula used by um, the province to fund, the fund schools in general is really geared towards the way that an urban runs a school, not necessarily the way that a rural runs a school. Um, so I think it'd be appropriate for us to do a deeper dive into this and see if we can work with our Wild Rose School Division partners to come up with um, a resolution that will help them have the voice that they need in order to advocate for our children. Okay. I'm seeing no more comments. The next one was shortage of registered nurses. Um, I'm not sure I know uh, the council's probably aware of this as well, but um, as part of 2023, they announced in March some more uh, training spots for doctors and nurses in the province. So I don't know if that one's been addressed sufficiently or if we need to start researching for a resolution on that one. Deputy Reed Melhoff. Uh, yes, I agree that this budget has made a big difference as well. And locally, we're even working with um, Red Deer Polytech to hopefully actually have a, a bridging um, LPN to RN program here in Rocky Mountain House. So there's been some other avenues that we've been trying to uh, work on that. They're also um, working on how you transition people from um, other countries and the jurisprudence between countries. Um, so there's a few different avenues that they're working on the, the registered nurses shortage. So again, it'd be nice to see how that kind of plays out um, before we jump on another resolution. Okay. And the last one uh, was added and then attached to the agenda item is at a, and again, it's not so recent, these have been bumped just because of how busy the meetings have been from uh, the last few uh, months, but uh, certainly it's been in the queue for a while. The uh, Town of Rocky and Clearwater County Intermunicipal Collaboration Committee met in February uh, and suggested a resolution for advocacy related to sustainable community hospice funding. 
Um, and then the ICC provided a resolution uh, to that effect, essentially that uh, both the town and county administration worked together to create that resolution. Uh, I understand that the town of Rocky Mountain House had uh, drawn up a draft of that, and that was what was included with the agenda. And um, other than that, um, just wanted to, to leave those with council. I, I, I note that there's a couple, it sounded like, that could be held. So the ones um, that weren't on that list of, of hold for now or were okay, um, based on the comments I heard, were um, the hospice resolution, the um, RCMP and the police funding model um, voice, and the uh, rural school funding to work with Wildrose School Division. So I'm not sure if that's something council would wish for uh, fall or maybe subsequent in the spring uh, resolution session, but uh, it looks like we have at least three um, and looking for council's direction on uh, which, if any or all of them, that you wish uh, staff to do some research and bring back a draft resolution. Councillor Graham. I would like to propose a potential fourth. Oh, okay. um, something that came up at one of our, well, obviously it's a rural industry crime meeting and there's, they talk about rural industry crime, but something that comes up quite often is copper theft, obviously. And in British Columbia, they have much more strict re um, regulations on selling copper. And I think it's really helped there to, to deviate from people stealing the copper. Um, obviously, it's not just the copper being stolen that costs these companies that pay 90% of our <laughs> taxes here. Um, it's the downtime and the damage that's done to all their property that affects them as well. So I wanted to propose a potential resolution for the Alberta provincial government to have some, some more strict regulations against selling copper. The way that it was explained to me was more like in a law-abiding pawn shop you have to have proof of ownership to bring something there so it's kind of it would be like the same thing it would be a little more work for people but it seems to be working quite well in bc so i have a gentleman that was going to email me he had written a paper on it but he has not emailed it to me yet so I'll try and hunt him down and get that but just to throw that out there for council to consider okay any additional uh deputy reeve mailhoff uh, thank you, Reeve. I, I think that is a great idea. Um, I've actually, we heard about that at the crime prevention conference too, so I think that that would be a great idea, and we'd be able to, I think, find support for that as well. Um, as far as the hospice res resolution, I know that um, the Reeve and I had, um, had the opportunity to speak with Mountain View at, at RMA, and I know that uh, they were supportive if we were to approach them depending on full content of the resolution. Of course, I know that was something that they were supportive on, and that, again, signals to our, our urban partner, Rocky Mountain House, that, that we are following through with uh, um, the ICC recommendation for us to work together on hospice funding. Um, and it would be great to see some background on um, the more voice for the RCMP, the rural school funding, and I like the, the copper, um, the idea of looking into the copper one as well. Now that's a lot of work on your guys' plates, but we're trying to get as much as we can in the four years we're here. <laughs> you bet, and that's okay. We'll figure, we'll figure out the resourcing as long as council are to bring that, those four resolutions, I believe I heard, um, forward to the fall. Uh, keeping in mind that um, once they, they'd have to go through the central before they central, go to the, yeah. the RMA anyway, so uh, I would need support of the central region first. And that's an opportunity for similar similar resolutions to be combined so that we're not doing multiple resolutions in the same central zone at least. Uh, I think it's a good feedback moment for the concerns we've, we've indicated there, so thank you. So does that capture enough of what you need to move forward or do you need a motion to move forward with? A motion to support um, the resolutions would be, would be fantastic. Um, and whether it is one, two, three, or four. Okay, uh, Councillor North. <laughs> I'm not pushing my button. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Swanson then. Uh, yeah, I'll make the motion then that uh, Council Direct Administration to uh, create drafts of the resolutions as discussed, the four resolutions that discuss at, uh, I would assume this can come at our August, last August meeting, uh, just before the deadline for the September 6th. And uh, 
as for, as for the fall for the fall RMA resolution process. Thank you. Discussion on that motion. Seeing none, I call the question. All in favor? And that is carried. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, brings us into the report section of uh, today's agenda. Um, we'll start with the CAO's report or the acting CAO's, re CAO's report in this uh, instance. Thank you again, Reeve Lahid. Um, I'll try and get through it fairly quickly because I know um, we've already had a long day. So Alberta municipalities will hold various municipal leaders caucuses um, across the province and they will focus on uh, engaging conversations based on top of mind issues facing communities. There is a registration cost um, for in-person and virtual attendance. Uh, should council wish to attend um, and receive remuneration, this would be something would require a motion. Uh, next one on the list is the county's Clearwater Land Care Board, uh, which invited council to attend its second recreational stewardship fair in Nordig, uh, July 22nd between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. Uh, event activities include best practices for sustainable recreation, skills for land stewardship, and growing knowledge um, and conversation. Again, another uh, motion would be required for councillors to attend and receive remuneration. And keeping on going, um, Agri oh, perhaps, sorry. Perhaps uh, Deputy Reid Melhoff. Um, I would happily make the motion that uh, council is wishing to attend the recreational stewardship fair in Nordegg July 22nd, um, have the ability to do so. Okay, thank you for that. All those in favor? And that is carried. Next one is the Agricultural Community Departments holding a couple open houses in Nordeg um, in June 9th from 3 to 6 and June 10th from 10 to 1 to present the new cemetery design uh, concept for public feedback. Uh, additional details will be available on the county's website coming soon, so stay tuned for that. Um, as per council's direction at the October 25th, 2022 regular meeting, uh, administration has scheduled a development and community engagement session uh, for council in Nordegg, and that is going to be on June 29th from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Nordegg Community Hall. Again, stay tuned for more details on that coming soon to you and the public. Uh, lastly, in this one, um, I feel honored to be able to speak to this one uh, while I'm sitting in this chair. Clearwater County is extremely proud of its firefighters and municipal emergency management personnel that continue to assist with wildfire incidents across the province, uh, including the ones that were within Clearwater County's border and several other uh, locations um, uh, locally and in northern Alberta. In the previous few weeks, we've seen our firefighters, our wildland urban interface uh, team members, and some of our incident management team um, specialists have deployed to help our municipal neighbors uh, in, within the Ochis First Nation, the Brazo County, Yellowhead County, and Parkland County. Uh, special thanks to the Rocky Mountain Forest Area and Alberta Wildfire Team for the amazing work in, in the region and across the province uh, trying to deal with all of the uh, significant wildfires we've been experiencing. Uh, there's also some thank you in here to our partner agencies, um, the RCMP, the Ochis First Nation, the Stony First Nation, Essential First Nation, Town of Rocky Mountain House. Uh, we had some other firefighters assisting us as well from Town of Sylvan Lake when we had a wildfire emergency here, and many other government of Alberta departments, including Fish and Wildlife, um, Environment and Parks, uh, Alberta Emergency Management Agency, to name a few. And so I would say that I agree with the statement that Clarota County is very fortunate to have many professionals as we do all working together in this region. And um, another special thanks to the Clarota Regional Fire Rescue Services membership, those that were deployed here uh, within our neighboring municipalities and those that were staged in the, the fire stations during our highest wildfire um, extreme conditions that we've seen in some time. Uh, we had our halls staffed up with people ready to go so that those fires, that new starts, didn't get away um, and that we could assist our, our partners in Alberta Wildfire in dealing with those. So that was uh, very significant. A lot of time, a lot of hours, uh, tired folks. So much, much appreciated. And, um, you know, always available for that next call, but certainly um, augmented uh, availability during uh, the wildfire risk season that we had in early May. Lastly, um, would be remiss if I didn't also mention the county's amazing uh, 
team from every single department within our, our municipality who all contribute staff to dealing with uh, emergencies when we have them. It's not uh, one, one department show or two department show. It's certainly something that uh, we have resources from every single department within the county assisting when we have an emergency. And that helps us stay organized and um, be as productive as we are to try and uh, get that incident stabilized and to a point where we can get into uh, that recovery phase. So thank you again. And that uh, is the end of the acting CAO's report. Um, questions for the uh, acting CAO, or Councillor uh, Radcliffe, please. Thank you, Reeve. Um, just noticing on item four that we're only allowing two hours at Nordegg. And uh, feedback I've had from community in the past would, I think, require somewhat more. Okay, I will pass that along to, to the department. I, I know that those timeframes are generally a guideline and we usually hang around as long as folks are um, still there asking questions. So uh, I will make sure that comment's passed along to the department. All right, thank you. I have another question, um, maybe not entirely related, but um, we have been doing a lot of traveling attending different sessions, I'm just wondering how our budget is holding up. If we're... Ooh. For council? Yes. That would be something we'd have to probably bring back um, information. I, and then maybe I can pass it over to Murray if he has that Mr. answer. Hagen, Readily please. available. <laughs> Certainly no pressure. <coughs> uh, unfortunately, I don't have that number readily available. Uh, but I, I will advise council that uh, we will be bringing a first quarter report uh, to council and then monthly reports thereafter. So you will be seeing the financial information now that we're a good portion into the year. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay. Thank you. Um, any additional questions for acting CAO? Um, sorry, uh, Councillor Swanson. No, I was just going to make the motion to adopt the councillor report as or, or, information. Or the CAO, 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 report, CAO, CAO report for information. Council, Thank you for that motion. At the end of the day. Um, <laughs> And def definitely before we vote on that, I will say a special thank you. It was amazing seeing this Clearwater County team come together to handle uh, nearly unprecedented emergencies throughout our province and, and being a key and active uh, role, role player in, in really helping us weather an emergency. Uh, I'm so proud of this organization and the efforts that went into doing that. So I just wanted to, wanted to share that from my perspective. So. Uh, with that, I would ask for a uh, call of hands on all those in favor of the motion to accept. Uh, that's carried. Thank you very much. Um, capital project status update. Anything that would like to see a highlight or a focus on there? Uh, Deputy Reeve Melhoff. Uh, thank you, Reeve. I'm, I'm always pleased to be able to go through the the capital projects report um, and see all the great work we're doing. Um, my question regarding Nordegg, since we are entering the busy season in Nordegg, are those lots um, gonna be for sale and ready for this busy season? Ms. Haggard? That is another answer that I don't have uh, readily available, so let me find out and I'll send council an email today. Excellent, thank you. Anything else to highlight in the update of the um, capital projects? If not, I would look for a motion to accept that report for, um, sorry, for information. Uh, Deputy Reeve Melhoff, all in favor? And that is carried. Uh, Councillor reports, and I will go to Councillor Graham first. All right, I wasn't sure you went the other way last, last time. I know, so. we've got to shake things up <laughs> once in a Keep while. Keep us on our toes. You bet. <laughs> So for the first thing on my report, um, the educational ag tour was, I think it was one of my favorites ever this year. It was really good. Deputy Reeve Melhoff was there teaching about safety, which I'm sure she'll touch on some more. And she did a great job. The group that I was with threw some crazy comments and questions at her and she, she did very well answering them. Um, I have a list here. There were many things that we learned about that day. And thank you to the, the families and the farms that enabled the grade four students to go around and learn about agriculture. It's such an important program and a really fun day for the kids and the adults, in my opinion. Um, and the county staff and the Ag Society did a great job with it. 
and I thought the county staff represented the county so well. A couple of them had presentations and they did such a great job and taught me some things about bees, which is always good to know. I had my counselor drop-in session. I had a trio drop by and then the Bighorn Parade, which I think we were all at, so no need to discuss that. And then something that I should have brought up in my last counselor report and forgot, and I apologize to Councillor Hutchinson if she is watching this for, for missing it, but at our rec board meeting, it was brought up that the town received a letter to potentially have the 2026 summer games there to put a bid in for it. And we and the rec committee want to create a committee to to create <laughs> a document to send in a letter of basically we would like to host this but the committee is gonna just gonna find out how much it's gonna cost and what sort of events it would be in it and everything and we have to have a motion to be able to do that and obviously appoint someone to it which I'm guessing Councillor Swanson would love to do because I know she was a big part of the last ones um so I just wanted to look at council I did a very terrible job of explaining that so feel free to ask me questions um I wanted to look to council to have that motion and so they can move forward with that it is due in June so we need to get going with it Councillor Swanson so anytime we can uh, encourage sport rec uh, sport tourism, I'm I'm in favor of. Um, so um, I, I'm fine to uh, have the motion or make the motion that we. I have do, a wording here. Do you have it worded? Yes. Could you, sorry. Could you read it out then. Um, the the county supports preparing a letter of interest to host the 2026 summer games, and bid committee to create the documents which we would then have to approve that letter before it was sent off. So we're not committing to any money or anything just to create the letter. Okay, you're making that motion. Okay, sorry, okay. <laughs> I will okay. make that motion. <laughs> any questions around that motion? Now, Tracy Lynn, did you capture? I can email it to you, Tracy Lynn. Capture I, that motion? I can okay. restate it too if sure, you need that, to. Sure, that, okay. that maybe, maybe if you would, just so we have no um, lack of clarity. Oh, too far. That the county supports preparing a letter of interest to host the 2026 Summer Games and bid committee to create documents. Okay. Thank you for that. Any questions? I call that motion then. All in favor? And that is carried. Thank you very much for your report, if that's the end. Or is there more to go? Well, I'm just thinking. Sorry, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> I'm just thinking, do we need to decide who's gonna go? We should decide right now who's gonna go on that committee as well. Is there we any expressions of interest for, to serve on that committee? Have at her. <laughs> <laughs> I'm super busy in the summer. It's Summer's not a good time for me. So I see expressions of interest and disinterest <laughs> all at the time. Interested time. in helping where I can. No, I was... I was going to okay. make I, a motion. Okay. That well, thank you for County appoint Councillor Swanson to represent us okay. on that subcommittee of the Rec Department. Thank you for that expression of interest. All in favor of Councillor Swanson being part of that committee, then. And that is carried. Thank you. Thank you very much. End of your report. Yes. Thank, yes, you, thank, thank you very much for your report. I'll move to uh, Councillor Northcott, please. Not really a lot to report. I attended the parade in Caroline. There was a lot of people. It was a great turnout. Um, smoke was a little bit thick, so other than that, I'd just been mostly seeding and stuff the last few days and a couple of weeks. But the rain's very nice. Um, glad that the smoke has subsided. So, yeah, other than that, nothing really to report. Thank you very much. I will move to uh, Deputy Reeve Mailhall. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Yeah, it's been. Um, a little bit of a slower couple of weeks, which was nice because I got to grab a bunch of shifts on the ambulance, which were not slow, but, <laughs> but at least I was able to do that. Um, I was at the CCTA um, meeting this month, um, and some of the concerns brought up, I did, I did forward them to administration, but uh, one of the other ones um, was wild boar in general. And uh, I just wanted to reiterate that we can't make decisions if we don't have all the information. So if anybody is 
seeing the uh, wild boars, because it was mentioned that some people have seen them, um, they need to report them because we can't make decisions on, on policy without all the information. So um, please report them to our ag department if you are seeing them. Uh, it's just, it's really important to do that. Um, yeah, Councilor Graham already brought up the e-tour and yeah, it was, it was kind of a, a back to my roots opportunity uh, to teach kids about um, 911 and how to call 911 and what to do and safety. And it was a, a great cup filling opportunity for me. I've, I've always really enjoy, enjoyed life safety and hopefully next year our fire services won't be as busy and they'll be able to contribute to get um, as well. Um, just they couldn't this year because they were just a little busy with fires apparently. I don't, They're so it's selfish. crazy. Right? <laughs> um, Right? Yeah, they were scheduled to be there. It just did not work out, and that's, that's okay, too. Um, had a great chat with the farmer's advocates um, po um, after our municipal development plan. Uh, I just want to confirm that, that anybody can reach out to them, um, and they provide supporting documentation and legislation um, that helps direct decision-making, um, and that they didn't weigh in on our municipal development plan directly, but merely provided all of the support needed to make good decisions. For example, the property rights advocate office is now underneath the farmer's advocate, um, so anybody can reach out and get as much information as they need and they'll direct you to the King's Bench printer where you can get as much information as, as you would like. Um, my counselor drop-in session this uh, last week was um, not as busy as it, as it normally is, um, but had the opportunity to work with some people on solving some of their um, uh, road speed um, and extra traffic concerns and direct those in the right place. Um, the trade show in town here, the health engagement team had a booth, had a booth at the trade show uh, and that was it was very well done by the chamber also. That trade show was fabulous. Great to get back to that. Um, and always a, I always take the opportunity to promote health and health engagement wherever I can. Um, also attended the, the parade. It's, it's, that's always a fun opportunity. And my kids always have a blast. And, all, and thank you to the team for, for <laughs> happening to manage with my kids on the float. Um, they always appreciate how you guys allowing them to join in. Uh, I also uh, was a spouse at the, SAR, at the Search and Rescue AGM, and it's amazing the number of hours that they put in in a year. Um, so this year, the numbers that were tracked, um, 40 members put in uh, 6,875 hours. Um, and that was 32 incidents, 126 exercises, and 304 community events and activities. They are very active, 100% volunteer um, organization and I'm just amazed, I'm just so proud to have them as part of our community so that's my report Thanks. great thank you for thank you for sharing that um, any questions for deputy Reed Melhoff well, again thank you for the for the report and I'll move to uh, councillor Ratcliffe please thank you um, I don't have that much to report so I've been very busy um, <laughs> I did attend the uh, Rocky Trade Show. Good to see that going again back in person. Had some interesting conversations with real estate agents and others. Uh, I think I stayed there two hours longer than the hour I intended <laughs> talking to people. And of course, uh, with the rest of council and some of their families, uh, I was on the uh, float at the Caroline Parade always great the way people at Caroline turn out for these things. Great. Any, That's all I have. Any questions for Councillor Ratcliffe? Well, again, thank you for the, uh, thank you for the report, and I'll move to Councillor Cermak. I had a very boring <laughs> um, two weeks. We I were golfing I, most of the time. <laughs> was golfing most of the time. I did attend one of the um, meetings of the senior housing we are going to be taking out those slippery uh, tiles in the front and putting down some rubber stuff that has some grip. Hopefully we'll get that done this summer and it's gonna help a whole lot there. That was just a real hazard on a, why those were put in there, but in the winter time and when it rains, they are just deadly if you step on them. We've had to put rugs out there just for the seniors and for me walking in there. Um, it was a great move uh, there. And I did, a, no, I didn't attend the um, parade. I worked the parade. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, any questions for Councillor Cermak? Thanks again, and I'll move to Councillor Swanson, please. All right. Uh, d uh, three ASHA webinars. Uh, there was a um, meeting with the housing management bodies across the province in regards to their board matrix that the province is wanting to uh, put forth, just adding about the concerns. Uh, the rural concerns were especially that uh, these this housing matrix or this board matrix that the province would like to see about the rurals is um, not every rural board has the availability of a lawyer and accountant and an HR person to sit on these boards. So anyway, especially smaller communities. So concerns were, were, were laid out and we'll be working with the new seniors housing minister uh, after the election. Um, it did talk about... Um, the, the other two webinars were in regards to campaigning to the uh, candidates that there is a shortage of affordable housing um, within the province. And the nomination committee uh, met uh, also, which I am a part of, and that is in regards to some of the regions that are the directors are, uh, their terms are coming due. And then to express the interest of the president is uh, she's vacating her uh, position in April at the AGM, ASHA AGM, and it's just to put it out forward that uh, the Vice President doesn't just automatically fill that. It is just something that uh, roles and responsibilities will be uh, conveyed early in, early on and, um, and so that any interested candidates, uh, anybody that's interested could ask the questions ahead of time. Uh, Rocky Seniors Housing Council, as Councillor uh, Cermak has mentioned, the renovation in the front for tiles. And next month we will be uh, quickly reviewing uh, the budget set forth for our, the, um, submitted to the province. Uh, we, we submit at the end of June for our, our budget for going ahead. So that will be next month's council report, what we'll report on. Caroline Parade, fantastic. I don't know, numbers were anywhere between 1,500 and 2,000. There's just lots, just lots of kids. It's fantastic. Um, and uh, did attend uh, a lecture last night in Red Deer. Um, basically, uh, it was Dr. Jordan Peterson and Rex Murphy was the special guest. And uh, basically, the, the, the message that was sent there at our provincial election is being watched and it is very important that we get as many people out to vote and not to be apathetic in this particular election. This not only affects the local constituencies, it affects this province, it affects this country. So anyways, and that's all I have. Great. Uh, questions for Councillor Swanson? Well, thank you. Um, you all do such a good job of, uh, of reporting on all of all the the activities and things that council is involved with here. I will just mention, I did attend FCSS. Um, they're almost oversubscribed right at this moment. So the good thing is that money is getting out into the community, uh, into the hands of where it makes a difference. The province has, however, indicated that they will be topping some of that funding up. So we're hoping uh, additional funding comes to address a shortfall in the budget that has been, it hasn't been up on the provincial side for many, many, many years. So great to um, have that money getting out there and being used, but also it's a little frightening when you're halfway through the year and you're out of, you, your budget is fully um, fully um, dealt out with. Um, uh, did attend a candidate's forum in Rimby as well as another one in, in Rocky Mountain House. It was nice to see the candidates' positions on important issues without the community and the community feedback for their positions as well. So I think we can look forward to a very involved community and then those decisions coming up here, uh, I guess just a few days away now. So um, yeah, exactly. Uh, on May 18th, the Rocky Community Learning Center um, dealt with uh, some of the issues there and uh, they're looking for an additional county rep to um, represent based on some post-secondary committee work. So if there was any expressions of interest from this council, I know there's a, an additional councillor from the town that is gonna be part of that. So if anybody was interested in serving uh, on that uh, as well, um, we could have an expression of interest there and, and perhaps uh, a note of appointing a member to a committee. I would, I'd have to get back to you, Tracy Lynn, on what the actual committee uh, identification is, but, but uh, 
I don't know if there's any interest in in that um, amongst council, but uh, Deputy Reed Mailhoff. Uh, I just for some clarification, is this um, the work with Red Deer Poly on the bridging programs with the I, nurses? I, I think so. I think okay. it's part of part of it. Part of it's that it's looking at the additional opportunities that could could be here and and. Uh, Kind of merging a lot of those thoughts and energies to that end so um, I'd have to find more details but I, I, I did say I would ask if there was an expression of interest of serving on another committee of some kind uh, from or a county representative so. if if nobody is wanting to do it I'm happily happy to sit in or happy to work with somebody who wants sure why well, do even that if work we have a couple of people with a, a uh, an expression of interest and I can take that back that we would be able to fill that position and then probably bring back a more formal motion at perhaps the next council meeting uh, to, fi to fill that. Sure. Okay. Uh, and that's about all I have. Yeah, unless there's any questions, I would look for a motion to accept councillors' reports for information. Councillor Graham, all those in favour? And that is carried. Thank you very much. Um, number of items of correspondence where was anybody wishing to shine a spotlight or create a lens of focus on any of those? Uh, we'll go to Councillor Northcott first and then to Councillor Ratcliffe. All righty. <coughs> excuse me, it's the, uh, the wild boars. There's this letter regarding the wild boars. And uh, like I know if you, like, I just, want to be able to understand this because it doesn't quite make sense to me if we see them like if residents see wild boars in Clearwater County to report them but would it not be easier and more simple to just simply restrict them and ban them from Clearwater County like the the you know this resident does have a concern about wild boars uh, the diseases that they carry uh, the impacts that they can have on the landscape and the, the, but like the financial burden to trap these things and you know to so the wild boars are a concern to residents they're, they're a destructive critter um, but I know that there's no like, so if you see them in Clearwater County so what like there's there's no there's restrictions on them currently right but it would be simpler to just simply ban them to eliminate the future, you know, future negative impacts and financial burden, I really strongly believe once they, there's many weeds that were, you know, many plants that were brought into Alberta and Canada as ornamental plants from different continents around the world. And I mean, it's hard to, if you take a drive into radium, there's oxide daisy in the ditches and it can't, it, it, it's, it can't be controlled and it doesn't have legs. These, these things have four legs, they move. But just, uh, I still think that there should be a ban on wild boars in Clearwater County. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, Councillor Ratcliffe. Thank you. I think on the wild boar issue, uh, the idea is, are they really here? Uh, you hear occasional sort of rumors that somebody has seen one, but for the most part, the belief is that they aren't here and that we have a program, if there are any identified, to take care of it. Am I wrong on that? Deputy Reeve Melhoff, and then I'll go to Councillor Graham. Um, thank you, Reeve. I, I think that when we last talked about this, um, we have actually sent, um, we made a motion to have um, Ag Service Board look at this again and come back to Council. Uh, so again, I trust our, our Ag Service Board um, and over the last several weeks, um, they will have also, I'm sure, be CC'd any of these letters, et cetera, and community concerns. Um, they have a meeting on Friday. I've yet to see the agenda for that, but I'm sure that this will, this will be a topic of discussion on Friday um, and perhaps they will have a different recommendation coming back to Council. Um, as they did put a recommendation in council the last time we did discuss this. Um, so I'm just trusting that they will do the same this time. Um, and Councillor, oh, sorry, I think, okay, Councillor Cermak? Yeah, we had a long discussion with Matt 
on this. Um, he said he wouldn't like to see a restriction on animals being brought into the county. I disagreed. Um, I think that there should be a ban on uh, wild boars, but the only wild boars that are allowed in here, according to the county, and and who has got permits, is the, um, the farm down on 22 East and South of Caroline that have got all the fences in proper, um, all built to the specifications of the Clearwater County. They're monitored. The animals are brought from the breeding farm in Red, in Red Deer County to the farm they're hunted that day. If they are not um, disposed of, sorry, I should rephrase that. They are disposed of that day on the site. And the next day, if there's another hunt for a veteran, they can go in there the next day and another animal is brought to that site and disposed of before nightfall. If the hunter doesn't get it, it is disposed of. So it is under very strict regulations at that site and Matt has all the, all of the permits and all of the regulations and they're abiding by it all. He knows of no other one, because I have asked Matt, he knows of no other farm that has wild boars in the county. So if somebody sees them, they need to come to Matt or get a hold of the county's office. The number is 845 quadruple four. Phone it and they'll get you to the right person so that we can take care of this. Um, I think the county has done everything they can besides banning them outright. And if it's helping veterans clear their heads, I have a real problem not seeing, seeing that they can't have that farm there because they are taking every precaution in the book to make sure that those animals never leave that farm. It's brought from the Red Deer Breeding Farm to the farm, and it never leaves a farm alive. The veteran that kills it is gets the meat or he donates it. And that's the only way that animal can leave that farm. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Northcott. Maybe a little bit of clarification on the wild boars, but that, that, uh, that, that area there where they do hunt the boars, that one, um, yeah, they're there, they do their thing. Um, but with no bylaw banning uh, wild boars, it still would leave it available for really anybody to bring wild boars to their property. There's no, there's no ban on wild boars in Clearwater County. Yeah, there so, is. They have to get a permit from the so county to bring them in. The yep, so, so, you, so then they can still bring them into the county. So you, you could still have, in the future, you could continue to have more um, wild boar farms to say, right, where if it was banned, it would, it would eliminate that possibility into the future. It would just create more certainty for, for residents to know that, yep, we, you, know, you know, we won't have to worry about wild boars uh, coming into Clearwater County and possibly escaping and not being able to contain them into the future. So I think it would just bring a little certainty to have a ban on them. Councillor Graham? So they have to have a permit. They also have to have the provincial fencing regulations, which are $100,000 per 20 acres to before labor to install. So that right there eliminates a number of people. In my opinion, I couldn't afford that um, from being able to do that. And even when they're loading and unloading, they are in secondary containment. So there's they back into a fence, there's a fence around it, and if the board does not go where it's supposed to go, it's shot. So there's there's a lot of restrictions for them. Um, 
you know, the county has been through cases where there was someone who had wild boars. This was in 2006. And they, I think they just left and opened the gate kind of a thing. And the county caught them all and disposed of them all. So we have been, we're not just ignoring the fact that this, these things can happen, which is what happened in all the places that are now overrun with wild boars. We have plans in place and have been through the process of catching them and disposing of them to have these things not happen. Um, yeah, those are just a few things. And I mean, as far as the, the diseases that they carry and stuff, sheep carry parasites that kill buffalo. So are we gonna say sheep aren't allowed here? And if buffalo get out, they do a lot, a lot of damage, a lot more than, than a wild boar would do. So, you know, they can't, and anyone technically could just sneak anything into the county if they wanted to. So I think we've done a pretty good job of of eliminating as many concerns as we can. I don't really agree with banning animals because I don't know, I just don't agree with it. Everyone has a different way of farming. Everyone has different types of animals they wanna produce. I will agree with banning rats and those types of animals because they're not good. I don't like rats, but um, <laughs> yeah, those are a few things. I just had my notes right there from, from the meeting that we discussed it. So I just thought I'd share those few things. Uh I've probably said it myself before that I, I believe much more act or much more in a proactive management uh, philosophy than just an outright ban because from my experience these wild boar don't read signs well or read policy well so they end up moving in even if we don't want them to and, and I think it's much better to have an active management policy and a, and a program that really addresses the problem right where it sits and that's the animal um, that's that's kind of what I gathered from our last long and lengthy discussion around the wild boar issue and what our management strategies were here. So, but those things are always up for uh, up for discussion. Um, again, uh, if there aren't any further uh, focuses or spotlights on any of the correspondence, I would look for a motion to accept correspondence for information. Councillor Ratcliffe. All those, all those in favor? And that is carried. Oh, uh, or is it? Yeah, it's carried. <laughs> it is. I would just like to say that we are... CMP today is a 150-year anniversary oh. in Canada, as today. Oh, cool. Yeah. Are so, they issuing a coin? I don't know, <laughs> but I think it's pretty amazing for a, for a force to be in that well respected around the world and they're still here 150 years later incredible years of service yeah yeah and the first 20 just a little tidbit of information the first 20 rcmp were killed in saskatchewan by wolfers out of the united states all in one day and yet they kept signing and, up. And that happened 150 years ago. Oh, wow. Uh, great. Any uh, moves? Sorry. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. We didn't do council remuneration. Um, any any uh, thoughts there? Uh, Councillor Swanson. Actually, that's what I was going to do. I was going to back up and say, if there's no no questions, I would move that the council remuneration uh, be accepted. Thank you for that motion. All in favor? And that is carried. And I'm just going to skip forward now. Notice as a motion, would there be any of those? Seeing none, we'd move on. The next item is in closed session. So I will make or look for a motion to move into closed session. Councillor Cermak, all those in favor? And that is carried. Thank you very much.
Uh, welcome back as we come out of closed session. There won't be any motions relating to the closed session. However, we do have a, a tabled item that we would look for a motion to lift from the table. Uh, Councillor Swanson, please. Sure, I'll make that motion that we lift the uh, the regular meeting minutes for, of May 9th off the table, from the okay. table. Okay, any discussion? Seeing none, I call a question. All in favor? And that is carried, thank you. Uh, and I believe there could be a motion to uh, amend those minutes. Uh, Deputy Reeve Melhoff, please. Uh, thank you, Reeve. Um, motion to amend resolution 211-2023 to read motion by Councillor Jenny Melhoff. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, all in favor? And that is carried. And then we would probably need a motion to adopt those minutes as amended. Uh, Councillor Swanson was first with a light, I believe. Uh, make a motion to adopt the, the motion, adopt the minutes of May 9th as amended. Thank you for that. All in favor? And that is carried. Thank you. I think that brings us to the end of our agenda, and that is an adjournment motion. And I do look to Division 4 for that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Councillor Northcott. All in favor? Great. Thank you very much for joining us today. We'll see you next time.